Chapter 10, Part 2 of Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mario Pineda. Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. Chapter 10, Part 2 Manufactures. There are many other industries which claim by their importance some mention here, but lest details should become tiresome to the reader, there is appended in tabular form a few particulars of the most important industries hitherto unnamed. But even the most conscientious reader is hereby specially permitted and advised to skip this table. The author did not make it, you know, and he is only solicitous for the text. Manufactured Leather Curring Establishments, 2,319. Capital, 16,878,520. Hands, 11,053. Wages, 1,845,413. Value of product, 71,351,297. Tanning, 3,105 establishments. 50,222,054. Capital, 23,821. Hands. 9,204,243 wages, 113,248,336 value, manufacture, shipbuilding, 2,188 establishments, 20,979,874 in capital, 21,345 hands, 12,713,830 in wages, 36,800,327 in value. Paper, 692 establishments, 46,421,202 in capital, 24,422 hands, 8,525,355 in wages, 55,109,114 in value. Glass, 211 establishments, 19,844,699 in capital. 24,177 hands, $9,144,100 in wages, $21,154,571 in value. Dying and finishing, 191 establishments, $26,223,981 in capital, no data for hands, no data for wages, $32,297,420 in value. Sugar and molasses, no data other than value for 155,484,915. Printing and publishing. No data except for value at 90,799,442. Agricultural implements. No data except for value at 68,640,486 dollars. Furniture. No data except for value. $68,037,902. Carriages and wagons, no data except for value, $64,951,617. Drugs and chemicals, no data except for value, $38,173,658. Clothing, men's, ready made, no data except for value, $209,548,460. Clothing, women's, ready-made, no data except for value at $32,004,794. Railroad and streetcars, no data except for value at $27,997,591. Hardware, no data except for value, $22,653,693. Sewing machines, no data except for value, $13,863,188. In this table, the two items which will probably most excite surprise are those which seem to tell us that the sober suited male spends six times as much for his clothes as the more gaudily dressed branch of the race. The explanation of this is found in the enormous development of ready-made clothing in the country. Let anyone stop for a moment at the windows of one of these establishments, which generally occupy entire squares in most of the cities, and notice at what extremely low prices quite respectable clothing is offered, and if he be a British visitor, few sights will more surprise him. Prices are not above those in Britain, and the clothing is better made. 
The material may, however, not be quite so good, for a mixture of inferior stuff is suspected in the home product. Still, it is excellent and serviceable, and is constantly improving in quality. There is seen in this branch another development of the wholesale idea, which gives America its good and cheap watches and many other things. In the manufacture of men's clothing, men are divided into classes, and a thousand suits are cut and sewed by machinery for each class from the same material. Only the misshapen man is now compelled to be measured and fitted by himself. The garments adopted for boys' wear offered by these wholesale manufacturers are so much more bright in style and so much cheaper than can be obtained from smaller tailors that this branch may be said to be entirely monopolized by the manufacturers. Prices are lower than those prevailing in Britain for similar garments. Not only the working classes, but all except the few rich, are fast becoming patrons of these ready-made establishments which, it may be mentioned, do a strictly cash business. This in itself is one reason for the lower prices, and it exerts a decided influence for good upon the habits of the poorer people. Here again we have that law of concentration which seems inseparable from manufacturing, the smaller being constantly merged into the greater factories. When we come to the dress of the delightful, vain woman, however, we have a total arrest of this concentration. Her tastes or whims are so numerous, so diverse, that she must express herself in her dress, and sometimes very loudly too. Still, in this, we can at least ask the world to judge between the monarchy and the democracy without fear of the verdict. The American woman of all classes sets an example to her monarchical sister in dress. The full-blown wife of the local magnate from the provinces, decked out in all the colors of the rainbow, and apparently with a ram road down her back, which extends high through her neck too, and probably divides into two prongs midway, one going down each leg to her feet. That spectacle has no compare upon this side of the water. Even the wife of the California miner who has made his pile, or of the Pennsylvania speculator who has struck oil, seems to submit herself to a tolerable dressmaker before she appears in public in New York or Washington. Still, there is no possibility of success if the attempt were made to manufacture a thousand bonnets or dresses of any one pattern. That any other woman had one of these would render the next hideous, positively offensive to the aesthetic sense of the second purchaser. The guarantee required by the purchaser of a fashionable bonnet, apparently, is that it can be worshipped without breaking the commandment. There must be nothing like it in the heavens above, nor in the earth beneath, nor in the waters under the earth, and in many cases there is not. For this reason, if there be a reason at all, we find the census reporting that men spend six times the sum that women do upon clothing. Were the receipts known, a reporter of the thousands of small retail dressmakers who supply the principal parts of the women's dress, we should no doubt find these figures more than reversed. The power used in manufactures in the United States is equal to 3,410,837 horsepower, a force capable of rising a weight of 17 billion tons one foot high. Of this force, 64% is steam power and 36% water power. The increase of total power between 1870 and 1880 was 45%. In the same time, the increase in product of manufacturers was 58%, another sign of improved machinery. The increase of power per hand in all branches of manufacture amounted to 10%, which indicates the extent of the transfer from manual to mechanical power during that period. The transfer is still going on, and man is ever getting nature to work more and more for him. A hundred years ago, she did little but grow his corn, meat, and wool. Now, she cuts the corn, gathers, binds, threshes, grinds, bakes it into bread, and carries it to his door. The wool she spins, weaves, and sews into garments, and then stops not until she has placed it within the future wearer's reach, be he ever so far away. Or she will carry him wheresoever his lordly desire may lead him. Across continents and under seas, she flies with his messages. Ever obedient, ever untiring, ever ready, she grows more responsive and willing in proportion as her lord makes more demands upon her. Already she has taken to herself the drudgery which long burdened man, and under triumphant democracy, she is ever seizing on other work to relieve him and live his life freer for happiness. In other lands, men are not so happy. 
Instead of making conquests over nature, they strive for conquests over each other, incited thereto by selfish and conceited kings and self-styled noblemen. But the end is near. It is probable that it is by an industrial conquest, feudalism, and standing armies in Europe are to be overcome, and that has already begun. America, blessed land of peace, is inundating the world not only with her products, but with her gospel of the equality of man as man, and the all-time nations will soon be forced to divert their energies from war to peaceful work. The position America has acquired not only as a manufacturer of the coaster product, but of more artistic articles, is remarkable. In all articles of silverware, for instance, no nation competes successfully with her. A New York establishment, which dwarfs all other similar establishments in the world, carried off the gold medal for artistic work in silver at the Paris Exhibition of 1855 and also of 1878, also the gold medal from the Emperor of Russia. 20% of all this enormous manufacture of silverware is now sold abroad. In this branch, as in engraving, the Republican workman has achieved preeminence. This is but the beginning of his triumphs in the higher branches of art. Others are as certain to follow as the sun is to shine, for the manhood and intelligence of the workman, his position of equality in the state must find expression in his work. We have an interesting example of Republican success in another branch of manufacture, that of watches. It is not very long since every watch carried by the American was imported. Today, America exports watches largely to most foreign countries and especially to Europe. These indispensable articles were formerly made by hand in small factories. Switzerland, the land of cheap labor, was the principal seat of the manufacture. Thirty-five years ago, the American conceived the idea of making watches by machinery upon a gigantic scale. The principal establishment made only five watches per day as late as 1854. Now, 1,300 per day is the daily task, and 6,000 watches per month are sent to the London Agency. Three other similar establishments, conducted upon the same general plan, are kept busily employed. In short, the Republic is now the world's watchmaker. Notwithstanding the fact that labor is paid more than double that of Europe, the immense product, the superior skill of the workmen, and the numerous American inventions connected with the business enable the Republican to outstrip all his rivals. It will soon be so in all articles, which can be made of one pattern in great numbers, for in such cases the enormous home market of the American takes so much more of any article than the home market of any other manufacturer that he is enabled to carry on the business upon a gigantic scale and dispose of his surplus abroad. In confirmation of this, now let us take the manufacture of thread for which the two Scotch firms at Paisley, Scotland, are so justly celebrated the world over. The pioneer firm began operations in Paisley in 1798, the other followed in 1820. They began to manufacture in the United States in 1866 and 1869, not 20 years ago. Yet their combined capital and works upon this side already about equals their capital in Paisley, the product of 60 years growth. In other words, 20 years in the Republic has equaled 60 in Scotland. In 20 years more, Clark and Coates will in all probability, consider the original home works in their oral monarchical Paisley as but a branch of the main stem in the greater public. Another illustration of the same character is seen in the manufacture of pig iron. The writer well remembers raising a laugh not twenty years ago at the table of one of the Scotch iron kings, the Bairds, by prophesying that even their enormous product would soon be reached by a manufacturing concern in America. Where would the laugh be now? The bears do not produce nearly as much today as the American concern, and next year the difference in favor of the Republican manufacturer will be much greater, as their capacity is constantly being increased to meet the swelling demands of the new country. So it is in every branch of manufacture, so rapidly is the child land dwarfing her illustrious mother. One has only to have faith in the Republic. She never yet betrayed the head that trusted or the heart that loved her. In Mr. Pigeon's clever book, All World Questions of New World Answers, which is, upon the whole, the best book of its kind that I know of, we find the author unerringly placing his finger upon the one secret of the Republic's success, viz., the respect in which labor is held. If I wished to indicate one of the sharpest contrasts between men and the world, and few will deny my right to judge here, 
I should say that which exists between the artisan and monarchical Britain and Republican America, I echo every word Mr. Pigeon says. Gloss it over as we may, there is a great gulf fixed between the ideas of old and new England in this radical question of the dignity of work. Our industrial occupations consist, speaking generally, of mere money spinning. The places where, and the people by whom we carry them on, are cared for economically, and that is all. It is not in our business, but by our position, that we shine in the eyes of ourselves and our neighbors. The social code of this country drives, dearly, numbers of young men, issuing from our public schools and universities, either into the overcrowded learned professions or into government clerkships, whose narrow round of irresponsible duties benumbs originality and weakens self-reliance. Capable, educated girls are pining for a career in England, while posts, even the most important, are filled in New England by young ladies, the equals of ours in everything which that phrase denotes, and their superiors in all the qualities that are born of effort and self-help. It is no one's fault, and I'm not going to rail at the inevitable. We were originally a feudal country, and cannot escape the influence of our traditions. The man who does service for another was a villain in the feudal times, and is an inferior now, just as a man of no occupation is a gentleman, and a governess a person. Use has made us unconscious of the fact that the dignity of work is a mere phrase in our mouths, while it blinds us to the loss of national energy, which avenges outraged labor. Let us look to it, while the battle of free trade rages across the Atlantic, as rage it soon will, that we import some American readiness and grip into our raw rooms and offices some sense of the dignity of labor into our workshops. This writer truthfully gives the facts, but into the causes of this sense of the dignity of labor in the Republic and its absence in the monarchy he has not ventured to seek. Let me supply this lack. If you found a state upon the monarchical idea which necessarily carries with it an aristocracy by so much more as you exalt this loyal family and aristocracy you inevitably degrade all who are not of these classes. That is clear. If at the pinnacle of your place people who are exempt from honest labor for recompense whether such a state labor be such as that rendered by ministers, physicians, lawyers, teachers, or other professional men, or tradesmen, or mechanics. If you create a court from which people in trade or artisans are excluded, if you support a monarch who declines to have one in trade represented to her even at the state reception, those entailing upon honest labor the grossest insult, what can be the result of the system but a community in which dignity of labor has not only no place, but one in which, as in Britain, labor is actually looked down upon. This is the very essence of the monarchical idea. The Queen of Great Britain grossly insults labor every moment of her life by declining to recognize it. And all her entourage, from the Duke who walks backwards before the Lord's anointed for four thousand a year, down or up to the groom of the stall, whatever that may be, necessarily cherish the same contempt for those who lead the useful lives of labor. Mr. Pigeon would cure this evil of his country by giving a better education to the people. So far, so good, but until this educated people goes to the root of the evil and sweeps away the pressing foundation upon which their government rests, and founds in its place a government resting upon the equality of the citizen, he might legislate from June to January, year after year, and labor will still hold no honored place in the state. How can it ever be even respected so long as a monarch and a court despise and insult it? Nature rejects the monarch, not the man the subject, not the citizen, for kings and subjects, mutual foes, forever play, a losing game into each other's hand, whose stakes are vice and misery. Never will the British artisan rival the American, until from his system are expelled the remains of serfdom, and into his veins is instilled the pure blood of exalted manhood. Ah, Mr. Pigeon, you should know that before you can have an intelligent, self-respecting, inventive artisan like the American, the state must first make him a man. Of course, we hear the response to all this from the ostrich class. Britons have done pretty well, have they not? So far, they have managed not only to hold their own in the world, but to successfully invade many provinces naturally belonging to others. Have not the British race come out ahead? Granted. And why? 
because until recently they have had as competing races less free men and therefore less men than themselves. Compare a Briton and his political liberties with a German, or with any continental race, and the law I indicate receives confirmation. The freer the citizen, the grander the national triumphs. Who questions that the overthrow of the doctrine of the divine right of kings and the supreme authority of parliament have not exerted a powerful influence upon the national character? And when a new race appears which enjoys political equality, shall the law not hold good, and the price fall for the freest, and therefore to the best man? And this is precisely what is going on before our eyes. Will any competent judge of the two countries upon this vital point dispute the immense superiority of the Republican workmen? Will not Mr. Howard of Bedford, for instance, or Mr. Lothian Bell, or Mr. Windsor Richards, or Mr. Edward Martin, all of whom have investigated the subject, Will they not tell their fellow countrymen, as I tell them, and as Mr. Pigeon tells them, that the citizen leads the subject? The theory of the equal status of the working man in the state here lies at the root of his superiority, both as a citizen and as a skilled workman. We find that in handling a shovel, which few Native Americans do, the British man in his cool climate can do more work than his fellow countrymen can do, or at least than he does here. But when we come to educated skilled labor, the average Briton is not in the race. Nor will he be until he is too subject to no man, but the proud citizen of a commonwealth founded upon political equality. The stuff is in him, but the laws of his country stifle it at his birth, and prevent its proper development all the years of his life. The struggle for existence has already begun afresh, this time other weapons than the spear and sword. European nations must rid themselves of the weight they now carry if they would not fall further and further behind in the race. The people must first take their political rights and secure perfect equality under the laws. This obtained, the rest is easy, for the people of all countries are pacific and bear nothing but good will to each other. Where ill will has grown, it is the work of hereditary rulers and military classes not responsible to the masses. From the jealousies and personal ambitions of these, the people are happily free, and hence, from their advent to power, there must come a rapid diversion of force from international war into the peaceful channels of industrial development. The reign of the democracy means ultimately no less than the reign of peace on earth among men goodwill. End of chapter 10「Chapter 11 of Triumphant Democracy」by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones, Benita Springs, Florida. Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. Chapter 11 Mining. Quote, Deep in unfathomable mines of never failing skill, he treasures up his vast designs and works his wondrous will. Close quote. In preceding chapters, the superlative form of adjectives has been so often applied to America when contrasted with other lands that many a foreign reader who now for the first time realizes the magnitude and greatness of the Republic may not unnaturally begin to feel dubious about it all. He may be inclined to believe that it is not a veritable nation to which such magnificent attributes are ascribed, but some fabled land of Atlantis. Nevertheless, it is all real and true. The Republic is surely, as we have already seen, the largest, most populous, wealthiest civilized nation in the world and also the greatest agricultural, pastoral, and manufacturing nation. And now we have one more claim to make. It is the greatest mining nation as well. Greatest on the surface of the soil, as she undoubtedly is, her supremacy below the surface is yet more incontestable. Over every part of the vast continent, nature has lavished her bounties in a profusion almost wasteful. Beneath fields of waving corn, ripening in a perfect climate, are layers upon layers of mineral wealth. Deposits of gold, silver, coal, iron, copper, 
are found in quantities unknown elsewhere, and the rocks yield every year rivers of oil. To crown her bounty, and aid in its utilization, and as if in pursuance of the law, to him that hath shall be given. Nature has lately blessed her with a gift as remarkable as it is rare, an agent rich in beneficial influences, and helpful to a degree which renders every other natural gift prosaic in comparison. Natural gas, a fluid distilled by nature deep in the earth and stored in her own vast gasometers, requiring only to be led into workshops and under boilers to do there the work of a thousand giants. Let me describe this new wonder first. Seven years ago a company was drilling for petroleum at Murrayville, near Pittsburgh. A depth of 1,320 feet had been reached when the drills were thrown high into the air and the derrick broken into pieces and scattered around by a tremendous explosion of gas, which rushed with hoarse shriekings into the air, alarming the population for miles around. A light was applied, and immediately there leaped into life a fierce, dancing demon of fire, hissing and swirling around with the wind and scorching the earth in a wide circle around it. Thinking it was but a temporary outburst preceding the oil, men allowed this valuable fuel to waste for five years. Coal in that region cost only two or three shillings per ton, and there was little inducement to sink capital in attempts to supersede it with a fuel which, though cheaper, might fail as suddenly as it had arisen. But as the years passed, and the giant leaped and danced as madly as at first, a company was formed to provide for the utilization of the gas. It was conducted in pipes under the boilers of ironworks, where it burned without a particle of smoke. Stokers and firemen, and all the laborers who had been required to load and unload coal, became superfluous. Boring began in other districts, and soon, around Pittsburgh, there were twenty gas wells, one yielding thirty million cubic feet a day. A single well has furnished gas equal to twelve hundred tons of coal a day. Numerous lines of pipes, aggregating six hundred miles, now convey the gas from the wells to the manufacturing centers of Pittsburgh and Allegheny City, and their suburbs. The empty coal bunkers are being whitewashed, and where in some works one hundred and twenty coal-begrimed stokers work like black demons in Hades feeding the fires, one man now walks about in cleanly idleness, his sole care that of watching the steam and water gauges. The erstwhile smoky city is now getting a pure atmosphere, and one would little suspect that the view from the cliffs above the Monongahela River included the thousand hitherto smoky furnaces of the Iron City. Private residences in Pittsburgh are supplied with natural gas, and all heating and cooking are done with this cheap fuel. Already ten thousand tons of coal per day are displaced by it, and slack, which even before the application of natural gas was worth only three shillings per ton in Pittsburgh, is now almost worthless. At present, gas wells in and around Pittsburgh are so numerous as to be counted by hundreds. The number of companies chartered to supply natural gas in Pennsylvania up to February 5, 1884, was 150, representing a capital stock of many millions. Since that date, numerous other charters have been granted. More than 60 wells have been drilled at Erie, Pennsylvania. Gas has also been found in small quantities in the states of Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, Alabama, Kansas, Dakota, and California. It is used for manufacturing purposes upon a small scale in eight towns in New York, in twenty-four towns in Pennsylvania, and five in Ohio. But so far, the region around Pittsburgh is the only one in which the much-desired fuel has been found in abundance. New uses are constantly being discovered. Glass is made purer by means of the gas, the covered pots formerly used in the furnaces being found unnecessary. 
Iron and steel plates are cleaned and prepared for tinning by passing a current of gas over them while red hot. The old process of pickling in acid solutions caused partial corrosion of the plates, which required to be carefully cleaned from the acid. It is also useful in cleansing delicate fabrics. The dephosphorization of iron through the agency of natural gas is being attempted with partial success. The attempts, however, have resulted in the formation of carbon, which has been found suitable for electric light carbons. In every department of industry, discoveries are constantly being made which, if not so important as those named, are yet of great value. The gas at present running to waste within piping distance of Pittsburgh is estimated at 70 million cubic feet per day. Closely allied to natural gas is natural oil, or petroleum, for gas is probably the distilled product of the oil, forced by subterranean heat and pressure out of the carbonaceous deposits, which abound throughout Pennsylvania. Though rock oil was known to the early Chaldeans, and is referred to by Herodotus, Pliny, and other ancient writers, it was not utilized for manufacturing purposes until 1847, when Young, of Glasgow, made lubricating oil from petroleum obtained from Derbyshire, England. Then began in England and America the distillation of oil from coal, and in 1860 there were in the United States not less than 40 factories producing about 500 barrels per day. But these were doomed to speedy extinction, for in the preceding year a company had been formed in Pennsylvania to drill for the oil which was seen oozing in various places from the river banks and floating on the water. The Indians, by spreading blankets over the surface, used to collect small quantities of this oil to mix with their war paint and for medicinal purposes. Crude petroleum, under the name of Seneca oil, had so late as thirty years ago the reputation of a universal curative. The quack advertisements which set forth the virtue of this medicine began, quote, The healthful balm, from nature's secret spring, the bloom of health and life to man will bring, as from her depths the magic liquid flows to calm our sufferings and assuage our woes. Close quote. It sold then for two dollars eight pence per bottle. Alas for human credulity, since the oil which once cured everything brings but one dollar per barrel, it has lost all virtue and cures nothing. The first drilling in Pennsylvania resulted in a flow of ten barrels a day, which was sold for fifty cents a gallon. A period of wild excitement followed. Wells were sunk all over the country. Some were failures, but oil was often reached. Of one well it is recorded that it yielded four hundred and fifty thousand barrels of oil in a little more than two years, while another is said to have given not less than half a million barrels in a twelve-month. An oil property, Story Farm, Oil Creek, with which I was intimately connected, has a remarkable history. When, about twenty-two years ago, in company with some friends, I first visited this famous well, the oil was running into the creek where a few flat-bottomed scows laid filled with it, ready to be floated down the Allegheny River upon an agreed-upon day each week, when the creek was flooded by means of a temporary dam. This was the beginning of the natural oil business. We purchased a farm for forty thousand dollars, eight thousand pounds, and so small was our faith in the ability of the earth to yield for any considerable time the hundred barrels per day which the property was then producing, that we decided to make a pond capable of holding one hundred thousand barrels of oil, which we estimated would be worth, when the supply ceased, at one million dollars, or two hundred thousand pounds. Unfortunately for us, the pond leaked fearfully. Evaporation also caused much loss, but we continued to run oil in to make the losses good day after day until several hundred thousand barrels had gone in this fashion. Our experience with the farm 
may be worth reciting. Its value rose to five million dollars, one million pounds, that is, the shares of the company sold in the market upon this basis, and one year it paid in cash dividends one million dollars, two hundred thousand pounds, rather a good return upon an investment of eight thousand pounds. So great was the yield in the district that in two years oil became almost valueless, often selling in bulk as low as thirty cents per barrel, and not infrequently it was suffered to run to waste as utterly worthless. But as new uses were found for the oil, prices rose again, and to remove the difficulty of high freights, pipes were laid, first for short distances, and then to the seaboard, a distance of about three hundred miles. Through these pipes, of which six thousand two hundred miles have been laid, the oil is now pumped from two thousand one hundred wells. It costs only ten cents to pump a barrel of oil to the Atlantic. The present daily yield of the oil-producing district is about seventy thousand barrels, and the supply, instead of diminishing, goes on increasing yearly. More than thirty-eight million barrels of thirty-three gallons each were in store one day in November 1884. The value of petroleum and its products exported up to January 1884 exceeds in value six hundred and twenty-five million dollars, one hundred and twenty-five million pounds. In the Pittsburgh district we find another mineral deposit of immense value, a remarkable coal seam of great thickness which makes a coke of such quality as to render it famous throughout the continent. It is so easily mined that a man and a boy can dig and load nearly thirty tons in ten hours. In Chicago and St. Louis, in the blast furnaces of Pittsburgh, and in the silver and lead mines of Utah, this coke, compact, silvery, and lustrous, is an important factor in the metallic industries of the Republic. It gives Pittsburgh advantages which cause it to rank as an iron producer in advance of towns situated on the very beds of ironstone. Well may the Iron City burst into song. Quote, I am monarch of all the forges. I have solved the riddle of fire. The amen of nature to need of man echoes at my desire. I search with the subtle soul of flame the heart of the rocky earth, and hot from my anvils the prophecies of the miracle years blaze forth. I am swart with the soot of my chimneys, I drip with the sweat of toil, I quell and scepter the savage waste, and charm the curse from the soil. I fling the bridges across the gulfs that hold us from the to-be and build the roads for bannered march of crowned humanity." Close quote. In the same lucky state of Pennsylvania are deposits of valuable anthracite coal, which, though including in all an area of only 470 square miles, are of immense thickness. These deposits, which in parts vary from 50 to 700 feet thick and average about 70 feet, make this wonderful region of greater value than many coal fields of ten times the area. Near Pottsville there is a thickness of 3,300 feet of coal measures. The cubic contents of the anthracite coal field, allowing 50% for loss in working, is estimated at 13 billion one hundred and eighty million five hundred and thirty five thousand tons of mercantile coal, a store capable of furnishing the present consumption or thirty million tons per year for four hundred and thirty nine years. By that time, men will probably be burning the hydrogen of water or be fully utilizing the solar rays or the tidal energy or using some undiscovered means of profitably getting heat and power by diverting natural phenomena. They will probably not feel the want of anthracite coal. At present, however, this fuel is especially precious on account of its hardness, density, and purity which render it available for iron smelting without coking, 
while to its freedom from smoke is due the pure atmosphere of eastern american cities the view from brooklyn bridge would delight a londoner used to the murky atmosphere of the english metropolis he would see the roofs and chimneys of two great cities for miles but hardly a particle of smoke to mar the purity of bright air or sully a sky which rivals that of italy in clearness in twenty-five states and territories distributed all over the continent north south east and west from alabama to rhode island and thence to california and oregon coal is now being mined while it is known to exist in several others the future value of this extensive distribution of coal can be but vaguely estimated but taken in connection with the fact that iron ore is found in nearly every state of the union and is mined in twenty-nine of them it is clear that its value in the near future will be enormous a vast expansion is taking place in the coal industry in eighteen fifty the total product was but seven and a quarter million tons in eighteen eighty it was seventy one million tons and in eighteen eighty four it reached ninety seven and a half million tons including the local and colliery consumption the figures for eighteen eighty four approximate one hundred and seven million tons that of great britain for the same year was one hundred and sixty million tons the rest of the world produced only one hundred and thirty million tons so that mother and child lands together produced more than twice as much coal as all the world beside to the world's stock of gold america has contributed according to mulhall more than fifty per cent in eighteen eighty he estimated the amount of coal in the world at ten thousand three hundred and fifty five tons worth seven billion two hundred and forty million dollars one billion four hundred and forty eight million pounds of this the new world contributed five thousand three hundred and two tons or more than half australia and the united states have competed keenly during the last thirty years for precedence but it remains with the republic the struggle is thus indicated eighteen fifty one to sixty u s one hundred and two million sterling australia one hundred and four eighteen sixty one to eighteen seventy u s ninety eight million sterling australia eighty two eighteen seventy one to eighteen eighty u s seventy million pounds sterling australia seventy two thirty years u s two hundred and seventy million pounds sterling australia two hundred and fifty eight in eighteen eighty one two and three the republic was leading by four million dollars eight hundred thousand pounds sterling per year the world's production of gold during the above thirty years was worth three billion nine hundred and thirty million dollars or seven hundred and eighty six million pounds sterling so that australia and america produced together about five-sevenths of the whole the yearly production of gold in the united states since eighteen eighty has averaged thirty one million two hundred fifty thousand dollars six million two hundred fifty thousand pounds sterling being one-third of the total product of the world of silver america has contributed to the world's supply even in larger ratio than that of gold of the one hundred and ninety three thousand tons estimated to have been produced during the last five hundred years the americas contributed one hundred and sixty two thousand two hundred tons or eighty four per cent though this was mainly the product of mexico and peru the united states of late years have come to the front the following table gives the world's production since eighteen fifty in millions of pound sterling eighteen fifty one to sixty spanish america forty nine u s ten germany and austria fifteen various seven for a total of eighty one millions sterling eighteen sixty one to eighteen seventy 
Spanish America, 64, U.S., 16, Germany and Austria, 18, various, 12, for a total of 110 millions sterling. 1871 to 1880, Spanish America, 70, U.S., 68, Germany and Austria, 20, various, 22, for a total of 180 million sterling. For the 30 years, Spanish America, 183, U.S., 94, Germany and Austria, 53, various, 41 for a total of 371 million sterling. The difference between 16 and 68 marks the increase of silver mining in the Republic, which has taken place in 10 years, an increase almost incredible. One of the most remarkable veins of metal known is the Comstock Lode in Nevada. This lode, to which Mark Twain has given a European celebrity by his description in Roughing It, is of great width and extends over five miles. It is as if Oxford Street and Uxbridge Road were filled to the housetops with rich gold and silver ore from Holborn Viaduct to Acton. In fourteen years, this single vein yielded one hundred and eighty million dollars, thirty-six million pounds. In one year, 1876, the product of the load was eighteen million dollars, three million six hundred pounds in gold and twenty million five hundred thousand dollars four million one hundred thousand pounds in silver a total of three hundred and eighty five million dollars or seven million seven hundred thousand pounds sterling here again is something which the world never saw before since eighteen eighty the annual product of silver in the United States has averaged $46,200,000, or £9,240,000 sterling. If the present rate of increase is maintained until 1890, the next decade will show a hundred million sterling as the Republic's addition to the silver of the world. The increase from 16 to 68 in 10 years is remarkable but it is more wonderful that the rate should be maintained. America also leads the world in copper, the United States and Chile contributing nearly one-half the world's supply. The product of the Republic has increased sixfold since 1860. In that year, the total product was 5,388 tons. In 1870, 12,600 tons, in 1880, 27,000 tons, and the yield for 1884 was no less than 63,555 tons. There is revolution for you. From 650 tons in 1850 to 63,000. On the south shore of Lake Superior, this metal is found almost pure in masses of all sizes up to many tons in weight. It was used by the native Indians, and traces of their rude mining operations are still visible. One mine in this district, known as the Calumet and Hecla, produces nearly 30% of the whole copper output of the United States, about 18,000 tons, in 1884. It paid its owners $4 million, 800,000 pounds, for two years' dividends. Copper mining is carried on in 21 states and territories, and ore has been found in several others. This industry is rapidly developing, and doubtless before the next census the annual output will be double what it is now. In 1870, the importation of lead into the United States amounted to 42,000 tons. In ten years, this had fallen to 4,000 tons. Then the tables were turned, and the United States, instead of importing lead, began to send it abroad, although in small quantities. In 1884, it was exported to the amount of 26,000 pounds. This implies a rapid development of lead mining in the Republic. Indeed, in 1880, America was the first lead-producing country in the world, though Mulhall places her slightly behind Spain. 
the progress of the industry is shown in the following table which also indicates the stages of the competition these figures are all in metric tons great britain in 1830 48000 tons 1850 55000 tons in 1880 51000 tons and in 1883 39,817 metric tons. In Spain, 1830, 23,000 metric tons, 1850, 27,000 metric tons, 1880, 92,000 metric tons, 1883, 127,000 metric tons. The United States, according to Mulhall, 1830, 3,700 tons, 1850, 36,000 metric tons, and 1880, 89,000 tons. The United States, according to Whitney and Caswell, in 1830, 8,000 tons, in 1850, 22,000 tons, in 1880, 97,825 tons, 1883, 140,000 tons. The difference in the two American estimates for 1880 is probably due to the fact that the census statistics of the production of lead are only partial. In Utah, for example, which is not reported as producing any, lead is mined and smelted in connection with silver. Its product in 1880 was 15,000 net tons, and that of Nevada 16,659. The product of Colorado alone was 35,678 tons. The lead district of the upper Mississippi and of eastern Missouri jointly produced 27,690 tons, while another district of southwestern Missouri and southeastern Kansas is reported to have produced 22,625 tons the previous year, so that even the larger estimate would probably have to be increased were accurate figures at hand. Caswell's estimate for 1884 is 140,000 tons, of which 120,000 tons are desilverized lead. Lead is produced in 13 states, mainly in the West. Colorado wears a leaden rim to her silver crown, she alone producing twice as much as the lead mines of Great Britain. Indeed, a single mine at Leadville produces two-thirds as much as all Great Britain. Although lead is here only a by-product of silver mining, the Horn Silver Mine in Utah produced in 1884 40,000 tons of ore, averaging 30 and 9 one-hundredths percent of lead and 39 ounces of silver, the latter alone nearly paying all the expenses of extraction, treatment, and marketing. Here again the owners got a million dollars for a year's dividends. The world's production of lead for 1883 was 454,000 tons. Of this, more than half was produced by two countries, the Republic and Spain. Zinc is now produced in America in large quantities. Previous to 1873, the amount obtained was very small, but in 1880, the year's product greatly exceeded that of Great Britain, being 23,239 tons against 15,947 in 1884, the domestic product had increased to 35,000 tons. The import of zinc into the Republic has fallen off in a corresponding degree, being but one-fifth what it was in 1873, while prices have been reduced about 80%. The Republic already ranks third among the zinc producers of the world. The mineral resources of the United States comprise also quicksilver, the ores of chrome and nickel and cobalt, platinum, iridium, antimony, arsenic, etc., etc. Salt deposits are worked in various states, and sulfur, graphite, and gypsum abound. Mineral phosphates are found in South Carolina, 
or they are worked into fertilizers for domestic consumption. Granite, marble, sandstone, and other fine building stones and roofing slates are abundant and form the object of large and profitable industries. The treasures of earth have been among the most important elements in the growth and prosperity of the Republic. Besides great and direct gains, there have been many indirect benefits resulting from the opening up and settlement of extensive regions. Large towns have sprung up with magic growth in the wilderness, where miners settled, agriculturists and mechanics soon came to minister to their wants. In this way, some of the richest and largest towns of the West originated. San Francisco is the most notable instance. A later example is furnished by Leadville, which, ten years ago, was the center of a barren, uninhabited region, the haunt of the catamount and grizzly bear. Now it is a town of wide streets and handsome stone buildings, courthouse, hospitals, churches, schools, and all the attributes of a large civilized city. The surrounding district is populated by agriculturists. In ten short years, the discovery of a rich lead vein has transformed the wilderness into an Arcadia, where, a few years ago, the only sounds heard were the growl of the coyote or the occasional whoop of the savage, the busy hum of a city, the lowing of cattle, and the beat of a steam crusher, now wake the echoes of the hills. The Republic seems to stand like the variety shopkeeper in Colorado, who put up in his shop in a flaming placard, quote, If you don't see what you want, just ask for it. Close quote. We have only to want a mineral and seek for it when nature places it before us. A few years ago, there was not a pound of Spiegel, so essential for the Bessemer steel process, made in the United States. We had not the proper ores, we said. A hundred thousand tons were used every year, and every ton was imported. Today we have the ores from Lake Superior, from Virginia, from Arkansas, and all the Spiegel we need can be made at home. So too with ferromanganese. This is a metallic substance as essential for the manufacture of mild steel as Spiegel is for steel rails. Eighty dollars a ton was paid by our manufacturers up to last year, and every ton came across the sea. We needed the precious ore, and presto, a rich mine appears in Virginia, and another in Arkansas. It has been tested, and the former is pronounced to be the richest and purest in the world. It will make feral manganese, said our manager. Sure? Yes, sure, try it. The result? The Republic may be shut off tomorrow from foreign Spiegel and feral manganese, and scarcely know it. Within her own broad bosom, she has all the requisites for the manufacture of any kind of steel. Tin is the only metal she now lacks. But let no one be surprised to read some day the announcement that all other deposits of tin in the world sink into insignificance compared to those just discovered in America. But even without this one precious mineral, my readers will surely conclude from the story of the mineral treasures of the Republic, which I have attempted to tell, that this is indeed the favored land. That the reader may the better be enabled to estimate the extent of the enormous mineral treasures of the Republic, I will summarize in order the several principal deposits and contrast them with those of each country which ranks next to America in mineral wealth. We will begin with the black diamond coal as the mineral which perhaps lies closest to the root of industrial success. How then is the democracy provided with this indispensable treasure? Well, the coal area of the United States comprises 300,000 square miles. Great Britain's coal field, 12,000. The whole of the world has but 400,000 square miles. The Republic, therefore, has 25 times the field of the parent land, and, I am almost ashamed to confess it, she has three-quarters 
of all the coal area of the earth. For shame, to leave only one quarter for all the rest of the world. In good round scotch I say to her, The deal's greedy, but you're mislurred. So it is, my readers, but as sure as death we cannot help it. Let us see about the precious metals. Gold and silver have I none. Was not written of this giant. She has contributed to the stock of gold in the world, estimated at 10,300 tons, more than one half of the whole. Australia has given her a close race during the past thirty years, but the Republic remains ahead. In silver, the Republic begins to challenge even the fabulous mines of Mexico and Bolivia, still classed as Spanish America, from which most of the silver supply of the world has hitherto been drawn. In the ten years between 1850 and 1860, these mines furnished more than half of all the silver produced. In the next decade, 1860 to 1870, it was still the same, $320 million, 64 million pounds, being their product, while the total was but $550 million, 110 million pounds. In these two decades, the infant republic produced only $50 million, 10 million pounds, and $80 million, 16 million pounds, respectively. But with the discovery of the silver mines of Nevada and Colorado, which lay till then in the untrodden wilderness, the United States came rapidly to the front, and in the last decade, from 1870 to 1880, she shows $340 million, 68 million pounds, as against the $350 million, 70 million pounds, of all the Spanish America mines together. Germany and Austria produced about $100 million, or 20 million pounds, and various countries as much more. Since 1880, the race is more and more to the Republic, for the average product of her silver mine since then exceeds $46,250,000, $9,250,000. Per annum, one-third of the silver production of the world. Leaving the yellow Giordi and the white Moni, as Bassanio did, let us see how it fares humbler, dingy, dull copper, the bobby. The world's production of copper in 1883 was exactly 200,000 tons. Of this, America supplied more than one-fourth, 52,000 tons. The whole of Europe gave only 71,000 tons. Chile but 41,000 tons. Is it not amazing that one nation should in itself have each of the three metals in such abundance? Australia has gold, and the Republic says to her, so have I, in value greater than yours. Mexico and Bolivia call, here stand we with the dazzling mines of Peru, and the Republic answers, our silver mines exceed those treasures. Chile has been the main source of the copper supply, and now the Republic dwarfs her in her own special field. It was not copper, after all, Bossanio preferred, but the dull leaden casket. Let us see, then, about this valuable article. The world produced in 1883 454,000 metric tons, and of this the Republic contributed 140,000, more than a fourth. Spain comes next to her with 127,000, followed by Germany with 95,000. Britain figures here for 40,000 tons, not a bad showing for so small an area. In zinc, the Republic is making fast strides. Its manufacture may be said to have begun about 1870, when only 7,000 tons were produced. The product in 1884 reached 38,000 tons. The British product in 1883 was 23,000 tons. But either of these is insignificant compared with Germany's contribution, 116,000 tons. 
we shall see how long it will take the young giant to forge alongside of his great German competitor in this branch of manufactures. Twenty years may do it, or even less. Thus the Republic supplies one-fourth of the lead, one-fourth of the copper, one-third of the silver, one-half of the gold of the world. Monster of the Pactolian stream, must everything you possess and everything you touch turn to gold? that you may dominate the earth? Thank God these treasures are in the hands of an intelligent people, the democracy, to be used for the general good of the masses, and not made the spoils of monarchs, courts, and aristocracy, to be turned to the base and selfish ends of a privileged hereditary class. The weakest nation may rest secure, Canada on the north and Chile on the south, for the nature of a government of the people is to abjure conquest, to protect the weak neighbor from foreign aggression, if need be, never to molest, but to dwell in peace and loving neighborliness with all. The Republic is, indeed, the child of covetous, grasping, and ever-warring Britain, but being relieved of monarchical institutions and the militarism, which is their necessary following, she has thrown away the rude sword and scorns to conquer except through love. It is a proud record for the democracy that the giant of the western continent is not feared by the pygmies which surround him, but is regarded with affection and admiration in the day of prosperity, and as a sure and potent defender upon whom they can safely call in the day of trouble. Had the monarchy retained possession of the country, how different must have been the result. Added to the inevitable wars of an aristocratic and military system, there would have been the hate of republics as republics, for no royalist ever would let a republic live if he could help it. For though not generally wise, they are not quite so devoid of reasoning, self-interest, as to court self-extinction every weak nation upon the continent would have lived in fear. No neighbor ever liked the British. No neighbor ever can until the masses are known to them and make the government of England in its dealings with other nations a true expression of themselves. The people of Britain are most lovable. Its ruling classes are just what monarchy and privilege make of men and women, selfish, narrow, conceited, and tyrannical, and wholly unmindful of others. For this reason, while the British have always been feared, they have never been loved by other races. All this will change, however, when the democracy rules their country. The parent land will become in Europe what the Republic is upon the American continent. The unselfish consular, the guide, the true and trusted friend of its less powerful, less advanced nations. It is not by wicked conquest over other states, but by honest, peaceful labor within its own bounds and with the good will of all its neighbors that the democracy builds up the state. End of chapter 11 Mining Chapter 12 of Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria James. Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. Chapter 12. Trade and Commerce. The chapter begins with a quote. The great ships which pass between the old and the new lands are shuttles weaving a glorious web. Already arbitration has been fully spelled out upon the pattern, and now comes the motto, Peace and Goodwill Forever. Close quote. The United States of America furnish the only example in the world's history of a community purely industrial in origin and development. Every other nation has passed through its military stage. In Europe and in Asia, in ancient times as well as in modern, social development has been mainly the result of war. Nearly every modern dynasty in Europe has been established by conquest, and every nation there has acquired and held its territory by force of arms. 
Men had been as wild beasts slaughtering each other at the command of the small, privileged classes. The colonies of America, on the other hand, were established for commercial purposes, and generally the land they acquired was obtained by purchase or agreement, and not by conquest. Devoted to industry, the American people have never taken up the sword, except in self-defense or in defense of their institutions. Never has the plow, the hammer, or the loom been deserted for the sword of conquest. Never has the profession of arms been honored above or even equally with other professions. Indeed, before the Civil War, soldiers were objects of popular ridicule, and even now, when almost every American above forty years of age has either himself shouldered a musket or has relations who have fought for the unity of the country, the soldier of fortune a type common among other people, is unknown. Such a man as the sanguinary author of Under Fourteen Flags, a book descriptive of his butchering of fellow men under fourteen different flags, would provoke among Americans feelings of repugnance and disgust. American regiments are regiments of workers. Emblazoned on their banners are not the names of cities sacked or of thousands slaughtered, but the names of inventors, civilizing influences, labor-saving machines. By this sign shall ye conquer, was also the divine prediction for them, but the symbol was the plow, not the cross-shaped hilt of a sword. The two armies are those which the poet Holmes has so well contrasted. One marches to the drumbeat's roll, the wide-mouthed clarion's bray, and bears upon a crimson scroll our glory is to slay. One moves in silence by the stream, with sad yet watchful eyes, calm as the patient planet's gleam that walks the clouded skies. Along its front no sabers shine, no blood-red pennons wave. Its banner bears the single line, our duty is to save. While the millions of Europe have been struggling in the thralls of military despotism, the American people have been, for 100 years, peacefully working out a career of usefulness. The result is that their industrial successes have placed them at the head of the world in wealth and power. While practically independent herself, America has become indispensable to Europe. Without her bountiful supplies of cotton, grain, and meat, millions of Europeans would lack food and clothing. The commercial history of the United States may be set forth in a few words. The net imports, including coin and bullion, $22.5 million, 4.5 million pounds, in 1790, were $75 million, 15 million pounds, in 1830. And in the next term of 50 years, we find them bounding from this figure to $740 million, 148 million pounds. The exports show even a more rapid advance, for these began in 1790 at 20 million dollars, 4 million pounds, reached 60 million dollars, 12 million pounds, in the 40 years to 1830, and during the past half century we find them 725 million dollars, 145 million pounds, so that in 50 short years the foreign commerce of the Republic has increased elevenfold. The amounts of imports per capita of the population has increased during the last 50 years from $6.25, 1 pound 5 shillings, to about $15, 3 pounds, while exports increased from $5, 1 pound, to $16.60, 3 pounds 6 shillings. Let us see what the few leading articles are which go to make up this commerce. What did the Republic buy from the world in 1883? Sugar and molasses to the extent of $100 million, £19,875,000. Surely Brother Jonathan has a sweet tooth, for he spent more for sweet things than for anything else. For wool and woolen goods, he spent $55 million, £11 million. For chemicals, $45 million, £9 million. Even cotton goods, though he exports them himself, he wanted from others, to the tune of $35 million, £7 million. 
some curious things in cotton, I suppose, which pleased his fancy, or her fancy more likely. Silks he paid just a little more for, or thirty-seven million dollars. Seven point four million pounds went for those. The Scotch says, She never bowed for a silk goon that did not get the sleeve on it. The American woman goes for the full goon and gets it, although now it is generally of domestic manufacture, no matter what may be the label. Raw silk to be manufactured is imported to about one-half the value of imported silks, which proves how very much more is made at home than is bought abroad, the value of the raw silk being many times less than the finished goods. His cup of coffee costs the American $42 million, 8.4 million pounds per year, and tea $17 million, 3.4 million pounds. These are the principal purchases he makes from others. Now what does he sell to these good friends whom he honors with his patronage? He does a thriving business truly in this department. First come his cotton exports. The world bought from him in 1883, $250 million, 50 million pounds. Then his wheat department disposed of $120 million worth, 24 million pounds, and in the form of flour, $55 million more, 11 million pounds. Meat, eggs, butter, and other provisions kept not a few of his hands busy for no less than $107 million, 21.4 million pounds, had to be sent forward to satisfy the world's wants. Even petroleum, to the extent of $45 million, 9 million pounds, he sent forth to light the world, and nasty tobacco to end in smoke cost his customers that year no less than $22 million, 4.4 million pounds. Wood and its manufactures, to the extent of $26.5 million, 5.3 million pounds, was taken, a great deal of it, no doubt, in the shape of furniture. Iron and steel manufactures make a much better showing than expected, for he really exported these, such as sewing machines, agricultural machinery, and a thousand and one Yankee notions, to the sum of $22.5 million, 4.5 million pounds. And finally, Uncle Sam sends from his big farm some of his millions of live cattle and sheep and gets $8.5 million, 1.7 million pounds for them. These products are drawn from several departments, which may be classed under the general heads of agriculture, manufactures, mines, forests, etc., and tabulated as follows with the amounts contributed by each. Agriculture, $550 million, 110 million pounds. Manufactures, $20.5 million, 4.1 million pounds. Mining, $56,250,000, 11, pounds. The forest, $7,050,000, 1,410,000 pounds. The fisheries, seven million two hundred fifty thousand dollars one million two hundred fifty thousand pounds all others seven million two hundred fifty thousand dollars one million two hundred fifty thousand pounds thus does he the young hopeful lay under contribution all wealth producing sources to swell his prosperous and rapidly increasing business with the world we see that, notwithstanding the almost incredible expansion of home manufactures, the American citizen imports more and more from other lands. See him only fifty years ago, patronizing other people to the extent of six dollars twenty-five cents, one pound five shillings, per year, and now every man, woman, and child spends fifteen dollars three pounds for foreign goods. His tariff may be very high and quite outrageous in the opinion of many, yet he buys about three times as much per head under it as he did fifty years ago. It cannot be so very bad after all, although it is none the less true that year after year America gains firmer control of her own markets for the manufactured articles. Every year sees a decrease of these relatively to the total imports. In crude and partially manufactured articles, imports are increasing. In 1860, for instance, the proportion of these was only 26%, but by uninterrupted advances, every decade, 
it rose in 1885 to 40% of the total importations, while manufactured articles fell from 74 to 60% of the whole. The balance of trade, to which, despite the teaching of economists, Americans still attach great importance, had during the last 10 or 11 years been continually and greatly in favor of the Republic. In the space of 50 years, foreign commerce has increased fivefold. It has nearly doubled since 1860, in spite of the check it received during the war. It increased greatly in 1880 and reached its maximum in 1883. Since that time, there has been a falling off of 14% due to the protracted period of depression. Up to the year 1876, with a few exceptions, the imports were in excess of the exports of merchandise, the maximum difference being reached in 1872 when the excess was $182 million, 36.4 million pounds. Since then, the balance has been the other way, the highest figure being reached in 1879, viz. $264 million, 52.8 million pounds. Taking the period from 1860 to 1885, imports increased 63%, while the increase in exports was 129%. It is usual to speak of the Republic as without commerce. Much dire prophesying of coming decay is indulged in because the sea-going commerce is now chiefly carried in foreign ships. The tendency is to limit the term commerce to the carriage of merchandise to and from other countries. So limited, America has indeed little to boast of. The change from wooden to iron and steel ships cut her out of a large part of the carrying trade which no fiscal regulations or lack of regulations can possibly restore. For the same reason that water will not run uphill, ships cannot be sailed by dearer to cheaper countries. Had America 10,000 large ships, their crews from chief engineer to cabin boy would be foreigners because these can be secured cheaper in Liverpool or Antwerp than in New York. Americans can do better than sail the seas for the pittances earned by the men of the older lands. The first cost of ships must necessarily, for the same reason, be much more here than upon the Clyde. If the navigation laws were repealed tomorrow, no American capital would purchase foreign-built ships for trade abroad and if they did, the flag might indeed be the stars and stripes, but ship and crew would be British. The voice might be the voice of Jacob, but the hand would be the hand of Esau. In no sense would the commercial marine thus created be American or add to American wealth. For generations yet to come, the attempt to become the chief carriers of merchandise, if made, must result in failure and render the Republic ridiculous. Here is the fable which meets the case. Aha, said the turtle to the lion as the latter proudly walked the shore. Any kind of a beast can walk on the land as well as you do, but let us see you do this. And then it turned a somersault in the sea. The lion tried. Result, the turtle fed upon the lion for many days. America has no business with ocean navigation till her continent is filled and prices of labor and material are down to the European basis. Let her leave the stormy sea to the motherland, whose home is on the ocean wave, and stick to land as her natural heritage. Columbia's home is on the fertile prairie. Notwithstanding all this, America still manages to do some of the carrying trade in her wooden ships, in the construction of which she has her rivals at a disadvantage, because the timber is here. She carried, in 1880, about $280 million, 56 million pounds, or more than one-sixth of her whole foreign commerce. The coasting trade of America, from which foreigners are excluded, presents a faro showing, being 34 million tons. The total seagoing tonnage of the nation in 1884 was 3,181,000 804 tons, which places her next in rank to Britain, and far ahead of any other nation. From the unique position of Britain as the carrier of the world, it follows that her people have unconsciously been led to attach far too much importance to the foreign trade as it concerns nations in general. Even in her own case, it is trifling compared to her internal commerce. 
Her railways alone carry three times as much as all her ships, foreign, seagoing, and domestic traffic combined. Quote, the milkman who brings the daily portion of milk to him who dwells in city or town, says Edward Atkinson, the American Adam Smith, represents a commerce of vast proportions, almost equal in this country, in its aggregate value, to the whole sum of our foreign importations. Close quote. The home commerce of America, as compared to her foreign, is as 21 to 1, and even Britain's gigantic foreign commerce is only one-sixth as great as the home commerce of America. The shipping engaged in this internal commerce has an aggregate tonnage of one million tons, which, added to the seagoing, gives as the total American tonnage engaged in commerce four million two hundred and fifty thousand tons as against the seven million tons of Britain. The total American traffic with foreign nations is sixteen millions of tons. If every ton carried in foreign ships were carried in American ships, the additional trade would not be as great as the natural increase of her home commerce for a single year, truly a paltry prize to contend for and make such a fuss about. The American coasting tonnage alone more than doubles the entire foreign traffic, 34 as against 16 million tons. While the domestic commerce by rail is reported as 291 and by steamers on lakes and rivers as 25 and a half millions of tons, thus it appears that our internal commerce, of which so little is heard, is more than 20 times greater than the foreign trade. One ton of foreign to 20 tons of domestic commerce. Really, there is no greater impostor than the distinguished stranger known as foreign commerce. The interdependence of our states, and hence the commerce between them, is shown in an interesting way by an illustration borrowed from my friend Mr. Edward Atkinson. Quote, a homely illustration in a subject not fitted for poetic treatment, nor likely to appeal to the imagination, commerce in hogs. The great prairies of the West grow corn in such abundance that even now, with all our means of intercommunication, it cannot all be used as food, and some of it is consumed as fuel. It often happens that the farmer upon new land, remote from railroads, can get only 15 to 20 cents per bushel for Indian corn, at which price, while it is the best, it is also the cheapest fuel that he can have, and its use is an evidence of good economy and not of waste. Upon the fat prairie lands of the West, the hog is wholesomely fed only upon the corn in the milk or corn in the ear, thence he is carried to the colder climate of Massachusetts, where by the use of that one crop in which New England excels all others, ice, the meat can be packed at all seasons of the year. There it is prepared to serve as food for the workmen of the North, the freemen of the South, or the artisan of Europe, while the blood, dried in a few hours to a fine powder, and sent to the cotton fields of South Carolina and Georgia to be mixed with the phosphate rocks that underlie their coastland, serves to produce the cotton fiber, which furnishes the cheapest and fittest clothing for the larger portion of the inhabitants of the world. Here, then, is commerce, or men serving each other on a grand scale, all developed within the century, and undreamed of by our ancestors. The vast plains of the West, enriched by countless myriads of buffalo, can spare for years to come a portion of their production force. Commerce sets in motion her thousand wheels, food is borne to those who need it, and they are saved the effort to obtain it on the more sterile soil of the cold north. Commerce turns that very cold to use. The refuse is saved, and commerce has discovered that its use is to clothe the naked in distant lands. Born to the sandy but healthy soils of Georgia and South Carolina, it renovates them with the fertility thus transferred from the prairies of Illinois and Indiana, and presently there comes back to Massachusetts the cotton of the farmers, the well-saved, clean, strong, and even staple which commerce again has discovered to be worth identifying as the farmer's, not as the planter's crop, made by his own labor and picked by his wife and children. Close quote. Much is said in Britain about the tariff policy of the Republic, 
but the results of that policy, I fear, are but little understood. The general impression is that the duties charged are so exorbitant as seriously to cripple trade between the old and new lands. So far from this being true, Britain has no customer to whom she sends so much of her manufactures, nor any with whom her trade increases so rapidly. This so-called highly protective and heavily taxed republic imports more British goods than any other people. Here are the figures for 1883, which was a poor year for American business. Britain sent goods to India in that year, valued at 24 millions sterling, to Germany 19 millions, to France 18 millions, and to the Republic 27 millions sterling. The total importations of America that year were $725 million, 145 million pounds, and of this vast sum, more than a full one-third, or $250 million, 50 million pounds, came from Britain and British possessions. $185 million, 37 million pounds, came from Great Britain and Ireland proper. Footnote. The difference in value between this 37 million pounds and the 27 million pounds reported as exports that year from Britain to the United States may be found in the differing values at the place of manufacture in Britain and value in America duty paid. To show how overwhelmingly the Republic buys from Britain, we have but to contrast its purchase from other lands. France, in 1882, supplied only $90 million, 18 million pounds, worth of goods, and Germany but $56 million, 11.2 million pounds worth. The combined trade of these two principal sources of supply after Britain exceeds but little more than one half of Britain's sum, including British possessions, nor do they combined come near equaling the purchases from Britain proper, for together France and Germany sent but $146 million, 29.2 million pounds, while Britain sent $196 million, 39.2 million pounds. Britain could lose either France or Germany, and almost both combined as purchasers, and her trade would not suffer as much as from the withdrawal of the much-abused American. Is it not time for the monarchy to be just a little mindful of this fact, and to behave itself accordingly toward its dutiful offspring, who year after year increases his patronage and takes of her manufactures more than he takes from all the rest of the world? The question of free trade in America is one which will not be within the reach of practical politics in the lives of those now living. To bring it about, one of two courses is necessary. Either the revenue must be raised by increased internal taxation, or the duty must be enormously raised upon the only necessaries of life which America imports largely, sugar, coffee, etc. Neither of these seem probable. A new duty upon the food of the people of Britain is just as probable as one in America. Even Democratic President Cleveland, in his first message to Congress, states that any reduction in the tariff should be made in the duties now imposed upon the necessaries of life. The tendency is all in this direction. The second course would be to raise revenue by direct taxation. This is the ideal standard, and the Republic in its march may some day work up to it, and give another advanced political lesson to others. So far, no nation has ever tried even to approach it. Evidently, it is not for our day or generation. What, then, is the possible and consequently the only probable outcome of tariff discussion? Nothing beyond a possible gradual reduction of duties at intervals of some years, say five or six percent each decade. But these reductions, speaking generally, will be made only upon such articles as can be manufactured profitably here, with lower than the existing duties, nor will the duties be lowered to a point which will cripple the home manufacture. The question is not now which policy is the better for a new nation, free trade or protection, but how is the huge fabric of manufactures to be dealt with, the greatest in the world, as we have seen. It has been called into existence upon certain conditions and has accommodated itself thereto. The conservatism of the democracy is so ingrained as to justify one in prophesying that great care will be taken not to disturb it unduly. 
I often hear surprise expressed in Europe that the vast body of consumers should bear so contentedly the extra cost upon what they purchase, the result of heavy duties. The explanation is twofold. First, manufacturers are spreading rapidly over most of the states. The southern states of Alabama, Tennessee, Missouri, and others, for instance, are really protective states now from this cause, as are Minnesota and Michigan in the northwest. But the second cause lies much deeper. Prices of articles are no longer generally fixed by the foreign, but by the home competition. One instance may illustrate many other branches in which the consumers buy what they need very cheap, in many cases about as cheap as the European does, wholly irrespective of duty. The duty upon steel rails is, say, $17.50, £3.11 shillings per ton, market price in Britain, £5 shipside Liverpool, total in New York, provided they were transported and laid down there for nothing, would still be $42.50 or £8.10. shillings. The railroads of America have had no difficulty in purchasing hundreds of thousands of tons at $28, £5.12, shillings, and they know well that if any considerable portion of their requirements had to come from abroad, the cost would very greatly exceed this. In clothing, which was formerly the article upon which the greatest difference in price existed between the two countries, the case is much the same. Some competent friends who have been visiting us assure me that prices generally are as cheap as at home, and in some cases even cheaper. Foreign competition has been recommended as the necessary and certain cure against exorbitant profits being exacted by the home manufacturer to the detriment of the consumer. Very good but precisely the same cure is found from vigorous home competition. As far as the foreigner was concerned, as we have seen in the case of steel rails, the American manufacturer might have had $42.50 per ton for rails which he was forced to sell for $28, which was only the British price, $25 with a fair rate of transportation to New York, and expenses incident thereto, without a penny added for duty. What forced him to do so and give the consumer rails for $28? Home competition. Even our monarchical friends in Canada bought steel rails from American mills last year because the cost was less than was demanded for those of British manufacture, although both were alike as to duty. I merely venture to give the facts bearing upon the present aspect of the question as far as the Republic is concerned that those in Europe who bewail the hard fate of the consumer here may be comforted, for truly he is not paying the fair cost of his supplies plus the duty, but only the unprecedentedly low prices established by the close and unremitting competition of the home manufacturers, and these prices, as has been shown in the chapter on manufacturers, are, with rare exceptions, not much above those of Britain. It is, for these reasons, that the consumer is not troubling himself, and cannot be made to trouble himself, very greatly with the question of the tariff. Far be it from me to retard the march of the world towards the free and unrestricted interchange of commodities. When the democracy obtains sway throughout the earth, the nations will become friends and brothers, instead of being, as now, the prey of the monarchical and aristocratic ruling classes, and always warring with each other, Standing armies and warships will be of the past, and men will then begin to destroy custom houses as relics of a barbarous monarchical age, not altogether from the low plane of economic gain or loss, but strongly impelled thereto from the higher standpoint of the brotherhood of man. All restriction upon the products of other lands will then seem unworthy of any member of the race, and the dawn of that day will have come when man to man the world o'er shall brothers be and all that end of chapter 12 chapter 13 part 1 of triumphant democracy by andrew carnegie this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. Chapter 13, Part 1 Railways and Waterways. And you will then, when the colonies achieve independence, see how the earth will be beautified. What culture, what new arts and new sciences, what safety for commerce. Navigation will precipitate all the peoples toward each other. A day will come when we will go into a populous and regulated city of California as one goes in the stagecoach of Mo, Marquis d'Argenson, 1745. The inhabitants of the tight little island of Britain or of the miniature states of Europe can have no conception of distance as understood by the American. The vastness of the American continent gives a corresponding width to the conceptions of space formed by its inhabitants. The state of New York is almost as large as England, while Texas is larger than France or England and Germany combined. California has a greater area than Austria and some other states and territories, not only by name in England, like Nevada, Colorado, Oregon, and Nebraska have areas greater than several European kingdoms. The distance from New York to Chicago exceeds that from London to Rome, while San Francisco is farther from the Atlantic coast than Quebec is from London. The journey from Philadelphia to New Orleans is nearly twice as great as that from London to St. Petersburg, while Jerusalem Cairo, Cyprus, Constantinople, Astrakhan, and Tenerife are all nearer to Hyde Park Corner than Salt Lake City is to Boston, and Salt Lake City is only two-thirds of the way across the continent. During the Civil War, the frontier defended by General Grant exceeded in length a line drawn from London across the Channel and Continent to Constantinople thence through Asia Minor and Palestine to the Great Pyramid at Cairo, and then still on up the Nile as far as the first cataract. And this line, if drawn, would be many miles shorter than the journey from New York to the city of Portland, Oregon. These comparisons will help the British reader to conceptions which are as familiar to the American as the star-spangled emblem of his nationality. It will also help the European to form a slight estimate of the labor and cost by which there has been spread over this vast continent a network of railways which ramify it in every part. One hundred years ago, America was almost as much a dark continent as Africa is now. A few adventurous pioneers and explorers had forced their way to the Father of Waters and descended by it to the Gulf of Mexico, but a transcontinental journey was unthought of until 1803, when at the recommendation of President Jefferson, an exploring expedition was sent to the Pacific under command of Captain William Clark and Meriwether Lewis. It was considered a wonderful feat when the little party under their charge penetrated the wilderness across the mountains and down the westward slope to the mouth of the Columbia River on the Pacific, two years and four months being required for the journey and return. Even in 1830, there were no facilities for internal travel. The states along the coast had constructed rough turnpike roads and railways were just introduced. But the heart of the continent was practically closed to all but the most adventurous. Two-thirds of all the mails were carried in lumbering stagecoaches, with bodies hung upon leather straps that they might swing freely in any direction without being knocked to pieces as they struggled over the corduroy roads. A trip in one of these vehicles tossed the traveler as if he were in a fishing smack upon the channel in a storm. The other third was carried upon the backs of horses and in sulkies. Steamboats were carriers over only a few small short routes, and there were only 23 miles of railway laid in all the land. 
All this was as late as 1830, just over 50 years ago. The discomforts of stagecoach traveling in America cannot even be guessed at in these days of palace cars and 40 miles per hour express trains. The books of early visitors are full of invective and complaints at the horrors of an American stage. The Norwegian Arfid's son wrote in 1832, a traveler intending to proceed thence from Augusta, South Carolina, by land to New Orleans, is earnestly recommended to bid adieu to all comforts on leaving Augusta and make the necessary preparations for a hard and rough campaign. If he has a wife and children unprovided for, and to whom he has not the means of leaving a suitable legacy, let him by all means be careful to insure his life to the highest amount the office will take, for the chances of his perishing on the journey are ten to one, calculated according to the following table of casualties. One, by horses running away. Two, by drowning. Three, by murder. Four, by explosion. Miss Martineau, in 1834 to 5, thus describes her experiences. The mail roads are still extremely bad. I found in traveling through the Carolinas and Georgia that the drivers consider themselves entitled to get on by any means they can devise, that nobody helps and nobody hinders them. It was constantly happening that the stage came to a stop on the brink of a wide and a deep puddle extending all across the road. The driver helped himself without scruple to as many rails of the nearest fence as might serve to fill up the bottom of the hole or break our descent into it. On inquiry, I found it was not probable that either fence or road would be mended till both had gone to absolute destruction. The traffic on these roads is so small that the stranger feels himself almost lost in the wilderness. In the course of several days' journey, we saw, with the exception of the wagons of a few encampments, only one vehicle besides our own. It was a stage returning from Charleston. Our meeting in the forest was like the meeting of ships at sea. We asked the passengers from the south of news from Charleston and Europe, and they questioned us about the state of politics at Washington. The eager vociferation of drivers and passengers was like such as is unusual out of exile. We were desired to give up all thoughts of going by the eastern road to Charleston. The road might be called impassable, and there was nothing to eat by the way. Even as late as 1850, Sir Charles Lyell says, after comparing the risks, it seems to be more dangerous to travel by land in a new country than by river steamers and some who have survived repeated journeyings in stagecoaches show us many scars. The judge who escorted my wife to Natchez informed her that he had been upset no less than 13 times. To the inconvenience of stage traveling, described in these extracts, must be added that of being jolted over corduroy roads made of logs placed longitudinally across the road with nothing to fill up the inequalities of surface. On roads where there was no competition, the slowness of the stages was very exasperating. One writer says, We scarcely averaged more than three and a half miles an hour, and in urging the drivers even to this speed, had to submit to no little insolence into the bargain. The insolence of drivers is complained of by nearly all the English travelers at this period. Passengers had also to look after their own baggage and to get out into the mud and rain to fasten it to the coach when the jolting had loosened the straps. The Democratic Review for September 1839 says that in 1835, 
the speed of communication achieved by the express mail was deemed almost the acme of mail improvement and as examples it mentions the following from new york to washington one day eight hours from new york to richmond virginia two days thirteen hours from new york to columbia south carolina six days three hours from new york to milledgeville georgia seven days fifteen hours from new york to mobile alabama twelve days twelve hours from new york to new orleans fourteen days zero hours from new york to columbus ohio four days sixteen hours from new york to indianapolis indiana seven days fourteen hours from new york to st louis missouri thirteen days ten hours from new york to huntsville alabama eleven days twenty two hours from new orleans to montgomery alabama three days twenty one hours from new orleans to nashville tennessee ten days zero hours from new orleans to louisville kentucky thirteen days zero hours from new orleans to cincinnati ohio fourteen days eleven hours from new orleans to columbus ohio sixteen days nine hours from new orleans to pittsburgh pennsylvania fifteen days five hours how diverse were the means of travel in those days is well illustrated by a journey from troy to chicago made in eighteen thirty two by mr philo carpenter he took the erie canal to buffalo and thence went by lake steamer to detroit four and a half days was then the usual time for this passage from detroit mr carpenter went by weekly mail coach to niles and then took passage from niles to the mouth of the st joseph river on a flatboat thence he was conveyed by two indians in a bark canoe which they improvised as far as the mouth of the calumet where one of the indians was seized with the colic and they refused to proceed further our traveller then bargained with a settler for the use of a lumber wagon drawn by oxen and with this he eventually reached fort dearborn as chicago was then called the limited express now does this journey in twenty-four hours and the traveller never has to leave his peripatetic hotel after eighteen thirty came the transition period when primitive railways began to compete with canal boats and stage coaches in the philadelphia public ledger for may of twenty second eighteen thirty six appeared the following advertisement headed by a primitive looking engine and cars fare reduced to twelve dollars new express fast packet line from philadelphia to pittsburgh the only line exclusively for passengers via lancaster and harrisburg railroads and pennsylvania canals leaves daily at six o'clock a m through in three days for passage apply to at the office fifty one chestnut street below third street john cameron agent and two years later in the same journal appears the following fare reduced leach and company's packet line to pittsburgh via railroads and canals through in four and a half days upon one of these canal boats i saw arrive in pittsburgh the first locomotive that ever came west of the ohio river the early railroads seemed very rude judged by modern standards passenger cars were small vehicles holding no more than eighteen to twenty-four passengers and not much if any heavier than the large stage coaches the iron used for rails was flat bar iron from half to three-fourths of an inch thick spiked on wooden sleepers which were lightly tied and on tracks not perfectly graded or heavily ballasted the locomotives weighed from two to six or seven tons and drew corresponding loads great weight and high speed would have destroyed the tracks one of the dangers of travel was from snake heads caused by the loosening of the ends of the thin rails which bending up were caught between the wheels and driven through the bottom of the cars 
wounding or impaling anyone who sat over the point of entrance. Instead of grading up or down steep declivities, cars were passed over the incline by counterweights of box cars, loaded with stone which balanced them like window weights and made it easy to pass up one as the other went down. Twenty miles a year were in those days rapid railroad building. The first railway trains were drawn by horses or mules, though locomotives were early introduced from England and duplicated in America. An account of the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad, printed in Williams Register for 1833, concludes with the words, Passengers are carried upon this road in coaches, drawn by horses and by the locomotive engines, whose powers are not yet conclusively tried. And, from a passage in the Charleston Patriot for April 1830, it would appear that other means of propulsion had been tried. Yesterday afternoon, a sail was set on a car on the railroad before a large assembly of persons. It went at the rate of 12 to 15 miles per hour, with 15 persons on board. Afterwards, 13 persons and 3 tons of iron were carried at the rate of 10 miles per hour. Considering the haste and the imperfect manner in which the sail was got up, the result was highly gratifying. But the most curious of propelling machines was one invented by Detmold. This was an engine run by a horse walking on an endless platform like the early horse ferries. This curious machine carried passengers at the rate of 12 miles an hour. Observe how the interior of the continent had been thrown open to civilization. A Santa Fe merchant wrote in 1830, On the day of our departure, with wagon trains drawn by mules, from Independence we passed the last human abode upon our route. Therefore, from the borders of Missouri to those of New Mexico, not even an Indian settlement greeted our eyes. And when wagons, instead of pack mules, were first used for internal transportation, the extraordinary nature of the change was sufficient to justify the following in Niles Register for May 8, 1850. A party of 70 men with 10 wagons was recently fitting out at St. Louis for an expedition to the Rocky Mountains. What? next. Nearly 30 years later, a regular stage line was established by the Pikes Peak Express Company between the Missouri River and the Rocky Mountains. Transportation was effected by wagon trains and ox and mule trains, and so perfectly did this line work that a distance of 700 miles was made in six days and nights. Then, in the spring of 1860, the owners of the Pikes Peak stage line established what was known as the Pony Express, which served as a daily fast mail line between the cities of the Atlantic and Pacific coasts. The scheme was a marvel of American enterprise. Previous to that time, over three weeks were required to convey mails by steamer from New York to San Francisco. This Pony Express made the distance between the railway terminus on the Missouri River and the Pacific in eight or nine days. Brave men and first-class stock were required, for Indians and highwaymen were often encountered, and the relay stations were sometimes burned and the stock run off. Almost the entire distance of nearly 2,000 miles to be traversed was one vast solitude. No delays were permitted. The mailbags were kept constantly on the move during these long and lonely trips. Horses were changed at every station and riders at intervals of from 50 to 70 miles. The rapid time made caused the government to send the mails overland. From such small beginnings has grown the magnificent railroad system of America. When the success of the first road had been proved, others quickly sprang into existence. And presently, all over the inhabited portions of the continent, men were digging, grading, blasting, tunneling at a rate which has hardly suffered diminution and has never ceased. 
the development of the resources of the country by means of these artificial highways has gone on with marvelous rapidity finally the idea of stretching a railway line across the entire continent began to take possession of the public mind as early as eighteen forty six the feasibility of such an undertaking had been discussed in congress and in eighteen forty nine the idea took tangible shape in the form of a bill introduced by senator benton in eighteen fifty one surveying parties were sent out to decide upon a route but delays afterwards resulted from differences between the northern and southern states when the war removed this obstacle acts of congress were passed providing subsidies in gold and land to the corporations authorized to build the road work was commenced in eighteen sixty three but only in a dilatory way in eighteen sixty five the work progressed at a rate unheard of before the rails were laid at the rate of two and three miles a day and in one instance eight miles of track were laid the line was completed and thrown open to traffic throughout its entire length in eighteen sixty nine since then three other transcontinental lines have been constructed and now every part of the great republic is the neighbor of the other part the bostonian does not think of his fellow citizens of new orleans as one thousand six hundred miles away but as distant only forty odd hours the new yorker does not speak of the thousand miles intervening between him and chicago but only of the twenty-four hours required to get there in one sense space has been annihilated in america and time is now the only measure of men's separation from each other american railways were built under charters for short distances but as population increased these were consolidated and managed as great through lines between termini hundreds of miles apart in time these main lines absorbed branch and connecting lines and now there are several systems each serving extensive districts of these the most important the pennsylvania is a good example its network of lines aggregates five thousand four hundred and ninety one miles with more than a thousand miles of second third and fourth tracks gross earnings in eighteen eighty four were eighty million dollars sixteen million pounds the tonnage was sixty three million tons and the cost of moving perhaps the lowest in the world being about four mills less than a halfpenny per ton per mile certainly no rates for traffic in europe are so low as the average received by the pennsylvania railroad this line is solidly built stone ballasted and in every respect compares favorably with the trunk lines of europe if we accept numerous road crossings at grade which would not be tolerated abroad from its depot opposite new york four times per day through trains start for the great west with sleeping coaches which run through without change to chicago st louis and cincinnati in special cases when desired the traveling party may pass on to san francisco or to new orleans without change a dining or hotel car is attached at proper intervals and every luxury supplied upon these peripatetic delmonicos the new york central erie and baltimore and ohio are systems of similar character between the east and west chicago the western metropolis has also its corresponding railway systems some of which are of great magnitude the chicago burlington and quincy has three thousand three hundred and seventy three miles the chicago and northwestern three thousand two hundred and seventy one miles and the chicago milwaukee and st paul the work of that man of aberdeen alexander mitchell no less than four thousand eight hundred and four miles under its sway it is with railways as with manufacturers consolidation into the hands of a few organizations seems the inevitable tendency the saving and efficiency thus effected over the hundred former disjointed petty corporations each with its officers and staffs are so manifestly great 
that nothing can prevent these consolidations. What the outcome of this massing of forces is to be is difficult to foretell, but that it is in accordance with economic laws is certain. Therefore, we can proceed without fear. We are on sure ground, hence the final result must be beneficial. If corporations grow to gigantic size and attempt to use their powers like giants, forgetting that they are the creatures and servants of the state, we may safely trust the democracy to deal with them. There is no problem which an educated people cannot and will not solve in the interests of the people when solution is demanded. End of chapter 13, part 1, Railways and Waterways. Chapter 13, Part 2 of Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. Chapter 13, Part 2, Railways and Waterways. The American railway system, starting 55 years ago at nothing, has reached in 1885 128,000 miles of line. The whole of Europe has not so many, for in 1883 it had only 114,300 miles and the entire world but 279,850 miles. The record for the past 10 years shows with what strides the Iron Road is girding the continent. For during that period, no less than 54,280 miles were built. When we read that in 1880, India, with its 250 millions of people, added to its railways only 273 miles, and the Republic, with its 50 millions, added in 1880 11,500 miles, we get some idea of the speed at which she rushes on. The whole of Europe has not built as many miles of railway as the Republic has during some recent years, and in 1880 the whole world did not build as many. It will only be a few years, probably not ten, ere the railway lines of America exceed in length those of all the rest of the world, the republic in one scale and the world in the other, and the world kicking the beam. Monster, you were called into existence only to redress the balance of the old world, and within one short century we find you threatening to weigh it down. The republic against the field and no takers. In no other country is travel so comfortable and luxurious. For this we are chiefly indebted to a remarkable American invention, the sleeping car, without which such extended lines would have remained an imperfect instrument for the consolidation of the people. Journeys between the oceans, requiring seven days and nights to perform, or even that between Chicago and other western cities to New York and the east, which occupy but 24 to 48 hours consecutive travel, could have been undertaken only in extreme cases had the unfortunate traveler been required to sit up, as in the old-fashioned cars. Well do I remember that, when a clerk in the service of the Pennsylvania Railroad Company, a tall, spare, farmer-looking kind of man, came to me once when I was sitting on the end seat of the rear car looking over the line. He said he had been told by the conductor that I was connected with the railway company, and he wished me to look at an invention he had made. With that, he drew from a green bag, as if it were for lawyer's briefs, a small model of a sleeping berth for railway cars. He had not spoken a minute before, like a flash, the whole range of the discovery burst upon me. Yes, I said. That is something which this continent must have. I promised to address him upon the subject as soon as I had talked over the matter with my superior, Thomas A. Scott. I could not get that blessed sleeping car out of my head. Upon my return, I laid it before Mr. Scott. 
declaring that it was one of the inventions of the age. He remarked, You are enthusiastic, young man, but you may ask the inventor to come and let me see it. I did so, and arrangements were made to build two trial cars and run them on the Pennsylvania Railroad. I was offered an interest in the venture, which, of course, I gladly accepted. Payments were to be made 10% per month after the cars were delivered, the Pennsylvania Railroad Company guaranteeing to the builders that the cars should be kept upon its line and under their control. This was all very satisfactory until the notice came that my share of the first payment was $217.50, 43 pounds. How well I remember the exact sum, but $217 and a half worth far beyond my means as if it had been millions. I was earning $50, 10 pounds per month, however, and had prospects, or at least I always felt that I had. What was to be done? I decided to call on the local banker, Mr. Lloyd, state the case, and boldly ask him to advance the sum upon my interest in the affair. He put his hand upon my shoulder and said, Why, of course, Andy, you are all right. Go ahead. Here is the money. It is a proud day for a man when he pays his last note, but not to be named in comparison with the day in which he makes his first one and gets a banker to take it. I have tried both, and I know. The cars paid the subsequent payments from their earnings. I paid my first note from my savings so much per month, and thus did I get my foot upon fortune's ladder. It is easy to climb after that. A triumphant success was scored, and thus came sleeping cars into the world. Blessed be the man who invented sleep, says Sancho Panza. Thousands upon thousands will echo the sentiment. Blessed be the man who invented sleeping cars. Let me record his name and testify my gratitude to him. My dear, quiet, modest, truthful, farmer-looking friend, T.T. T. Woodruff, one of the benefactors of the age. This brings us to another remarkable man, George M. Holman as great a genius in organization and administration as Woodruff was in his peculiar line. It did not take this typical American of Chicago very long to see what part sleeping cars were bound to play upon the American continent. And while a few cautious old gentlemen in Philadelphia were managing the original cars in that peculiar Philadelphian way which is so amusing, Making ten bites of even the smallest cherry, this young man laid his daring plans. He would contract for twenty or thirty cars, while the Philadelphia people hesitated to engage for one. The result was that Mr. Pullman completely eclipsed them. I soon saw that we had a genius to deal with and advised the old concern to capture Mr. Pullman. There was a capture, but it did not quite take that form. They found themselves swallowed by this ogre, and Pullman monopolized everything. It was well that it should be so. The man had arisen who could manage, and the tools belonged to him. Today, his company has a paid-up capital of about 30 millions of dollars, and its ramifications extend everywhere. Mr. Pullman is a remarkable man, for he not only manages this business, he created it. Before he appeared upon the scene, a sleeping car company had no rights which a railway company was bound to respect. Mr. Pullman has made the business respectable, and the traveling public are very much his debtors. Should Mr. Pullman's life be spared, I prophesy that the young contractor for elevating buildings in Chicago will leave a monument for himself in his new industrial town of Pullman, which will place his name with those of Salt of Saltaire and Baudin of Guise. A short roll of honor this, which contains the list of those who, springing from honest poverty, have made fortunes through honest toil, and then Ah, here comes the secret of the shortness of the list. 
and then turning back to look upon the poor workers where they started have thereafter devoted their fortune and abilities so to improve the industrial system as to give to that class a better chance in life than it was possible for themselves to obtain mr pullman has made a start upon this toilsome path his future deserves to be carefully watched if ever aerial navigation becomes practicable it will like railways attain its highest development in america for here men's lives are too full of activity to permit lounging in parlor cars drawn wearily by a locomotive at only forty miles an hour when it is possible for men to soar through the air and outstrip their own symbolic eagle in its flight nature has done much for america as regards facilities for transportation her inland seas containing one-third of all the fresh water in the world and her great rivers lay ready at hand awaiting only the application of steam to vessels to render them magnificent highways a vessel sailing round the edges of these american lakes traverses a greater distance than from new york to liverpool the rivers of america are also the largest in the world after the amazon and the la plata comes the mississippi with an outflow of over two million cubic feet per hour this mighty river which the indians called in their picturesque language father of waters is equal in bulk to all the rivers of europe combined exclusive of the volga it is equal to three ganges nine rhones twenty-seven seines or eighty tibers the mighty tiber chafing with its flood says the master how would he have described the mississippi on the rampage after a spring flood when it pours down its mighty volume of water and overflows the adjacent lowlands eighty tibers in one burns picture of the pretty little air in flood has been extolled where the foaming waters came down an acre braid what think you of a tumbling sea twenty miles braid instead of your acre dear robin the length of the mississippi is two thousand two hundred and fifty miles while its navigable tributaries exceed twenty thousand miles the father of waters collects his substance from watersheds covering an area of more than two and a half million square miles the hudson is navigable by large steamers as far as albany one hundred and fifty miles inland from the atlantic there are quite a dozen other rivers in which the like is possible many well-known seaports are considerable distances from the coast properly speaking such are philadelphia baltimore new orleans and on the pacific coast portland the presence of inland ports with extensive docks piers and large craft is a constant source of astonishment to the european traveller the sight of ships of three thousand tons burden fifteen hundred miles from salt water is sufficient to surprise one in whom the sight of rigged ships has always been associated with the sea walking along the quays of the lake cities buffalo toledo chicago or duluth one might well imagine himself at the seacoast these great natural waterways have been supplemented and connected with each other by artificial canals there were in the united states in eighteen eighty four thousand four hundred and sixty eight miles of canals which had cost two hundred and sixty five million dollars fifty three million pounds nearly two thousand miles of canal had however been abandoned having been rendered valueless by the superior facilities offered by railroads many of the canals still worked were reported not to be paying expenses and part of these also will no doubt soon be abandoned the freight traffic on canals in eighteen eighty amounted to twenty one million forty four thousand two hundred and ninety two tons yielding a gross income of forty five million dollars nine million pounds 
the early history of navigation in America presents as many curious contrasts and interesting facts as do other divisions of the history of American progress. From beginnings, which to us seem ludicrously small and crude, the greatest results have come. At the beginning of the century, a successful steamboat had not been built. For twenty or thirty years, inventors in France, Scotland, England, and America had been working and planning to apply a principle which they saw was perfectly applicable, but lacking knowledge of one or two little essentials, they only passed from failure to failure, yet constantly getting nearer and nearer to success. John Fitch and Oliver Evans are the names of the earliest representatives of America in this great struggle. After each experimenter had contributed some new light, an American engineer, Robert Fulton by name, gathered in 1807 the multiplicity of lights into one great flame, and made practicable by the help of all what each had tried in vain to achieve by himself. Fulton's Claremont was the first commercially successful steamboat ever built. A boat of 160 tons burden, she was launched on the Hudson in 1807 and ran over a year as a passenger boat between New York and Albany. The first steamboat of the Mississippi Valley was built by Fulton in 1811 and was called the Orleans. She had a stern wheel and went from Pittsburgh to New Orleans more than 2,000 miles in 14 days. The next year, Henry Bell of Scotland built the Comet of 30 tons, which plied between Glasgow and Greenock, and in 1813 sailed around the coasts of the British Isles. In 1819, the Savannah, 380 tons burden, crossed the Atlantic from America visited Liverpool, St. Petersburg, and Copenhagen and returned. Nineteen years later, the Great Western, 1,340 tons, and the Syria steamed across the Atlantic from England, and only two years afterwards, namely 1840, the present justly celebrated Cunard Line was established inaugurating an era of ocean travel which has revolutionized human life and brought the old and new worlds within six days of each other on a sunday afternoon in august last i sailed from queenstown upon the cunarder at truria and on saturday afternoon the noble ship was moving up new york bay just six days from harbor to harbor that was my last trip across the ferry Contrast it with my first seven weeks upon a sailing vessel. Internal navigation has an equally interesting history. The earliest transportation by water was effected by means of keel boats. These drifted down well enough with the current, but had to be forced upstream with setting poles. The keel boat was long and narrow, sharp at the bow and stern, and of light draft. From 15 to 20 hands were required to propel it. The crew, divided equally on each side, took their places upon the running boards extending along the whole length of the craft, and each man, setting one end of a long pole in the bottom of the river, brought the other to his shoulder, and bending over it with his face nearly to the plank, exerted all his force against the boat, treading it from under him. While those of one side were thus passing down in line to the stern, those on the other, facing about, were passing towards the bow, drawing their poles floating on the water. The keel boatmen kept their rifles constantly within reach, in case Indians should attempt to surprise them. Their journeys often lasted several months. These keel boatmen, living a semi barbarous life, developed traits more befitting the aboriginal savage than the descendants of Europeans. Human life with them appears to have had little more sanctity than the lives of the animals they shot on the river banks. The descriptions of the now extinct keel boatsmen, left by contemporary writers, surpass in horrible detail anything ever written of western cowboys or miners. 
they have now disappeared before steamboats and civilization as completely as the wildernesses amongst which their lives were mostly spent with other barbarisms of the good old times they have sunk into oblivion r i p one of the earliest packet lines we read about is the following on the eleventh of january seventeen ninety four a line of two keel boats with bullet-proof covers and portholes and provided with cannon and small arms was established between cincinnati and pittsburgh each making a trip once in four weeks the defensive equipment of these keel boats is very suggestive nothing enables one better to contrast now and then it is interesting to read how our fathers occasionally compared the comforts of their days with the discomforts of our grandfathers how proudly they spoke of improvements and how delighted and content they were with accommodations which seemed to us comfortless and mean here is a characteristic sample written about eighteen forty five when steamboats uncomfortable and slow were everywhere replacing lines of stages or horse packets in leaving bangor maine in a steamboat though only for a short trip i am thereby reminded of the difference which has taken place in our city and throughout the country in the mode of travelling between the present time and only twenty years since i say twenty years because it is about twenty years since i left the paternal home and in the good sloop betsy took passage for bangor where we arrived in safety after eight days toil the usual mode of travelling then from bangor was by the lumber coasters in which passengers male and female were stowed away in the few berths in the cabin or sprawled around upon the uncarpeted floor there was indeed a semi-packet with a few extra berths hung round with a narrow and rather scanty red bombazette frill but mean as these accommodations may now eighteen forty five be considered they afforded the best means of conveyance between bangor and massachusetts and during the rainy seasons in the spring and fall the only conveyance for instead of three daily stages west as now the mail was carried once a week only and then on horseback between bangor and augusta during the winter to be sure moses burley conveyed the mail and occasionally a passenger or two in a sleigh with a tandem team and during the summer in a rickety covered wagon then there was no small mail route to any of the towns above bangor and the old register in the monthly advertisement of the postmaster of two fingers long enumerated letters for the whole region round about these reminiscences have brought vividly to mind the appearance of the village as it was then there were but five brick buildings erected including the old distill house that has since been removed to give place to the city point block there were but eighteen stores a few mechanics shops one bridge and that the kandusky where toll was required the courthouse now city hall a wooden jail three taverns and a few dwellings how delightfully confidential this old writer is he has long since been gathered to his fathers and even his name is forgotten but he must have been a good man who took an intelligent interest in what he saw though steamboats offered greater facilities and comfort to travellers than sloops or stages yet they were miserably conducted and often dangerous indeed the frequency of collision and explosions was appalling it became common to have safety barges towed by the steamboat and an illustration of a boat of this character appended to an advertisement in the commercial advertiser for june sixteenth eighteen thirty shows that the engine and boiler and apparently the paddle wheel were placed right at the bow as far away as possible from the passengers on the safety barge in eighteen thirty four five miss martineau found steamboat travelling in the west proverbially dangerous she says i was rather surprised at the cautions i received throughout the south about choosing wisely among the mississippi steamboats 
and at the question gravely asked as I was going on board whether I had a life preserver with me. I found that all my acquaintances on board had furnished themselves with life preservers, and my surprise ceased when we passed boat after boat on the river delayed or deserted on account of some accident. Since that day, the stringent regulations which provide for governmental inspection of all boats have made steamboat travels upon the rivers as safe as it is delightful. An excursion from St. Louis or Cincinnati to New Orleans upon one of the floating palaces which now traverse the lower Ohio and Mississippi ranks as one of the most enjoyable modes in which a holiday can be spent. The traffic floated upon these western rivers will surprise many. Take the Ohio, for instance. A competent authority has stated that the total of its trade from its head at Pittsburgh to its mouth at New Cairo about a thousand miles exceeded in 1874 eight hundred million dollars or a hundred and sixty million pounds a sum greater than the total exports of the nation about which we hear so much it is upon the ohio that the cheapest transportation in the world exists coal coke and other bulky articles are transported at the rate of one twentieth of a cent one fortieth of a penny per ton per mile this is made possible by means of barges many of which are now lashed together and pushed ahead by a steam tug the current of course carries along the floating mass the steamer has little to do but to guide while descending and to tow the empty barges back the records of eighteen eighty four show that there were owned in the one city of pittsburgh for use on the river four thousand three hundred and twenty three vessels including barges with a tonnage of one million seven hundred thousand tons one hundred and sixty three of these were steamboats twenty thousand miles of navigable waterways lie before these pittsburgh craft and many thousand miles more are ready to be opened by easily constructed improvements in the lesser streams this work the general government is steadily performing year after year as well as improving the existing navigation even today a boat can start from pittsburgh for a port four thousand three hundred miles distant as far as from new york to queenstown and halfway back or as far away as the baltic ports are from new york said i not truly that nature made britain only as a small model and the republic full working size from what a small acorn has the mighty oak of river navigation grown here is the very first prophecy of the coming events connected with the use of these great streams and from whom of all men should such a prophecy more fittingly come than from a minister here are the words of the rev manassa cutter d d l l d of ipswich massachusetts who was at once minister scientist statesman and the agent of the new england and ohio company which started at marietta ohio blessed man he it was who succeeded in getting past the famous ordinance of seventeen eighty seven which prohibited slavery in the old northwest territory and secured that fair domain forever to freedom here is the prediction he made in a pamphlet published in seventeen eighty seven the current down the mississippi and ohio for heavy articles that suit the florida mississippi and west indian markets such as indian corn flour beef timber etc will be more loaded than any stream on earth it was found by late experiments that sails are used to great advantage against the current of the ohio and it is worthy of observation that in all probability steamboats will be found to be of infinite service in all our river navigation that was written twenty years before fulton's practically successful application of steam to navigation and a quarter of a century before the first steamboat which ever ploughed the western rivers was built at pittsburgh six years after the prediction about steamboats the country hailed as a wonderful evidence of progress the inauguration of a regular line of sail and oar boats between cincinnati and pittsburgh two boats were built for the line 
They made the round journey every four weeks, so that every two weeks a traveler had a chance to start and take a two weeks journey on the beautiful river. I wish, as I write, that we could do so now. This was our Nile and Adahabia right here at home. Why do we not try it now? What could be more delightful than the Ohio in a small boat moved by oar and sail? We have not the time, we say. Ah, ladies and gentlemen, we have not the sense. But just listen to the precautions deemed essential as late as the beginning of the century, which the advertisement sets forth. No danger need be apprehended from the enemy as every person on board will be under cover made proof against rifle or musket balls, with convenient portholes for firing out. Each of the boats is armed with six pieces carrying a pound ball, also a number of good muskets amply supplied with ammunition. So the tedium of the journey, you see, was likely to be relieved by a skirmish now and then with the noble savage and our travelers were not expected not to shoot back from under their iron-clad cover. The first steamboat troubled the waters in 1811. In 1810, we find Kramer's Magazine Almanac making the startling announcement. A company has been formed for the purpose of navigating the River Ohio in large boats to be propelled by the power of steam engines. The boat now on the stocks is 138 feet keel, and calculated for a freight, as well as a passenger boat, between Pittsburgh and the Falls of the Ohio. It is gratifying to learn that in one year the New Orleans, for such was the name, actually cleared $20,000, £4,000. No wonder the building of steamboats rapidly increased. There is nothing so creative as a good dividend. The steamboats plying between New York and Boston and also upon the Hudson between New York and Albany, have always impressed the foreign traveler as unequaled. The dimensions of some of the floating palaces are noteworthy. The tonnage of the pilgrim, for instance, is 3,500 registered ton, making her the largest inland steamboat in the world. Speed, 20 knots per hour. She carries 1,400 passengers and is lighted by 912 electric lamps. Miss Martineau has left a description of boat traveling on the Erie Canal in New York State. Compare the following with our floating palaces and Pullman cars. On fine days, she writes, it is pleasant enough sitting outside, except for having to duck under the bridges every quarter of an hour under penalty of having one's head crushed to atoms, and in dark evenings the approach of the boat lights on the water is a pretty sight, but the horrors of night and wet days more than compensate for all the advantages these vehicles can boast. The heat and noise, the known vicinity of a compressed crowd, laying packed like herrings in a barrel, the bumping against the sides of the locks, and the hissing of water therein like an inundation, startling one from sleep. These things are very disagreeable. The appearance of the berths in the ladies' cabin were so repulsive that we were seriously contemplating sitting out all night when it began to rain so as to leave us no choice. This journey from Utica to Schenectady, a distance of 80 miles, took 22 hours hours, while the packet to Rochester, 160 miles, took 46 hours, much longer than is now required to go from New York to St. Paul, Minnesota, 1,322 miles. In the short 50 years under review, we have displaced the stuffy, slow canal boat as a mode of travel for the limited express the small steamer with its safety barge for the floating palaces. If there is anything calculated to make man thankful for the blessings which he enjoys in this last quarter of the 19th century, it is the study of the conditions of life under which our ancestors lived. Not that we can form even an estimate of them. 
discomforts which would make life unendurable to us were unnoticed by them and probably they suffered in many ways at which we cannot even guess if the record of their miserable mode of life were complete the picture would without doubt be even more repulsive than it is auguste comte has gravely propounded a religion of humanity which he says is worshipful because of its victories over nature and over the discomforts by which the life of primitive man was surrounded there have been religions founded on less worthy grounds than these man has indeed played a wonderful part in the world and nothing can be more marvellous than the way in which he has subjugated the forces of nature and yoked them to his chariot and his boat but let us be modest or as sure as fate those of the next generation looking back upon this our present life are to contrast their happier condition with, with ours and pity us as we have ventured to pity our forefathers the march of humanity is upward and onward for all the countless ages to come improved physical conditions react upon mental conditions and some day man is to read with surprise that once there were upon the earth a state of warfare between divisions called nations that europe once continually taught nine millions of men how best to butcher their fellows and called this vile work a profession the coming man will marvel that intemperance prevailed in these barbaric days that there were paupers and criminals without number and that even in britain the many were kept down by the few that the soil there was held in use by a class and that a million sterling was taken from the public revenues every year by one family and spent in vulgar ostentation or riotous dissipation a family which was an insult to every other family in the land since it involved the born inferiority of all others he is to read of all this as we now read of the armored keelboat and the horse locomotive and thank his stars he was not born as we have been before the dawn of civilization as one man's meat is another man's poison so one age's civilization is the next age's barbarism we shall all be barbarians to our great-great-grandchildren we have not traveled far yet with all our progress upon the upward path but we still go marching on that which is is better than that which has been it is the mission of democracy to lead in this triumphant march and improve step by step the conditions under which the masses live to wring out the old and to wring in the new and in this great work the republic rightly leads the van End of chapter 13 Railways and Waterways Chapter 14, Part 1 of Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. Chapter 14, Part 1. Art and Music. The study of art possesses this great and peculiar charm that it is absolutely unconnected with the struggles and contests of ordinary life. It is a taste at once engrossing and unselfish, which may be indulged without effort, and yet has the power of exciting and to gratify both the nobler and softer parts of our nature, the imagination and the judgment love of emotion and power of reflection, the enthusiasm and the critical faculty, the senses and the reason. Guizot. Of all the liberal arts, music has the greatest influence over the passion, and it is that to which the legislator ought to give the greatest encouragement. A well-composed song strikes and softens the mind, and produces a greater effect than a moral work, which convinces our reason, but does not warm our feelings nor affect the slightest alteration in our habits. Napoleon at St. Helena Half a century ago it was the fashion in Europe to decry anything American, and to sneer at even the suggestion of culture in the United States, a country without historical or poetical associations, devoid of all the sources from which the genius of the old world had derived its inspirations. In short, 
a new country whose energies must for generations be directed in practical channels cannot hope to compete it was argued in the fine arts with nations whose traditions and culture reach back for centuries in eighteen twenty four a contributor to blackwood's magazine wrote the fine arts generally are neglected by the americans by this i mean that they the americans do not themselves cultivate them they have foreign musical composers and sculptors among them most of whom are indigent or starving but none of their own architecture is hardly in a better state i know of no capital american architect the writer then makes one exception to a sweeping declaration painting in this the americans have made it a surprising proficiency surprising not only by comparison with what they have done in every other department but surprising if we consider their numbers infancy and want of encouragement when compared with what we ourselves have done or any other people during the same period he then cites in support of this assertion the names of copley west trumbull rembrandt peel alston morse sully stuart leslie newton and chester harding but ends by qualifying his praise with the remark that the most celebrated of these men were educated in great britain and some of them born there another class of critics went still further and asserted that a genius for art was incompatible with a republican form of government it would seem says a writer of about the same time in the london quarterly review that a high and refined genius for art is indigenous to monarchies and under such a form of government alone can it flourish either vigorously or securely the united states of north america can never expect to possess a fine school of art so long as they retain their present system art indigenous to monarchies did any one ever hear such an absurdity the great law is that each shall produce fruit after its kind but this genius makes a monarchy produce the greatest of all republics the republic of art in art the source of that which gives the finer touches to human life all is republican there is no trace of hereditary privileges within its bounds it is as free as unstained of these injustices as the american republic itself art asks not wast thou cottager or king peer or peasant no such thing who knows or cares who michelangelo's father was or what was beethoven's birth or whether raphael was an aristocrat or wagner the son of a poor actuary of police just imagine monarchy in art a hereditary painter for instance or a sculptor who only was his father's son or a musician because born in the profession what claims from birth have liszt rubinstein gluck or the scotch laddies from their heather hills the sons of shepherds and tradesmen the malaises orchardsons petties hunters and blacks but from the republicanism of art our rulers these in art by virtue of the universal suffrage of their fellows the royal violinist parentage gives him no place in art which he has not earned nor do the creditable etchings or sculptures of the royal princesses advance them one iota beyond the merit of their work nor is it in the power of victoria nor can it be her wish to advance them one step in the republic of art were she twenty times their mother a king can make a belt at night a marquess duke and a that but let him try his hand upon creating ranks in the commonwealth of art of music and of literature and where is he the aristocrats there are better born than he himself because heaven-born nobles by the right of an earlier creation priests by the imposition of a mightier hand millais and leighton benedict and sullivan were knighted by the monarch but these rulers in art and music have not yet recognized her majesty or any of her family in their republics beyond the stage of honorable mention the queen dispenses her degrees even to a peerage for brewing beer or playing court lackey in the republics of art and letters as her majesty finds our rulers are much more fastidious the standard is different if art be as she is a most jealous mistress she is as just as she is exacting and no respecter of persons there is nothing monarchical about her nay when the monarch leaves the tinsel of official life and rises to real work in the higher domain of art 
her drawings are pronounced good and by so much she is an artist her books for letters too like art are republican are most creditable in this that a queen should have thought about making a book at all for it is true all the same that a book's a book although there's nothing in it and the effort to write a book is in itself praiseworthy whatever a person of high rank achieves in the higher realms of art deserves handsome acknowledgment the royal family of england to-day should receive and i pay them the compliment to believe they do receive more genuine satisfaction from their literary and artistic labors than from their rank and would value distinction in the republics of art music and letters if acquired beyond rank in society which can confer no honor because purely accidental for such my readers is the effect of this republican atmosphere in letters and art upon all who once enter its charmed circle and breathe its sweet influences that even these royal people exalted by a fiction and political life would be the first to repel with proud indignation the slightest intimation that their works were to be judged by any lower standard than the republican test by the suffrage of the people in comparison with the performances of the sons of shepherds dwellers weavers and ditchers their equals in the republic this is highly creditable to them such as have contributed however humbly to art music or literature beginning with her majesty herself are to be held in special honour they have their places in the republic of art were the prince of wales animated like them with the true spirit of art and letters it might extend to his ideas about position and then he could not accept the throne except by a vote of his fellows calling him to it as the person best fitted to serve the state he would scorn place granted for any reason but for his ability to serve his motto can only in this way be lived up to death levels all ranks the republics of art and of letters do no less contestants for place in these gracious commonwealths are stripped of all distinctions and start upon equal terms the equality of the citizen is the fundamental law upon which is founded all that brings sweetness and light to human life thus my friends art is republican literature is republican religion is republican no hereditary privilege in the church every good is republican that alone which is valueless hurtful and unjust is monarchical but fortunately as we have seen the poison of hereditary rank is confined to very narrow limits beyond which it is not recognized this curious writer who would have monarchy allied with arts built his theory upon the exploded idea that only monarchs and the aristocracy which flutters around courts could or would patronize the beautiful that theory is unfortunate in view of the fact that the best patrons of art are the americans and the monarchy at least is not conspicuous for its treatment of art or artists music and art like literature flourish in our day not by the patronage of a class but from popular support nothing flourishes in our day but through the support of the people monarchy itself must play to them and please them for its daily bread one breath of popular displeasure and it becomes a thing of the past it seems strange in the light of the present that any one could read history so awry as to lead him to the conclusion that monarchy favors art or literature but it is too late to render necessary any refutation of such assertions time has proved its falsity and we may now safely relegate it to the curiosities of literature but there is a modicum of truth in the assertion of the writer in blackwood of sixty years ago that the americans did not then cultivate the fine arts a few painters whose names are still pointed to with pride by their countrymen had enlivened the drear monotony of our art horizon but they were americans a little more than the accident of birth most of them were born under the british flag and the art of all was but a reflection of foreign schools and methods nor does this militate against their skill as artists nor against the right of americans to include them among their countrymen it is well to remember that france had no art till da vinci and primaticcio showed the way and that in england holbein lely and van dyck made possible a reynolds and a gainsborough it is perhaps a little remarkable that these early american painters who won as much credit abroad as at home 
should have left little inspiration behind them for it is certain that those who immediately seceded them did not attain to a similar reputation perhaps this is to be accounted for in the fact that the energies of the people were directed by the exigencies of their surroundings into more practical channels than the pursuit of the beautiful in the building up of a new country there is little time for art cultivation the establishment of a political and social system and the development of industrial resources must precede and furnish the foundation on which the superstructure of art may rise nature must be conquered before she can be admired men must be fed and clothed ere they can moralize about the beginning of the period to which we have constantly referred of fifty years ago american art began to rise from its dark age as we may characterize the period immediately succeeding that of the colonial painters up to that time there had been no training schools no public galleries of any consequence and but a small audience capable of appreciating good work in eighteen twenty six the national academy of design was organized in new york under the presidency of samuel f b morse as the successor of the american academy of fine arts which died after the fire of the same year had destroyed its art collection similar institutions had been founded early in philadelphia and in boston but the national academy has always exercised a paramount influence in the development of american art about ten years later the american art union an incorporated institution for the distribution by lot of works of art came into existence and during more than a decade aided much in educating the people and in bringing into notice many artists who might otherwise have found it difficult to win recognition but this gain was lost the influence of the lottery system must have transcended a hundredfold any possible advantage gained through it by art happily the day for such gambling is over but we meet with the evil still where one would least expect it there is a moral in the story of the poor parishioner who regretted to his minister that he could not pay his quarter's pew rent been gambling in stocks i suppose said the minister testily no sir not that well speculating in oil then no sir i went to your church fair sir and was roped into so many lotteries tableau several small public galleries like those of the athenaeum in boston and of the historical society in new york and a few private collections were found in different parts of the country which all exercised a considerable influence in raising the standard of popular taste people began to buy pictures and as was natural began by buying very poor pictures european dealers taking advantage of the comparative ignorance of the country in art matters flooded the principal cities with alleged examples of the old masters which found a ready sale thirty or forty years ago but which gradually disappeared as their worthlessness was understood and now it would be difficult to find one of those early art treasures of america in any respectable house unless it may have been preserved among the rubbish of the garret the experience thus gained was of the utmost value the american with his quick perception soon learned to distinguish between the good and the bad and though his taste may in some cases seem a little loud to the european connoisseur he seldom buys anything which is absolutely worthless he is recognized in the european markets as one of the shrewdest as well as one of the most liberal buyers throughout the world whenever art treasures come under the hammer the american will be found in competition with nobles and even with crowned heads and he is no mean competitor for he carries a pocket full of dollars and is not afraid to spend them where he is sure of getting his money's worth thus during the past twenty years there has been a constant flow of works of art to the united states there is no city of importance in the country which has not its public gallery of painting and of sculpture as well as many private collections in the houses of its citizens these latter are often put on exhibition as loan collections and exert a most beneficial influence in creating a taste for art of course the united states can scarcely hope to form art collections comparable with those of the old world lest some unforeseen revolution should break up the great museums of some of its capital cities when we might hope and indeed expect that many of their treasures would gravitate westward but while the old masters are thus denied to us we have some consolation in knowing that a large proportion of the best modern works are brought to this country 
i have excellent authority for the assertion that the united states now possesses more and finer examples of the modern french and german schools of painting than are to be found in europe the modern spanish and italian schools are also well represented the english school not so well american taste gravitating rather to the realism of the french than to the romantic idealism of the british school it is useless for the critics to attempt to explain the extraordinary disproportion between the influx of british and french art into america by the assertion that the fine art dealers in the united states are mostly of french and german origin even if this were true the dealers would not hesitate to import english pictures if there was a market for them they purchase largely of english engravings because there is a demand for them and they can be had at a price which leaves a good margin for profit they do not buy english paintings because they are held at prices much higher than in proportion to the talent displayed than are the works of french and german artists this is sufficient in itself to account for the numerical preponderance of these two schools of art in the united states and for the gravitation of american taste in their direction i would not draw any invidious comparison but i am not sure if i am called upon for a further explanation of this phenomenon that the prevailing fashion of buying french paintings may not have a still more serious justification for whatever the london critics may preach concerning the decadence of the french school the salon is still as it was under the empire the highest art tribunal in the world the foreign reader must not infer from what i have said of the american predilection for the french school of art that the americans have no painters of their own they have good painters in all departments of art while in several branches they are able to compete with any other country in the world their landscape school is unexcelled and in marine painting they are fast approaching the standard of the british school in portraiture they are equal to the english and french painters and in some respects they excel the latter being free from the academic tricks which detract from the dignity of gallic art in genre they are not far behind the french and german painters in history and allegory they are as yet weak though several of the younger painters now studying under french and german influences show signs of phenomenal ability which may soon bring america to the fore in these departments also it may be urged with some show of justice that these painters are americans in little more than birth and name and that they ought properly to be classed among the french and germans under whose guidance they have been educated and have won their laurels but if so strict a rule of classification were adopted we should have to give poussin and spagnoletto to the italians and to take a more modern case send alma tadema back to his home in the netherlands art is cosmopolitan and should have no country whatsoever land possesses the best schools and the best facilities for instruction through the possession of the masterpieces of the past that land will attract students from every other part of the world and so long as the great galleries of the old world exist so long will american students cross the ocean to study what can never under any present possibility be found at home end of chapter fourteen part one Chapter 14, Part 2 of Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. Chapter 14, Part 2 Art and Music. America has developed within the past half century a school of sculpture which has won recognition both at home and abroad, though a visit to the national capital and to the public squares of some of the larger cities would scarcely induce such an opinion. Many of her sculptors have been educated under Italian influences, but have drawn their inspiration rather from the antique than the modern Italian school. Some who stand foremost at home today have not enjoyed the benefit of foreign instruction, and their works consequently possess more of the flavor of the soil so to speak than do those which have been executed in strict accordance with the academic rules transmitted from antiquity it is possible that these may develop in time into a purely american school of sculpture 
which shall be recognized and take its place as such in the art history of the world. In the sister art, architecture, though America's brief century of existence has not brought to light any transcendent genius like him who created the Taj Mahal or elevated the Dome of St. Peter's, there has been sufficient advancement to meet the requirements of the country. American architecture in the past cannot be said to have had any individuality, but to have been rather the result of external influences. The reflection of the art developed in Europe through centuries of growth. Like all imitations, the imported style was generally exaggerated and often applied to uses for which it was never intended. Thus, a half-century ago, the Greek style was the prevailing fashion in not only public buildings like the custom houses of New York, Philadelphia, and Boston, but also churches, town halls, and even dwelling homes were constructed in the semblance of classic temples. In the suburbs of any of the eastern towns may still be seen white-painted wooden dwellings with pretentious porticos of Ionic or Corinthian columns combined with the absurdity of modern windows and green blinds. The Greek style in time gave way to the Gothic, and the classic temple was superseded by a nondescript building modeled or supposed to be modeled after the medieval cathedral. Some good churches were built in this style, the most successful one being Trinity Church in New York, erected in 1840 through 1845. But as the Greek style had been before, it was soon applied to uses utterly foreign to its purposes, and all kinds of buildings, including dwelling houses, were decorated with Gothic gables, pinnacles, and battlements. This fashion, in turn, had its day, and in time the Gothic was restricted mostly to ecclesiastical edifices, while domestic architecture went through a variety of transformations involving all the styles known to the ages. In some of the larger cities, New York especially, the exigencies of space gave rise to narrow dwellings built in uniform blocks, generally of brick, faced with brown sandstone, from which they were called brownstone fronts. Some of these long blocks of narrow dwellings, which caused the Grand Duke Alexis to remark that the Americans live in bins, are really very handsome, especially in Fifth Avenue, New York, a street of city residences unequaled elsewhere in the world. During the past two decades, a change has gradually been wrought in the style of city dwellings, and the uniform Italian brownstone fronts have been superseded by a variety of styles, each building having a marked individuality which distinguishes it from its neighbors. Many of these new residences will bear favorable comparison, considered architecturally, with any in Europe, and in internal conveniences and modern appliances have not their equal anywhere. This is as true of the dwellings built of the late years in other places as of those in New York, and the day is not far distant when every considerable town in the United States will have palatial residences rivaling those of the old world. The architecture of municipal and mercantile buildings in America is in a great degree like domestic architecture, the reflection of foreign examples, modified, of course, to some extent by new requirements. Some of the more pretentious structures, though perhaps amenable to criticism as works of art, are notable examples of their kind and will bear comparison with similar buildings in Europe. The capital at Washington, though displeasing to Mr. Ferguson's critical eye, is yet a noble building and notwithstanding its shortcomings, better adapted for legislative uses than the British Houses of Parliament, and the later public buildings at Washington, especially the French Renaissance structures, for the use of the War and State Departments, are unexcelled. Many of the state capitals, notably those of New York, Connecticut, Ohio, and other western states, are worthy of any country. In mercantile architecture, the Americans are abreast of, if not in advance of the rest of the world. The stores or shops of all of the larger cities are equal to any in European capitals, and the magnificent structures erected by insurance, banking, and other corporations are fit for the uses of even the merchant princes of democracy. There is nothing elsewhere in the world to compare with these structures. Buildings equally fine are to be found in that great western city, Chicago. One block there has 13 stories, the highest hardly less elaborate 
in decoration are less perfect in its appointments than the lowest indeed the rental of offices high up is greater than that of those nearer earth lifts shoot skyward with a swiftness that leads the unaccustomed aeronaut to think he has left part of his anatomy on the ground floor and they drop down again with equal rapidity the thirteenth story is thus made as accessible as the third while it possesses the advantages of purer air and less noise music heavenly made early visited america but finding no congenial abiding place among the sons of toil who were battling with the wilderness returned to quieter scenes to await the cessation of the struggle she has now taken up her permanent abode in the republic and finds herself at home even in the far west among the roughest scenes the continent can show the history of music in america is a record of spirited enterprises and discouraging failures alternating with almost rhythmic regularity artists of the first order like malibran made a temporary success even fifty years ago but it is only recently that a regular opera has been established in any american city some of the most successful performances took place in new york half a century ago yet at periods it was almost impossible to get together half a dozen fiddles a german who visited new york in eighteen twenty eight wrote the orchestras are very bad indeed as bad as it is possible to imagine and incomplete sometimes they have two clarinets which is a great deal sometimes there is only one first instrument of bassoons oboes trumpets and kettle drums one never sees a sight however once in a while a first bassoon is employed only one oboist exists in north america and he is said to live in baltimore in spite of all this incompleteness they play symphonies by haydn and grand overtures and if a gap occurs they think this is only of passing importance provided it rattles away again afterwards it is a self-understood custom that the leader with his violin takes part in every solo hence one never hears a solo played alone by one person this is probably done in order to get a fuller sound this was three years after garcia's italian opera appeared in new york and several amateur musical clubs had long been in existence the practical and unromantic character of the english people long delayed acceptance of the opera in britain as addison amusingly says there is nothing that has more startled our english audience than the italian recitative at its first entrance upon the stage people were wonderfully surprised to hear generals saying the word of command and ladies delivering messages and music our countrymen could not forbear laughing when they heard a lover chanting out a ballet d'eau and even the superscription of a letter set to a tune the famous blunder in an old play of enter a king and two fiddlers solas was no longer an absurdity when it was impossible for a hero in a desert or a princess in her closet to speak anything unaccompanied with musical instruments in america the same cause continued to operate at a much later date a native critic has written a passage about his countrymen similar to the above speaking of the opera-goers of fifty years ago he says if the inquisitive american looked in a critical way at the intellectual meaning of the italian opera he found little to satisfy his mind on the contrary he found it ridiculous he succeeded at getting at the plot of the fantastic libretto to see an actor making such a fuss about killing himself or anybody else on account of some unsuccessful love affair but who could not accomplish his bloody design on account of too much singing he wondered why two lovers having a secret to tell each other should go about shouting it out in endless repetitions and endless cadenzas he became impatient with a troop of soldiers thundering ferocious threatening war songs but who having so much to sing could not move a step from their posts all these things puzzled him were a mystery to him and annoyed and bewildered him they on the whole appeared to him much ado about nothing viewed in this matter-of-fact way the opera does seem absurd and we need not wonder that it long received scant recognition by our practical long-headed people who ask the why and wherefore of everything which claims their approval at the present day however opera is flourishing like an indigenous plant and new york supports two great opera houses besides numerous theatres for opera comique etc 
every important city has its opera house miss nielsen found in a young western town the best building for sound she had ever known jeffrey's american guide to opera houses and theatres contains particulars of nearly four thousand such buildings distributed all over the continent opening it at random i find amongst hundreds of others the following centralia on chicago kansas city and denver short line of the c n a and west st louis and pacific railroads population one thousand five hundred threlkeld's opera hall good stage and scenery terms reasonable people's theatre first class stage and scenery stage twenty five feet by forty eight feet piano rent twenty dollars etc take oshkosh away out in wisconsin two hundred miles from chicago with a population of twenty two thousand new opera house stage forty two by seventy feet seats one thousand one hundred turner house stage thirty by fifty seats eight hundred wacker hall thirty by fifty four seats one thousand one hundred here is paris texas babcock opera house seats one thousand paris opera house seats four hundred and fifty idaho was a wilderness a few years ago as was montana now i see eagle rock idaho with a total population of only seven hundred has chamberlain hall with organ seats six hundred glens hall seats three hundred butte city montana has new opera house seats eight hundred thomas amphitheatre seats one thousand five hundred grand opera house seats one thousand but its population is ten thousand so that it does not rival eagle rock with its seven hundred population and temples of the muses to seat nine hundred the theatres and opera houses of the principal cities in america are of course much superior to those in europe because they were built recently and have improvements unthought of years ago besides the greater wealth of the country justifies greater expenditure upon everything musical societies are found in every western town of importance milwaukee with a history of only half a century had its musique verin thirty-six years ago in eighteen fifty one this enterprising club performed the creation the seasons parts of the messiah and parts of rossetti's jesus in gethsemane every year since it has performed works of like character the city has been a centre from which musical culture has radiated throughout the northwest cincinnati is another such centre situated midway between the eastern cities and new orleans it has since early days been specially benefited as the calling place of itinerant operatic and dramatic companies st louis louisville chicago indianapolis detroit buffalo pittsburgh denver san francisco new orleans are all prominent examples of western cities in which music is generally cultivated my experience in the two lands leads me unhesitatingly to accord the palm to the old home for vocal music there is no society in the republic to compare with those which delight the masses with vocal music in the monarchy to hear one of the best choirs in britain sing an oratorio is one of the greatest delights their voices seem smoother and above all the enunciation is perfect the american voice is thin to begin with the effect of climate i fear and to this is added the abominable practice of slurring over or cutting off troublesome syllables the american woman is the most intelligent entertaining and most agreeable in the world if she had her english sister's voice in enunciation she would be perfect but these she has not there is a snippiness about her words which follows her even in oratorio the men of course being more deliberate of speech are not such great sinners in this respect america still has much to learn from the parent land in vocal music i wish she would begin to take lessons soon on the other hand america leads britain in instrumental music probably owing to the large infusion of the german element with which it is blessed i have heard several competent foreign musicians pronounce the thomas orchestra superior to that of richter in london or to any other orchestra in europe and i have sufficient faith in this opinion to challenge the best london orchestra to a contest let us have an international orchestral trial our performers going to london to play upon alternate nights with richter's fine band and theirs coming to new york next season for the return trial 
to excel in instrumental music would be another feather in the cap of democracy even to prove a worthy second to richter's orchestra would not discredit us the cause of music could not but be benefited by the friendly family match this year witnesses an ambitious attempt to found a national conservatory of music which may rival the academy founded last year in britain the enterprise is in excellent hands and promises to give the republic a new institution of which it may justly be proud a school has already been started and pupils are being received it is held that the time has passed when the gifted sons and daughters of the republic should find it necessary to go abroad for the highest musical instruction even more daring is the attempt to produce american opera which is now being made by these enthusiastics of the national school of music so far its success has surprised the public the operas are of course the work of foreigners but they are sung in english or must we not begin to call it the american language oh said a distinguished lady to another the other evening as she listened to the opera in her own language it's so queer to understand the language of opera isn't it i always did dear was the response sooner or later the new idea is bound to conquer the republic will produce not only a national school of music but in time develop a national music itself for it is impossible that so numerous and so rich a people and one so unusually fond of music should long remain without an institution of the highest character for musical culture we hail this present effort therefore with great pleasure and commend it to the support of the american people upon whom and not upon any governmental aid it must fortunately depend the material progress of the republic is not the only progress made during the triumphant march of the democracy in art and in music the nation is advancing with a rapidity which belies the assertion that the tendency of democracy is to materialize a people and give it over to sordid thoughts that the unrestrained exercise of personal liberty ends only in the accumulation of dollars republicanism does not withhold from life the sweetness and light which mainly makes it worth living hard unremitting toil quickly seeks appropriate relaxation the history of music and art in america is in miniature their history throughout the world first came struggles with nature hard-fought battles with corresponding adaptation of temperament then with victory came leisure and human nature was moulded into harmony with its milder conditions and then as dryden says at last divine cecilia came inventress of the vocal frame the sweet enthusiast from her sacred store enlarged the former narrow bounds and added length to solemn sounds with nature's mother wit and arts unknown before unless the greatest and best of the race are wholly at fault in their estimate of the influence exerted upon men by art and music we may accept the taste for these with which the democracy can safely be credited as an augury of promise life in the republic is being rapidly refined the race for wealth ceases to be so alluring ostentation in dress or living is bad form in due time fashion may decree that its devotees must be neither loud nor extravagant music and art create the taste for the most refined not for the coarse expression of our surroundings it is now certain that in love of art and music the democracy even today is not behind the monarchy and evidence is not wanting that it is entering more and more into and elevating year after year not only the few but the great masses which make up the national life of the republic end of chapter fourteen part two art and music Chapter 15 of Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in October 2020. Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie Chapter 15 Literature Quotation by Shakespeare He hath never fed of the dainties that are bred in a book. He hath not eat paper, as it were. He hath not drunk ink. His intellect is not replenished. 
he is only an animal only sensible in his duller parts this was not written of the omnivorous american for he has eaten paper as it were and drunk ink ever since he was born these are his daily food as far back as the year eighteen thirty six which brings us to the beginning of the fifty years under review a writer in the philadelphia public ledger from march twenty fifth describing the extent of newspaper reading in america says quote, in the cities of new york and brooklyn containing together a population of three hundred thousand the daily circulation of the penny papers is not less than seventy thousand these papers are to be found in every street lane and alley in every hotel tavern counting-house shop and store almost every porter and drayman while not engaged in his occupation may be seen with a penny paper in his hand End quote. this was the year when in england the newspaper tax was reduced from four pence equivalent to eight cents to a penny two cents per copy when the usual price of london papers was five pence or ten cents or six pence twelve cents the great mass of the people even if they could read could only obtain a news sheet by sharing among many the cost of the luxury the majority of the intelligent had to be content with hearing articles read from papers to the company in a hall or coffee-room several factors have conspired to make the american people great newspaper readers the puritan settlers were active political partisans everything which concerned government was of deepest interest to them and it was among such as they that the first manuscript newsletters had their largest circulation the descendants of these hardy pilgrims inherited that jealous regard for the rights of the citizen which in the sixteenth century manifested itself in political nonconformity and in the eighteenth century was the propelling force of the american revolution every man woman and child of new england at that trying time habitually discussed politics and sought news with an eagerness that we never feel except under the stimulus of a great political crisis in eighteen hundred the young republic had two hundred newspapers of which several were dailies in eighteen ten through eleven disputes with england revived men's interest in politics an interest which became doubly keen when the war was declared and every able-bodied man took from its nail his trusty flintlock in preparation for battle conceived in political tribulation born amid the throes of a severe political struggle and nursed in the midst of political excitements the young american nation developed an aptitude for government which republican institutions have ever since tended to strengthen where every man is a voter every man is a politician and a nation of politicians is the journalist's favorite field a further cause is the education which during the century has been so widely diffused teach a man how to read and you at once invest him with the appetite for reading and what can be of greater interest than the world's history read in contemporary lights again newspaper taxes have never existed in the united states as a consequence journalism attained maturity in america earlier than in europe these combined factors have made the american nation greater newspaper readers than any other people the republic has aptly been called the editor's paradise for certainly except in the wild west where revolvers are jocularly said to be as necessary to editors as inkstands journalists do have pretty much their own way in eighteen eighty the number of periodicals of all classes published in the united states was eleven thousand three hundred and fourteen of these more than four-fifths are devoted to news politics and family reading the remainder are technical publications relating to trade industry the professions science etc more than three-fourths of the whole are weekly publications ten per cent are monthlies daily papers form rather less than ten per cent ten thousand five hundred and fifteen periodicals are published in the english language and six hundred and one in german the remaining percentage is contributed in the following languages in this order french scandinavian spanish dutch italian welsh bohemian and polish 
there is moreover a portuguese paper in new york a chinese paper in san francisco and a cherokee one in tahlequah indian territory in none of these languages does the proportion of periodicals reach one per cent of the whole the combined issue of the periodical press exceeds thirty one millions the copies printed aggregate in a year one billion three hundred and forty four million giving an average of two copies a week to every family the growth of american newspaper literature is no less astonishing than the growth of so many other things american the first census of the press was taken in eighteen fifty though mulhall gives an estimate for eighteen forty the number of newspapers in eighteen fifty was about eight hundred and thirty ten years later it had increased to two thousand five hundred and twenty six in eighteen sixty it reached four thousand and fifty one in eighteen seventy five thousand eight hundred and seventy one while ten years later it had nearly doubled reaching the number of eleven thousand three hundred and fourteen or more than four times as many as in eighteen fifty in circulation the increase has been even greater in eighteen fifty the average circulation per issue was five million one hundred and forty two thousand one hundred and seventy seven it leaped to thirteen million six hundred and sixty three thousand four hundred and nine in eighteen sixty to twenty million eight hundred and twenty four thousand four hundred and seventy five in eighteen seventy and in eighteen eighty it reached the enormous number of thirty one million seven hundred and seventy nine thousand six hundred and eighty six the morning newspapers of the principal cities consist of eight pages like those of london and are sold at the same price two cents one penny the republican sheets are characterized by greater vivacity than the monarchical more spicy news and above all a much more attractive mode of displaying it a leading english editor once remarked to me quote, we have no editors who rank with the american but many writers who excel yours End quote. this was a just criticism we see however in nothing more strongly than the newspaper press of the two countries the operation of that law of assimilation which tends to make their products alike the american press is rapidly acquiring greater dignity and the british press more sparkle they will soon be as like as two peas and the change toward each other will improve both there are many things other than the press in which a mixture of the old and the new would be equally advantageous the falsest impressions of a country are created in the minds of foreigners by its newspaper press because people forget that the press deals in the uncommon the abnormal a column is given to some startling monstrosity a three-headed calf for instance but it doesn't follow that american calves as a rule possess more than the usual number of head-pieces seen in europe an unruly refugee with twenty aliases kills a texan rowdy in a bar-room farther away from new york than cairo is from london and the press on both sides of the water gives the fullest details it isn't a corollary at all that human life is not respected in the republic a defaulter absconds and the world is filled with the news not a word is said about the thousands of men in positions of trust who guard their charge to the last penny my experience with newspapers upon both sides of the atlantic has shown me how incorrect ideas are instilled of the one land in the other by the press a new york sheet referring to the meeting of a few hair-brained cranks in hyde park a motley crowd whose appearance made me feel as falstaff did about his soldiers quote, i'll not march with them through coventry that's flat end quote, lays this episode before its readers headed in large type a grand republican rally and many readers think the prince of wales has not the ghost of a chance i wish it were so indeed and i honor these cranks very much all real reformers are cranks in their day fim hampton cromwell were and john bright himself was a very pronounced one till he brought the nation up to his level now he is a regulation statesman in good form 
but truth compels me to say that the republican rally in hyde park was not much of a rally it was like a great ball which the princess wished to give in ottawa upon court lines of etiquette and could not in canada society was all in vulgar trade there was not enough left to make a ball at all in like manner a socialist's procession marches through the streets of chicago probably not an american in the array a parcel of foreign cranks whose communistic ideas are a natural growth of the unjust laws of their native land which deny these men the privilege of equal citizenship and hold them down as inferiors from their birth and forthwith european papers alarm the timid and well-to-do masses of europe by picturing this threatened assault upon property as the result of republicanism the truth being that in no other country are the rights of property held so sacredly as in america legislation to fix values of anything here as values of land are fixed in ireland for instance would be decried from one end of the land to the other the only true and abiding conservatism is that engendered by republican institutions conservatism of what is just what is good for these no party seeks to destroy in like manner the books of travel written by visitors to any land must in their very nature be misleading what strikes the stranger is not the thousand and one matters which are alike to those at home nor the thousand occurrences which are common to him at home or abroad it is the one exceptional matter thing or event which he notes down at once and says i can work that up it is so strange very true only it may be just as exceptional just as strange to the native the false impression is conveyed to the public for whom he writes by implying that it is the common and usual custom or occurrence few travellers know how to arrive at the real everyday life of people and yet from this alone is a just estimate of that people to be obtained as the two divisions get to know each other better they will understand that in the main human life is very much the same on both sides of the atlantic it is after we cross the mississippi and come to the great west that new region which the hardy pioneer is rapidly bringing into civilization that life takes on different features as might be expected the difference in the press there gives us the best idea of the chasm which still divides the settled state from the unsettled territory when a party of prospectors have found a mineral vein in the west about the first thing they do after deciding to build a city is to start a newspaper with characteristic western eccentricity this is named the lead gulch screamer or the peekaboo avalanche then a press and type are brought in the most literate of the gang invests in a table an armchair and an inkstand and being already furnished with a revolver he begins to run the paper as the town grows competing editors come in and soon the struggle for existence sets in with an acerbity of feeling not excelled in those poetic dragons of the prime who tore each other in their slime specimens of slime are carefully collected by european bookmakers and quoted as representative of american journalism after the rough pioneering has been done the gentler evidences of white civilization soon manifest themselves fine streets lined with handsome buildings and towering churches spring up on the site of the wilderness and literature takes upon itself a milder form present editors in western towns which have originated and grown in this way are men of culture often graduates from eastern universities and these are not the men who pen the articles so largely quoted from by bookmakers dickens's amusing representation of the editorial combat in pickwick will keep in memory the fact that a few years ago british editors used inks of concentrated gall and venom in periodical literature the child land has for a few years excelled its mother in harper's magazine and the century the art of editing has joined the arts of printing and engraving and has surpassed anything before known in the history of periodical literature 
these magazines which for years have been educating the american people in principles of true art and instilling a love of pure literature have done more than all the rest of the world's periodical publications to raise the artistic standard of printing not in america alone but in england has their influence been potent for good and undisguised imitations of these magazines now appear even in germany which not many years ago seemed to have a monopoly of good engravers it is in vain that any english or german magazine can hope to rival its republican compeer not because the necessary talent and skill do not exist or at least that it could not be created but simply because it will not pay to employ it the american publisher prints a quarter of a million of copies this number has even been exceeded the expense for art and matter distributed among this huge edition is a trifle per copy what is the poor publisher to do who has not forty thousand subscribers and this not one shilling magazine has in britain or germany he yields the race perforce to the republican harpers and the century actually sell more copies in britain than any british monthly publication of equal price truly their venture in england is a strange and startling success let us note here that as population grows faster in the new than in the old land more and more sure is it that the american publisher can afford to expend greater sums upon his magazine which means that the native publications must encounter fiercer warfare than ever periodicals of high order for the girls and boys of a nation are of vital consequence the world has not anything comparable to the st nicholas or harper's young people every friend to whom i have sent them in britain has substantially said we have nothing like these our children watch for their arrival as for a great treat they are devoured it was all very well for the democracy to supply the monarchies with pork and flour cheese and provisions the necessaries of life a coarse material triumph this but what are we to say to this exportation of food for the mind if democracy is successfully to invade the higher province and minister to the things of the spirit as well as to those of the body before it is more than a century old what is the monarchy to set forth as that in which it excels it is at all events to take the crumbs which fall from the republican magazine table that much is settled and it is with special pride we note the triumph of democracy in these branches of art the thanks of the republic are due to harpers and the century for a successful and i hope a permanent and profitable invasion of great britain may their circulation never be less on either side of the atlantic american journalists have become noted all over the world as indeed have americans generally for enterprise and energy american foreign correspondents have revolutionized their profession until stanley was sent into equatorial africa by the new york herald to find livingston such extraordinary missions were unknown but english journals quickly followed and o'donovan brave bright and young when he fell in the soudan was sent by the daily news to merv the jeannette expedition was a newspaper enterprise the bengal famine the condition of ireland the tunisian difficulty the burma dispute the exploration of korea all these and many other matters have come within the scope of the modern foreign correspondent it is interesting in this connection to see how the anglo-saxon race leads the world in journalism of twenty-three thousand newspapers in the world about half are american other papers published in english raise the total to more than thirteen thousand leaving to the rest of the world germany france italy spain india etc only ten thousand to divide amongst themselves the english language gauged by those who speak it is leaving the rest of the world even more hopelessly in the rear at the beginning of the century our tongue was spoken by twenty million people and occupied only fifth place coming behind even spain and russia it now occupies first place being spoken by more than a hundred million whilst french and spanish have not yet reached the fifties 
since eighteen o one the english language has advanced from twelve and nine tenths to twenty seven and one tenth aliqua parts of all european languages of three hundred and sixty eight million people now speaking the european languages one hundred million speak english of course there is little question here as to the coming universal language the world is to speak english think english and read english the only question is whether it will be aristocratic or democratic english queen's english or people's english and there is not much question about that when we recollect the great amount of hard manual work which has been spent by the american people on the subjugation of their vast continent it is a matter of surprise that literature and the gentle arts generally should also have attained such development the hewing of wood the clearing of forests the breaking of prairie lands railroad building and canal digging are not conducive to development of the sort of brain which runs into books and during the early years of the country when brawn rather than brain was in demand bookmaking received scant attention the change consequent upon the cessation of the struggle with nature in new england was well described by cullen bryant at a publisher's celebration in eighteen fifty five he said quote, after his cotton mather's time in the hundred and fifty years which followed the procession of american authors was a straggling one at present they are a crowd which fairly choke the way illustrious historians able and acute theologians authors of books of travels instructive or amusing clever novelists brilliant essayists learned and patient lexographers every bush i had almost said every buttercup of the field has its poet poets start up like the soldiers of roderick dhu from behind every rock and out of every bank of fern an idea of this increasing literary activity may be obtained from the fact that in the publication of original american books the year eighteen fifty three shows an advance of eight hundred per cent in less than twenty years in the twelve years ending 1842, there were published 1,115 works, 623 of them being original. In the single year of 1853, 733 new books were published, 420 of which were original American works. From these facts, a well-known publisher of that period concluded that literature and the book trade had increased ten times as fast as the population. In 1884, more than 4,000 books were published in the Republic. To enumerate the tons of paper used for printing may be considered a curious way of estimating the literature of a nation. Still, it has been done, and the result is interesting about one hundred and seven thousand tons of paper are annually used in the united states against ninety five thousand tons in the united kingdom and seventy thousand tons in france canada subject and dependent contrasts unfavorably with the republic in every way but in none more than this she uses but four thousand tons of paper a year only about two-fifths of the republic's ratio to population the amount annually spent on books and newspapers by the republic is ninety million dollars eighteen million pounds against the eighty million dollars sixteen million pounds spent by britain it is not fifty years since a british critic asked sneeringly who reads an american book Today, the same critic, if he be living and up with the times, will have to reverse his question and ask, who does not read an American book? A glance at the British trade catalogues will show how many American publications are reprinted in Great Britain, for the British publisher does not hesitate, in the absence of an international copyright law, to appropriate any successful American work although he is apt to call his yankee brother hard names for pursuing a similar policy in relation to british publications the works of popular american historians american poets and american novelists are all reprinted in england and are as well known there as at home indeed it has been said that longfellow is more widely read in britain than the lordly poet laureate himself 
the very successful enterprise of mr douglas the edinburgh publisher is a case in point the series of american stories which he republishes having had a wonderfully large sale two american lexographers have contributed to the world two of the best english dictionaries and the standard greek lexicon published by the university of oxford is printed from american plates edited and made in new york some idea of the american demand for books may be formed from a few illustrations the ninth edition of the encyclopedia britannica now in course of publication has more than fifty thousand subscribers in the united states probably more than five times as many as it has in its own home besides this an unauthorized edition a reprint has had also a large circulation let us pause here a moment to try to take in the full significance of such a fact as this the britannica is the one distinctively national work one would think it was published surely for britain but no it is not for the parent land but for the republic that this treasury of all knowledge is prepared its purchasers are not in old but in new england five to one thus at every point we stumble as it were upon startling proofs that the dear old home is becoming the satellite of the republican giant whose mass is too great to be resisted its power of attraction begins to draw the smaller body out of its monarchical orbit into the great sweep of the republican idea the equality of the citizen the same firm which imports the encyclopedia britannica in the united states charles schneiber's sons of new york are the publishers of the great statistical atlas of the united states nearly eighty tons one hundred and fifty seven thousand five hundred pounds of paper were used in the printing of the first edition of this work which is one of the wonderful books of the century wonderful even in america the american cyclopedia published by d appleton and company new york has also had an enormous circulation more than a hundred and twenty thousand sets of sixteen volumes each having been sold by subscription at an average price of a hundred dollars the set making in the aggregate more than twelve million dollars two million four hundred thousand pounds the same firm have printed more than fifty million of webster's spelling book and still print and sell a million copies every year picturesque america a costly work in two large volumes has also had a phenomenal sale more than a hundred thousand copies have been disposed of mr blaine's book twenty years in congress has more than two hundred thousand subscribers and general grant's personal memoirs more than three hundred thousand the sums realized by both these writers will exceed two hundred and fifty thousand dollars fifty thousand pounds the latter will probably double that amount and i have seen an estimate which placed mrs grant's prospective profits at seven hundred thousand dollars one hundred and forty thousand pounds milton was glad to get five pounds for paradise lost even macaulay's celebrated cheque for ten thousand pounds received for his history dwindles into insignificance compared with the princely compensation awarded to its favourites by the triumphant democracy it is much the same with all standard british publications all have a larger circulation in the republic than in the monarchy spencer tennyson smiles morley the arnolds matthew and edwin all have larger constituencies in new than in old england indeed the first named herbert spencer was discovered and appreciated by american readers before he was recognized at home and here let me in passing drop a tear over the one sad blot which disgraces the republic her laws do not give protection to the foreign author for this i have neither palliation nor excuse it is since slavery is gone the one disgraceful thing of which as a nation she is guilty it brings the blush of shame to my cheek as i think of it there are now signs that the public conscience is awakening to the duty of removing the stain a fair copyright act would probably have been passed by congress at its last session but for the jealousies of publishers and the somewhat impracticable attitude if they will permit one of their humble members to say so 
of our copyright league authors are not as a class distinguished i think for practical good sense in legislative matters something must be conceded to publishers on this side and something must be conceded by publishers on the other it is asking too much or at least more than is likely to be granted for publishers abroad who own a copyright on a popular author's work which they have enjoyed for many years and paid for only on the basis of the home market to insist upon reaping a new harvest on such works in america if the money would go to the author or his representatives the idea would not be so unpalatable in like manner publishers here insist that an author taking out an american copyright should publish his work in america as well as in his own land it is a publisher's quarrel had the authors on both sides the power to adjust it the republic would soon be relieved from the just reproach of stealing the work of men's brains the most valuable work of all ere a new edition of triumphant democracy be called for i hope to be able to record that a fair copyright act has been passed libraries have multiplied very rapidly fifty years ago there were few large collections of books in america except in the universities and collegiate institutions of other libraries prior to eighteen twenty only ten are enumerated and these were mostly of inferior grade since that period libraries have sprung into being in nearly every township or village they dot the country almost as thickly as the public schools while state libraries have been formed in every territorial division of the union the spirit of local patriotism which characterizes equally the native american and the new settler and which leads each to think that the particular spot of god's earth on which he lives is the best is a spirit which prompts numerous great public works the dwellers in the new settlement are animated by an amazing energy and spirit of self-sacrifice in matters concerning their city public works of all kinds are undertaken with feverish eagerness men subscribe money for the adornment and improvement of their town as readily as they would for their particular home one is constantly surprised to find all the evidences of advanced civilization in cities of which the foundation was laid but as yesterday libraries schools clubhouses churches theatres courthouses bridges of the most elegant designs are found in towns which had no existence a few years ago take st paul as an example this young and enterprising city owns no less than three public libraries the state library with ten thousand volumes the historical society's library and museum with twenty two thousand volumes and the free circulating library with twelve thousand volumes to which additions are being constantly made it is estimated that there are twenty three thousand school libraries in america containing forty five million books twelve million more than all the public libraries of europe combined other educational establishments increase this number by two and a half million volumes and thirty eight state libraries contribute over a million more the congressional library the astor the boston city the philadelphia the various mercantile libraries the watkinson reference at hartford and many others will raise the grand total to much more than fifty million volumes a book almost for every man woman and child in the united states more than three hundred libraries contain ten thousand volumes each twelve contain more than a hundred thousand volumes each and two contain four hundred thousand volumes each even this statement but feebly shadows forth the truth as to the books and periodicals of the country as compared with those of other lands for the american is not only a reader but he is above all other men a buyer of books circulating libraries are not so generally used as in europe it is when you enter the home of the american farmer or artisan that you are struck with the number of books and magazines you see the two or three shelves and often far greater number filled with them all of which are his own except perhaps the few stray borrowed volumes which most collections contain and which are conscientiously counted as belonging to another to be returned some day 
but somehow that some day never arrives there must be a special punishment in store surely for such as do not return these treasures to their rightful owners this hint is not without a purpose the universal propensity of the american young and old for reading and writing has sometimes seemed to me to lend countenance to dogberry's dictum that while a good name was the gift of god reading and writing came by nature these do seem to be part of the nature of the american triumphant democracy is triumphant in nothing more than in this that her members are readers and buyers of books and reading matter beyond the members of any government of a class but in this particular each system is only seen to be true to its nature the monarchist boasts more bayonets the republican more books we know which weapon is more effective in these days the paper bullet of the brain is the moral dynamite of triumphant democracy the only dynamite which the peaceful and law-abiding republican ever has occasion or can be induced to use End of chapter 15 Literature Read for you by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana Chapter 16, Part 1 of Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Aaron Bennett Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie Chapter 16, Part 1 The Federal Constellation As far as I can see, the American Constitution is the most wonderful work ever struck off at one time by the brain and purpose of man, Gladstone. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created free and equal, and are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Round this doctrine of the Declaration of Independence as its central sun, the constellation of states revolves. The equality of the citizen is decreed by the fundamental law. All acts, all institutions are based upon this idea. There is not one shred of privilege, hence no classes. The American people are a unit. Difference of position in the state, resulting from birth, would be held to insult the citizen. One and all they stand Brutus-like, and would brook the eternal devil to keep his state as easily as a king. Government of the people, for the people, and by the people is their political creed. The vote of an Emerson or a Lincoln weighs no more than that of the poorest Negro. The president has not a privilege which is not the birthright of every other citizen. The people are not leveled down, but leveled up to the full dignity of equal citizenship beyond which no man can go. The first voice of the people may not be always the voice of God. Indeed, sometimes it does seem to be very far from it. But the second voice of the people, their sober second thought, comes nearest to it of any tribunal, much nearer than the voice of any class, even that of the most highly educated, has ever come in any government under the sun. Hence there is no voice in all America which has the faintest authority when the ballot speaks. It has often been objected to this Republican theory of the state that under it a dead level of uniformity must exist. The informed traveler, who knows life in America, can be relied upon to dispel this delusion and to certify that nowhere in all the world is society more exclusive or more varied than in Republican America. Certainly, it is far less so in Britain. The difference is that while in monarchical countries birth and rank tend to override personal characteristics, Republican society is necessarily founded upon real character and attainment. Natural selection has freer play. Congenial persons associate with each other, uninfluenced by birth or rank, since neither exist. Nor has wealth of itself nearly so great an influence in society in America as in Britain. It is impossible, in the nature of things, that it should have, because it is much more easily acquired and, what is much more telling, much more easily lost. 
The law of acquisition is indeed as free to act in the republic as in the monarchy, but then the law of dispersion is also allowed full force in the former, where primogeniture and entail are unknown and the transfer of land is easy. There are but three generations in America from shirt sleeve to shirt sleeves. Under such conditions, an aristocracy of wealth is impossible. The almighty dollar is just like the restless pig which Paddy could not count because it would not stand still long enough in one place to be counted. Wealth cannot remain permanently in any class if economic laws are allowed free play. The federal constellation is composed of 38 stars, the states, and 11 nebulae, the territories which are rapidly crystallizing into form. The galaxy upon the national flag has grown during the century from 13 to 38 stars, and the cry is still they come. Every decade, new stars are coming into view, and ere long the entire cluster of nebulae will be added to the federal constellation. They are to come forth as the new star in Andromeda came in the fullness of time. A new state, sweeps into the federal constellation every now and then like a star newborn that drops into its place and which, once circling in its placid round, not all the tumult of the earth can shake. The question arises, how is it possible to govern successfully under one head, not this nation, but this great continent of nations? The answer is, through the federal or home rule system alone, is it possible? Each of these 38 states is sovereign within its own borders. Each has its own constitution, its own parliament consisting of House and Senate, its own president, courts and judges, militia, etc., etc. All the rights of a sovereign state belong to it, except such as it has expressly delegated in common with sister states to the central authority, the national government at Washington. One provision ensures solidity. Should a dispute arise between a state and the central government as to what powers are or are not delegated, the decision of the Supreme Court of the nation is final and binding upon all. The theory is that all their internal affairs are matters for the state to deal with and determine. All external affairs are for the nation. All local matters are for the states. All general matters for the nation. The division is easily made and maintained. The Constitution defines it in a few clauses by stating what the national government has charge of, as seen in Section 8. Any powers not here expressly delegated to the nation remain in the states to be exercised in any manner they choose. The Supreme Court of the nation stands ready to inform states or nation of their respective powers. With the exception of the claim made in the interest of the slave power, that a state had the right to secede from the Union, no serious question between state and nation has ever arisen. It is difficult to see how any can arise, since that has been definitely decided in the negative. The integrity of the nation having been assured, all other questions must be of trifling import and readily adjustable by the Supreme Court, which has proclaimed the nation to be an indestructible union of indestructible states. The differentiations shown in the laws of the various states, which have resulted from the perfect freedom or home rule accorded them in their internal affairs, prove that the political institutions best suited to each community are thereby ensured, since they must necessarily be healthful growths of the body politic. Genuine outbursts of the people themselves, and therefore certain to receive their cordial and unwavering support. The number and extent of these differences in laws are surprising. The customs and habits of cold, cultured, old Massachusetts find expression in laws not best adapted for tropical agricultural New Texas, just as the laws of England would be found less desirable for Scotland or Ireland than those which have been evolved by these communities, and which would be still more freely evolved by home rule under their slightly different environments. These stars, the American states, revolve each upon its own axis, within its own orbit, each according to its own laws, some faster, some slower, one at one angle and one at another, but around the central sun at Washington they tread the great national orbit under equal conditions and constitute parts of one great whole. Here, then, we have the perfection of federal or home rule in its fullest and greatest development. 
The success of the American Union proves that the freest self-government of the parts produces the strongest government of the whole. Let us proceed to note, in the order of their importance, the various branches of the national government. We begin, of course, with the Supreme Court of the nation. Beyond and before, and higher than House or Senate or President, stands this final arbiter, sole umpire, judge of itself. More than once, Lord Salisbury has said that he envied his transatlantic brethren their Supreme Court. Speaking at Edinburgh on November 23, 1882, he said, I confess I do not often envy the United States, but there is one feature in their institutions which appears to be the subject of the greatest envy, their magnificent institution of a Supreme Court. In the United States, if Parliament passes any measure inconsistent with the Constitution of the country, there exists a court which will negative it at once, and that gives a stability to the institutions of the country which, under the system of vague and mysterious promises here, we look for in vain. He is right, and as he becomes more conversant with the results of political institutions founded upon the equality of the citizen, as I trust he may do, he will, in my opinion, find reason to envy many other of these more highly developed and in reality deeply conservative institutions as much as that which now excites his admiration. The powers of the Supreme Court seem at first sight almost too vast to entrust to any small body of men, but it is to be noted that these powers are limited by the fact that it can neither make nor execute laws nor originate anything. It only decides disputes as to existing laws, should such be properly brought before it, and its judgments are in all cases confined rigorously to the points submitted. It cannot interfere beforehand with any act of the government, nor with any act of the president, but can decide only whether such acts or orders are or are not constitutional, and the reasons for such decision must be publicly stated. Thus limited, its decision is final, unless and until decided to be unconstitutional, all acts of Congress or of the President are valid. As may be inferred, the mere knowledge on the part of legislative bodies that their acts are subject to the decision of the Supreme Court keeps them strictly within constitutional bounds. There is no use, even were there the disposition, to enact any law which is not reasonably certain to be sustained. Therefore, the regulative power of the court upon great questions remains practically in abeyance. The power is there, which is all that is required. The questions bearing upon state relations, which it is called upon to decide, are few and generally of minor importance. As, however, all causes which involve considerable sums between citizens of different states can be appealed to this court, it is kept busily engaged upon matters of large pecuniary interest, but of no political consequence. The court consists of nine judges, who hold office during life, subject, however, to impeachment by Congress for misbehavior or removal for inability to serve. Vacancies are filled by nominations made by the President to the Senate for confirmation, no appointment being complete until confirmed by the Senate. The salary of the judges is $10,000 per annum, and the Chief Justice receives $500 more. They can retire at 70 years of age upon full pay during life. What pittances, I hear my monarchical friends exclaim. Perhaps so, but does any court in the world command greater respect than this Supreme Court? Our abler, purer lawyers, men clearer in their great office, to be found elsewhere? Certainly not. Even my Lord Salisbury regrets that there is not such a tribunal in Britain. When I see the quiet dignity of the Supreme Court judges in Washington, their plain living, free from vulgar ostentation, their modest but refined homes, and think how far beyond pecuniary considerations their aspirations are, how foreign to their elevated natures are the coarser phases of position in modern society, I cannot but conclude that it would be most unfortunate if the emoluments of their positions should ever be made so great as in themselves to constitute a temptation, as they are in Britain. The American judge in the Supreme Court has no compeer. The pomp and parade which surround the entrance of a judge in Britain, the sordid pecuniary prize which he has secured by the appointment, 
his guilt coach, and all the tinsel of feudalistic times which is allowed still to survive under the idea that it adds to his dignity, but which borders upon the ridiculous in these days of general refinement, all this tinsel would seem most unfitting to the Republican judge, detracting, not adding to, the inherent dignity of this great position. The Supreme Court sits in Washington, but each of the nine judges visits for a part of the year one of the nine circuits into which the country is divided and assists the circuit judges. The circuits are again divided into districts, each of which has its own court and judge. These are all national courts, the judges of which are approved by the Senate upon the nomination of the president and hold office during life or good behavior. The whole forms the national judiciary, to which every citizen has the right to appeal in any cause involving the citizens or corporations of another state. We come next to the legislative department. This consists of two houses, a House of Representatives and a Senate, which meet at Washington twice a year upon fixed dates, March and December. The House is composed of 325 representatives. Every state sends members in exact proportion to its population as shown by each decadal census. The number of members is not regularly increased. The number of population to each representative is raised. Thus, in 1870, every 138,000 inhabitants returned a member. In 1880, it required 154,000. After a census is taken, the population is divided by number of members, the quota required to return a member being thus ascertained. Each state is then informed of the number due to it and arranges its electoral districts accordingly. Thus, every ten years, electoral power is fairly because equally adjusted to the satisfaction of all. By so simple an automatic device, the question of representation is removed from politics and settled forever upon the rock of fair and equal representation. It never can be settled in a free state until equal electoral districts are reached. Educated man demands equality, nor can he rest until he has obtained it. This secured, he becomes quiet and contented. Representatives hold office for two years, their term expiring with each Congress on the 4th of March of every second year. As members are always eligible for re-election, and as the practice is to return men of ability from term to term, the new House is always under the guidance of experienced legislators. Members are paid $5,000 per year in traveling expenses. The power of the purse is as tenaciously held by the House in Washington as in London. All money bills originate in it by express provision of the Constitution. Alike in this, the two houses present an entirely different appearance. On entering the house at Washington, the visitor is struck by the contrast. Instead of the uncomfortable benches at Westminster and the lack of all facilities for reading or writing, the newer house represents its members all sitting in good, easy chairs at separate desks like so many good boys at school. They are busily at work with their correspondence or consulting books of reference. Pages answer their call. They attend to their legislative duties when fresh during the day. When a division is called, instead of wasting 20 minutes and requiring every member to get up and walk past tellers, the business is done in a few minutes without disturbance. The clerk calls the roll of names alphabetically and each member nods or shakes his head or calls out I or no. A record is kept and result announced, and business proceeds. How simple. Business is not often obstructed in the house. When an orator exhausts its patience, he is made to sit down by a call for the question, and unless he gets a majority in favor of hearing him further, he is ruled out. Yet neither party complains that this rule has worked serious injury. No party seeks to change it. It has not prevented full discussion, and it has enabled the House to transact business properly. Next in order follows that one American institution which has received the unqualified approval of every man who has given an opinion upon the subject. I never heard even a British Tory utter a word in its disparagement. I cannot imagine what a man could say except in praise of the United States Senate. Proud indeed may the man be who can style himself Senator. To this August body, each of the states sends two members, six years being the term of office. These are elected by the legislatures of the states and hence reflect the popular desire. 
Senators are, of course, the adherents of one or other political party as it obtains sway in the various states. As the terms of service are so arranged that only one-third of the senators retire unless re-elected every two years, the tendency is for the Senate to respond somewhat less promptly than the lower house to the changes of public opinion. The Senate has large powers. All laws must be passed by it as well as by the House. No treaty with a foreign power is valid without its approval by a two-third vote. All ambassadors and agents of foreign powers must be approved by it. Much has been said about the patronage of the President, but he cannot appoint a postmaster unless this nominee is passed upon and confirmed by this August tribunal. It has been said by more than one political writer that the American Senate is the ideal second chamber of the world. Some assert that it is the only second chamber which possesses real power and is permanently fixed in the hearts of the masses. It is certainly regarded in America as a great promotion to be elevated from the House to the Senate, and it is none the less certain that the entire nation regards the Senate with pride and affection. All officials in America being paid, the salary of a senator is the same as that of a representative, $5,000 per year and traveling expenses. Lord Salisbury will be envying this American institution as well as the Supreme Court ere long, mark you, for his own second chamber gives unmistakable evidence of decay, and in good time he may even come to see that an elected president is preferable to the hereditary ruler. We cannot despair of his reaching finally to the full measure of the political equality of the citizen, since he begins so well with the chief American institution, the Supreme Court. Here is indeed a lucky hit. Since these words were written, a member of Parliament sends me confirmation of this prophecy. The hopeful student of Republican institutions, my Lord Salisbury, has said in a recent speech, The Americans, as you know, have a Senate. I wish we could institute it in this country. Marvelous in efficiency and strength. So another American institution envied. Truly, this former Saturday reviewer is a more promising pupil than Mr. Gladstone himself, and almost equal to Lord Rosebery. Nothing easier, my lord, than to get a copy of the American Senate. The secret of its marvelous strength and efficiency is an open one. You know it well. The Senate springs from and rests upon the suffrages of the people. There is not a trace of hereditary poison in its veins to steal away its power. In an elective assembly such as this, a man of real power like Lord Salisbury would be twice the man he is when leading a set of hereditary accidents. Having already obtained Lord Salisbury's endorsement of the Supreme Court and the Senate, I am encouraged to go a step further and commend for his approval the institution he should next endorse, a parliament of duly paid members elected by equal electoral districts for a fixed term of two years. Until this is secured, the government of Britain must remain exposed to every passing gust of popular emotion and hence exercise no steadying effect in periods of excitement. A British ministry does not govern, but bows to the clamor it should withstand. And upon my British readers, let me once more impress the truth that in all the elements of true conservatism, in all that goes to make up a strong government, a power competent to maintain justice and to defeat attacks upon the rights of property of others, and when necessary, to keep the ship of state with its head against the wildest hurricane, the American system, as I must compliment Lord Salisbury upon being one of the first European statesmen to discover, is infinitely beyond the monarchical. The man who knows both well and has property in both lands may be trusted to tell his inquirers that his Republican title gives him much the less uneasiness. This is further demonstrated by the highest place being accorded by the world to the American national debt. End of chapter 16, part 1, The Federal Constellation. Recording by Aaron Bennett. Chapter 16, part 2 of Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Bennett. Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. Chapter 16. The Federal Constellation. War and Treaty-Making Power. In two vital respects, the powers of the executives of the old and new English lands differ. 
First, no treaty with a foreign power is binding until ratified by the Senate. Indeed, as we have seen, no minister can be appointed to a foreign power until approved by this chamber. This vote of the Senate has several times kept the administration from entering into injudicious arrangements. Even General Grant and his cabinet committed themselves to the acquisition of San Domingo. Recently, the late administration was led into a very questionable treaty with Spain. The temptation for a few men, and especially for one man, to characterize his administration by some brilliant stroke calculated to dazzle the populace at the moment or to appeal to the national vanity is a source of real danger in all popular governments. Not what is permanently valuable, but what is presently telling is apt to be considered. Against this danger, for which the monarchical system has no provision whatever, the Republican opposes the cool, deliberate decision of an impersonal judge, the Senate. No man's glory is brightened or dimmed by the decision. What is for the lasting good of the nation is thought of, not what will bring temporary popularity to a cabinet or save a ministry. It must surely be a prejudiced mind which does not feel that the advantage is here upon the side of the younger land. The second vital difference is even of deeper import than that just recited. In the Republic, war can be declared only by the two houses of Congress, approved by the President. Before the sword can be drawn, both branches of the legislature must be wrought up to the pitch of this extreme and momentous act. The House, the Senate, and the Executive, in the person of the President, must consider, discuss, and decide the question under surroundings of the deepest solemnity, and with the nation, the world, anxiously looking on. Every representative of the people and every senator may speak in his place and record his vote for or against. Public attention is thus fixed and concentrated upon the crisis, and the public discussion enlightens the people. Time, precious time, whichever cools the passions of men and works for peace, is thus gained, and every official, every member of the legislature, publicly assumes the fearful responsibility of engaging in the slaughter of his fellow men. If ever war be proclaimed by the republic which God forbid, since all her paths are peace, it will not be the act of one branch or another of the government, but the solemn public act of all, legislative and executive. Contrast this with monarchical countries, in which a few excited partisans, sometimes only one or two real actors, who sit in a closed cabinet chamber, commit the people to criminal war, sometimes to prolong their own tenure of office, or to promote some party end. My American readers may not be aware of the fact that, while in Britain an act of Parliament is necessary before works for a supply of water or a mile of railway can be constructed, six or seven men can plunge the nation into war or, what is perhaps equally disastrous, commit it to entangling alliances without consulting Parliament at all. This is the most pernicious, palpable effect flowing from the monarchical theory, for these men do this in the King's name who is in theory still a real monarch, although in reality only a convenient puppet to be used by the cabinet at pleasure to suit their own ends. Next to the sapping of the roots of true manhood in the masses, by decreeing their inferiority to other men at birth, this is the most potent evil which exists today in the British Constitution, and it is chargeable solely to the monarchical system. It does not rank with the first evil, however, being mainly material, while the other is of the spirit, injury to which is the gravest misfortune which can befall a nation. But this vital truth not one of the so-called practical statesmen of Britain sees or will consider, or perhaps what is nearer the truth will venture to tell. Not one of them, apparently, has a soul above cheap corn, which is worshipped as the highest good. Indignities to the spirit of the masses, by which manhood is impaired, they seem to argue, may safely pass unnoted, so long as their bodies are fed. And yet better, far better, for a nation that its food for the body should be dear, and equal citizenship be the birthright of the soul. We have many evils to remedy in our political system a million times greater than the monarchy, once said to me a prominent statesman and possible prime minister, I looked pitifully upon him, his eyes blinded with the dust of conflict and his mind so absorbed with trifling party results that he could neither think 
nor see an inch before his face, much less study cause and effect. Could he do so, surely he would realize the truth that in the royal family, as in a nest, lie the origin of all the political evils which afflict his native land and which he deplores. All that this able, earnest, patriotic man is laboring to remove is only the legitimate spawn of this one royal family institution and is never to be met with except where a royal family exists to breed them. Resolve that the head of the state shall be elected at intervals and thus found government upon the true idea, the political equality of the citizen, and all the political wrongs of the few against the many fall as if by magic. Were I in public life in Britain, I should be ashamed to waste my energies against the House of Lords, Church and State, Primogeniture and Entail, and all the other branches of the monstrous system. I should strike boldly at the royal family, the root of the upas tree from which spring all these wrongs. Surely the democracies of Europe have no question to consider more vitally important than the war power. How many useless wars in the past would have been avoided had the Republican method prevailed? How many in the future would be prevented by its prompt adoption? The masses are ever more pacific than their rulers, ever more kindly disposed to those of their clay and other nations than the rulers are to theirs. The people do not share the jealousies of their rulers. If the war of power lay in the hands of the representatives of the people in Europe as it does in America, there would be fewer wars. The position of the Republic upon this question of war is still further advanced by the fact that both political parties, by special clauses in their Declaration of Principles, have pronounced in favor of peaceful arbitration of international differences. Thus, before America can have recourse to arms, no matter what party be in power, her adversary must first be offered arbitration and decline it. We envy not the nation which shocks the moral sense of mankind by refusing this olive branch of peace when presented. Of all the desirable political changes which it seems to me possible for this generation to effect, I consider it by far the most important for the welfare of the race that every civilized nation should be pledged, as the Republic is, to offer peaceful arbitration to its opponent before the senseless, inhumane work of human slaughter begins. And for all the just and good measures by which the Republic has won my love, next to that by which she has made me her own citizen, and hence the peer of any man, Kaiser, Pope, or King, thus effacing from my brow the insult inflicted upon me by my native land at birth, which deemed me unworthy the privileges accorded to others, next to that for which I will fight for her, if need be die for her, and must adore her forever, I thank the Republic for her position in regard to international murder, which still passes by the name of war. The Executive Power, the President The Executive Power is lodged in a President who for four years, the term of his office, is the most powerful ruler in the world. He is not only the first civil magistrate, but he is Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, and of all the military forces of the nation, including the militia of the states whenever called upon by him. More soldiers would respond to his call than that of any other ruler in the world. The number of men who in case of war might be enrolled in the militia approaches seven millions. Almost every able man of whom would consider it his duty to shoulder his musket and march at the word of his commander-in-chief, the president. What are French or German or Russian hosts compared to this of the democracy? Even man for man, as soldiers, they would not compare with the educated Republican. But this great army costs the state but little. It is always engaged in the pursuits of peace and only to be called upon should emergency arise. The president's control over the forces is not merely nominal, it is real. When the most popular general in the army during the Civil War made his famous march to the sea and had the enemy at his feet, it was feared that unsatisfactory terms for his surrender might be made. The following telegram was therefore sent which, though bearing the signature of the Secretary of the War, was written without blot or erasure by President Lincoln himself. I have seen the telegram. Washington, March 3, 1865, 12 p.m. Lieutenant General Grant, the President directs me to say to you that he wishes you to have no conference with General Lee unless it be for the capitulation of General Lee's army or on some other minor and purely military matter. 
He instructs me to say that you are not to decide, discuss, or confer upon any political question. Such questions the President holds in his own hands and will submit them to no military conferences or conventions. Meanwhile, you are to press to the utmost your military advantages. Edwin M. Stanton, Secretary of War. The generals, of course, obeyed. Only a few days later, General Sherman, just fresh from his march to the sea, entered into a convention with General Johnston which had political bearings. A telegram was promptly sent to General Grant instructing him to cancel General Sherman's agreement, and this was done. Suppose, if anyone can suppose so lamentable an abdication of duty, that in a weak moment the American government had sent a Gordon to arrange terms of peace, and that he disobeyed his instructions or had presumed to declare war upon his own account. In the President's opinion, a simple order like the foregoing would scarcely have met the case. He would have had the insubordinate arrested, court-martialed, cashiered, and probably shot. No, not shot, but consigned for life to some lunatic asylum. President Lincoln could have court-martialed General Grant, or General Grant, when President, could have court-martialed General Sherman, or either president dismissed either general when at the height of that general's power or arrested him, as Richelieu did, his conspiring general, at the head of his legions, without raising a murmur of popular dissent. The people would have reserved their judgment till the next election and probably have enthusiastically approved, as indeed the British will approve if they ever see it, a display of masterful power over all others by their elected chief of state. No soldier has ever dreamed of questioning the supreme authority of the president, nor has the nation ever shown the slightest jealousy of its exercise. Why should it, since the president is not above its reach, but is only its own duly appointed agent for a specified term? When that expires, he transfers his powers to his successor and seeks again the ranks of private citizenship. One returns to Congress as the representative of his district, another resumes the practice of law, a third becomes a farmer. Neither sinecure, place, nor pension is bestowed upon an ex-president. He has been supremely honored by his fellow citizens. He has in turn done his duty. The obligation is upon his side, and he remains profoundly grateful for the distinction conferred upon him. The state owes officials little. They owe the state much. Such is the Republican idea. The salary of the president is now $50,000 per annum, 10,000 pounds. An official residence is provided for him at Washington and a country house within a few miles of the city. At stated times for some hours each week, the president receives such respectably dressed and well-ordered people as choose to call upon him. Being the servant of the people in a country where all citizens are equal, the humblest has the same right to call upon him and shake his hand as the most distinguished, he being as much the servant of the one as of the other. By many such significant customs, the powerful president is reminded of what it would indeed be impossible for anyone in the land to forget, that the sovereignty of the republic resides not in the servants of the state, but in the citizen, and every one of whom rests an equal share of it. The feelings and desires of the citizen it therefore behooves all officials to consider. The president selects of his own will and without interference the members of his cabinet, as the British prime minister does. They are removable at pleasure. The president being his own prime minister, the cabinet officers are of equal rank. One difference between the two countries in regard to the cabinet is that, while the British cabinet sit in one or the other house and communicate orally with it, in America the members of the cabinet do not appear in person before the legislature but report to it in writing. This is, however, simply a matter of convenience. There is nothing but custom to prevent them from appearing and making their statements in person, although they could not take any part in the proceedings of the legislature. At first, the President appeared and addressed Congress at the beginning of each session, but the plan of placing before it a written message as often as deemed necessary has been preferred. The people would not favor a change to the British practice, for the separation of the executive and legislative departments is held to be of much importance. Either house can call at all times upon the president for information upon any question connected with affairs, but as the call has to meet the approval of the house, 
the government is freed from the petty annoyances which it is in the power of any injudicious member to inflict under the British system of nightly questioning. The president, in like manner, has free access to Congress, and, indeed, it is his duty to report to it from time to time upon all matters of which, in his opinion, Congress should be advised. He is also invited to recommend measures for its acceptance. The president represents the nation in its relations with foreign countries and receives all ambassadors. It is he alone who has the power to pardon offenses against the laws of the United States. He also has a veto power over the acts of Congress, which, however, is invalid should the measure vetoed be passed again by a two-third vote in both houses. He is eligible for re-election, and several have been elected for two terms, or eight years in all, as Washington was, but he having declined re-election for a third term lest the office should seem too permanent, it has become the custom not to elect beyond two terms. The Americans have indeed shown wonderful sagacity in the selection of their presidents. Considered as a body, it would be impossible to equal them in character, ability, education, or manners by any body of men ever born, appointed, or elected to any other station. They furnish a striking contrast to the occupants or heirs of thrones in every particular. When Britain was disgraced by its George III, the Republic had Washington. And until Queen Victoria ascended the throne, the comparison had certainly always been in favor of the Republic. It is the fashion in all things to praise the past and claim that there were giants in those days, but it is nevertheless true, in my opinion, that the presidents of the Republic in our own times have been worthy successors even to Washington, Adams, and Jefferson of the past. Grant has a firm place in history among men possessed of great ability. Garfield's career from a poor school teacher to the presidency is exceedingly difficult to parallel, while the political genius of Lincoln has never been surpassed. It is always well to remember that there are giants in our own day, too. The election of the president and vice president is not by a direct vote of the people, but by a vote of the states in an electoral assembly in which each state has as many votes as it has senators and representatives in Congress that is in proportion to its population. It has been claimed as an advantage of the monarchy that, having a permanent head of the state, the excitement and expense of a general election every four years is avoided. But, it may be answered, the hereditary head of Britain is not a political head at all. An automaton would do just as well, for it could certainly be used as a model to set the fashions and clothes, and probably could be made to lay foundation stones, or open fancy bazaars with little less careful coaching and attention than it is generally necessary to bestow upon the live figurehead. Besides, it would be much less expensive. The real ruler of Britain is elected just as often as a president of the republic is, for it is a curious fact that parliaments last an average of four years, which is the presidential term. Even as I now write, the appeal is being made to the British people, Gladstone or Salisbury, as clearly as in the last presidential election it was Cleveland or Blaine. It is a fiction, therefore, that the monarchy has any advantage, if it would be an advantage, which I dispute, over the republic in this respect, for they are situated precisely alike. They each elect a ruler every four years. The excitement and the expense of a general election is far greater in the monarchy than in the republic, and in both equally the head is elected. Besides this, members of Congress are elected by the states along with the presidential ticket, just as members of Parliament are elected when Gladstone or Salisbury is chosen. So that in one sense, the election of the president costs nothing whatever, as state elections have to be held whether a president is to be elected or not, and voting for the electoral ticket when voting for representatives involves no additional expense. Of course, more money is spent in presidential years, but this is the personal contribution of the zealous partisans and not a charge upon the state. It will surprise Britons to know that no sums comparable to what they spend on political contests are ever spent by the Americans. The total sum expended by the national committees of all parties, even in the last exciting presidential contest, did not exceed $600,000. £120,000. The Republican election, moreover, is conducted with far less riot and disturbance than unfortunately characterizes the appeal to the electorate in older England. 
An American is surprised and shocked at the rowdyism often shown at public meetings in Britain. He is accustomed to have both sides granted a respectful hearing. I have never seen any public meeting in America broken up by gangs of the opposite side, nor a public man denied a hearing. In this respect, the example of the younger political community might well be followed by the elder. When the people of Britain, however, obtain their full political rights, there will be less exciting questions to discuss than those which now press for solution, and political gatherings will then be more peaceably conducted. It must not be forgotten that when a vital issue like slavery was under discussion in America, the right of free speech was often violently assailed, as it still is in Britain. When the surroundings of the president and the royal ruler are contrasted, Republican simplicity stands out in strong relief. The president walks about as an ordinary citizen, wholly unattended, and travels, as a rule, upon ordinary trains, arrives in New York, and registers at the hotel without previous announcement. Beyond a brief mention of the fact in the next morning's papers, nothing is published about him. As I write, he has gone to Buffalo, the city of his former residence, in order to cast his vote at the election for governor of the state of New York. It will weigh just as much as, and no more, than that of the mechanics or laborers whom he will find surrounding the polling booth. Although, go where he may, he will be met with quiet evidences of universal and sincere deference as president. There will be no parade, no cheers. The equipages of the president in Washington have frequently been so common as not to rank with those of the wealthy residents, and never, in any instance, have they been the richest or best. All the presidents have been poor men. I have known three of them so well as to state, of my own knowledge, that they left office without means enough upon which to live respectably. Of every American president, it may be said as it was said of Pitt, dispensing for years the favors of the state, he lived without ostentation and died poor. They have all left office poor and pure. One turns from the dignified, simple life of the Republican ruler to that of the nominal head of Britain, feeling that there he meets a coarser and less finely developed civilization. The parade and vulgar ostentation which surrounds at every turn the nominal ruler of the parent land is indeed in striking contrast. The cost to the state is as 10,000 to 600,000 pounds. The entire family, mother and his sisters and his cousins and his aunts, are supported and bands of retainers who are supposed to dignify the throne. The state processions strike an American as grotesque masquerades, and the official coaches in which royalty moves about provoke the inquiry, What circus has come to town? One instinctively looks inside for the clown, this much for the crowned king. But the contrast is not all in favor of the republic, for when the real ruler, the uncrowned king of Britain, is compared with his fellow ruler here, then the palm for true dignity cannot be awarded to America. Nothing can exceed the simplicity of the surroundings of the prime minister of that great empire. His salary is only one half that of the president. His official residence is a shabby, dingy, old brick house instead of the noble executive mansion standing in its own park at Washington. It is simply number 10 Downing Street and is as shabbily furnished as a New York boarding house. Mr. Gladstone lives and Mr. Disraeli lived as sensibly as our president and set just as healthful an example, which, however, counts for little in Britain since the prime minister is not, like the president, the first personage in society. Indeed, when the Liberal Party is in power, the prime minister can scarcely be said, in one sense, to be in society at all. He is proscribed and has no influence upon it. But his day approaches. The democracy will soon require that the man who has the people of England at his back shall no longer tolerate a king before his face. Wherever he appears in Britain, as in America, he will take precedence. He shall stand before kings. The children of the Prince of Wales, the prince himself, if he be unwise, and the children of all of the present dukes and lords of the empire, are no longer to follow in the train of the pretender, but in that of the only real, the elected king. It is so in the republic, and what is here is to be yonder. What America does today, Britain reaches in the next generation. We must reverse the old proverb, as the old cock grows, the young one learns. 
Nowadays, it is the young cock which leads the crowing. The old one does the learning. Room, then, the first place for the elected monarch of triumphant democracy in Britain. We have now passed in review the three branches of government, judicial, legislative, and executive, for which the Constitution provides. The ease with which this instrument has not only done the work over the country for which it was originally designed, but with which it has, without repeated change, quietly enveloped in its operation a combination of 49 different political communities, occupying an area of 3 million square miles and comprising most of the English-speaking race. This is not to be spoken of without wonder. With one exception, the dispute as to the right of state to withdraw from the Union, a serious difficulty has never arisen. It seems as if there could be no limit to its powers of absorption. The whole world could today come into the American Union as equal states and develop peacefully, each after its own fashion, no man being less a Briton, a Frenchman, a German, a Russian, or a Chinaman, but all becoming possessed of a new title, proudest of all, citizen of the world. This wonderful constitution stipulates for a republican form of government. All the democracy has to do is to discard hereditary rulers as useless, dangerous, and therefore to be abolished. Sure is it that they have deluged the world with wars, put men against his fellow, and sought no end but their own aggrandizement. Not less sure that they must ever stand in the way of the brotherhood of the race which it is the mission of democracy to foster. How easily, within our grasp, fellow citizens of the world, seems the day when the drum shall beat no longer and the battle flags be furled, and the parliament of man the federation of the world. We may not look, however, for quite so wide and complete a union. Oceans divide the races, and this fact will keep them apart, for permanent political aggregations must ever be counter menace. But as far as the continents of the world are concerned, there is no insuperable obstacle to their union each into one nation upon the federal system. The American continent is evidently destined to be so ruled. The European continent is slowly consolidating, for there are but five great powers today instead of the hundreds of small ones which existed before the Napoleonic era. A league of peace to which each continent will send delegates to decide international differences is not quite so far off in the future as may at first sight appear. This would remove from the world its greatest stain, war between man and man. To all communities who are tending towards further consolidations and to every man who can truthfully exclaim, my benison with those who would make good of ill and friend of foes, we commend a close study of that great work of triumphant democracy, which Mr. Gladstone has pronounced the most wonderful work ever struck off at one time by the brain and purpose of man, the profoundly conservative and yet radically republican American constitution. End of chapter 16, The Federal Constellation. Recording by Aaron Bennett. Chapter 17 of Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. Chapter 17. Foreign Affairs. We begin with a quote by Thomas Jefferson. Peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. End quote. As we have endeavored to point out, there is a great difference between the old and the new lands in the management of their domestic concerns. This difference becomes radical in the domain of foreign affairs. Indeed, it is no longer a difference, it is a complete reversal. What the old land does, the new land avoids. What the one land does not, the other does in dealing with other nations. The consequences of the two diverse policies are seen in diametrically different results. The huge debt, the constant war, or fear of war, and the international jealousies which surround the parent land contrast strangely with the freedom of the republic from all these ills. 
the excuse made by british statesmen for the unfortunate contrast presented is that the republic has no strong neighbors and no colonies or dependencies far distant from its shores which it is bound to guard i am persuaded that the cause of difference lies deeper than this no nation is so temptingly placed as the republic for being engaged in aggressive warfare the materials lie around her upon every side had america been cursed with monarchical institutions which ever breed strong military classes to whom as to the royal family and the court peaceful avocations are discreditable as compared with military operations there can be little question but that the american monarchy would have involved itself in endless disputes treaties and entangling alliances with other powers necessitating large standing armies and fleets from which would have come endless wars or fear of war the republic began early to pursue the paths of peace the messages of each succeeding president enforced to the words of jefferson which we have placed at the head of this chapter and the sayings of american statesmen abound with kindred sentiments washington in his farewell address gave the keynote upon which all subsequent changes have been wrung he says quote, the great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations to have with them as little political connection as possible so far as we have already formed engagements let them be fulfilled with perfect good faith here let us stop End quote. madison's view of the republic's mission was quote, to cherish peace and friendly intercourse with all nations having correspondent dispositions to maintain sincere neutrality towards belligerent nations to prefer in all cases amicable discussion and reasonable accommodation of differences to a decision of them by an appeal to arms to exclude foreign intrigues and foreign partialities so degrading to all countries and so baneful to free ones End quote. adams speaks of quote, the pestilence of foreign influence which is the angel of destruction to elective governments End quote jefferson further lays down as quote, our first and fundamental maxim never to entangle ourselves in the broils of europe our second never to suffer europe to intermeddle with cis-atlantic affairs End quote. and so was reached the great doctrine bearing the name of monroe declaring to the powers of europe that quote, we should consider any attempt on their part to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety our policy in regard to europe the monroe message continued is not to interfere in the internal concerns of any of its powers to consider the government de facto as the legitimate government for us to cultivate friendly relations with it and to preserve these relations by a frank firm and manly policy meeting in all instances the just claims of every power submitting to injuries from none End quote. this chapter could be filled with extracts from the president's messages and from other sources all preaching the same important lesson that the republic must be at peace with its neighbors and with the world i need not however dwell upon the past it is with the present we have to deal let me give then a short statement of the course recently pursued by the monarchy and by the republic in the management of similar emergencies in their relations to other states the one has a canal through egypt to guard and the other a railway across the isthmus of panama that the traffic of the world may be unimpeded a few months ago word was received in washington that a disturbance had broken out at one end of the railway in the republic of columbia and that there was grave danger that railway communication across the isthmus would be interfered with a force was at once dispatched to the scene and the admiral sailed under the following instructions which were published in the newspapers that the nation and the world might see and understand all telegram navy department washington april third eighteen eighty five rear admiral james e jewett u s s tennessee pensacola florida quote, in addition to the force under your command in the steamships tennessee swatara alliance and galena 
all of which should be at Espinwall upon your arrival, you will be reinforced by about 200 Marines, dispatched today from New York by the steamship city of Para, with tents and camp equipage. To provide for contingencies, further supplies will be sent at once. The duty you are called upon to perform calls for the exercise of great discretion. The object of the expedition is the performance by the United States of their engagements to preserve the neutrality of and keep open the transit from Colon to Panama and further to protect the lives and property of American citizens. The circumstances as understood from which the necessity of the expedition has arisen are, in general, that a steamship belonging to Americans has been seized at Colon by an armed force and goods in transit taken from her her officers and the american consul imprisoned and the transit across the isthmus interrupted with the consequences involved in these past acts you are not concerned your sole duty is confined to seeing that a free and uninterrupted transit across the isthmus is restored and maintained and that the lives and property of american citizens are protected if on your arrival at the isthmus order shall have been restored and the colombian authorities are adequate to the protection of life and property and the maintenance of the free transit you will interfere in no respect with the constituted authorities but report and await orders you have no part to perform in the political or social disorders of colombia and it will be your duty to see that no irritation or unfriendliness shall arise from your presence at the isthmus the exercise of humanity towards American citizens in exigent distress must be left to your sound discretion. W. C. Whitney, Secretary of the Navy. End quote. Note how careful that promising young statesman, Mr. Whitney, is to limit the operations of his admiral to the maintenance of the free and uninterrupted communication which his government had guaranteed how solicitous that the authorities and people of colombia should be so treated that no unfriendliness or irritation could possibly arise the admiral found upon arrival that the disturbance was over and soon returned not a shot was fired now the great point here is that not a voice was raised in all america suggesting that any part of colombia should be held or annexed or that the people of that state should be in any way interfered with Consequently, no suspicions were aroused, no enemies created. American interests were not pleaded as a warrant for continued occupation. The great and powerful republic was at Colon as a friend of its small and weak sister, but upon no account to interfere with her, even for Colombia's own seeming good. Colombia might manage, or seemingly to America, mismanage her own affairs, as to her seemed possible or best. The admiral would no more have thought of interfering than he would had he been on the shores of Ireland and doomed to stand and see a poor tenant farmer evicted, or upon the shores of Scotland and had seen a poor crofter abused. If the quarrelers in Columbia had attempted to interrupt railway communications across the isthmus, he would have protected that and in so doing would have received the thanks of all the good people of Columbia president cleveland refers to this episode in his recent message to congress for the benefit of the unfortunate people of the monarchy and more especially for that of its statesmen i quote the passage in full quote, emergencies growing out of civil war in the united states of columbia demanded of the government at the beginning of this administration the employment of armed force to fulfill its guarantees under the thirty fifth article of the treaty of eighteen sixteen in order to keep the transit open across the isthmus of panama desirous of exercising only the powers expressly reserved to us by the treaty and mindful of the rights of colombia the forces sent to the isthmus were instructed to confine their actions to positively and efficaciously preventing the transit and its accessories from being interrupted or embarrassed the execution of this delicate and responsible task necessarily involved police control where the local authority was temporarily powerless but always in aid of the sovereignty of colombia 
the prompt and successful fulfillment of its duty by this government was highly appreciated by the government of colombia and has been followed by expressions of its satisfaction high praise is due to the officers and men engaged in this service the restoration of peace on the isthmus by the re-establishment of the constituted government there being thus accomplished the forces of the united states were withdrawn leaving for the present the colombian difficulty as peacefully settled without one trace of dissatisfaction upon the part of the weaker power to plague the republic hereafter let us see how the monarchy managed a similar task imposed upon her england was surprised that a rebellion against the infamous ruler of egypt had broken out and being bound with france to exercise dual control she besought that country to interfere jointly with her in suppressing this righteous uprising of an oppressed people the government of france was anxious to do so but the people of france unmistakably pronounced against this a proof that democracy is beginning at last to show its legitimate fruit there instead of sending an expedition to guard the canal which by the way was never endangered the government sent a large force to egypt and began an aggressive campaign to prevent the people of egypt from having such rulers as they desired from that unfortunate day to this britain has gone deeper and deeper into trouble already one hundred million dollars twenty million pounds and thousands of lives have been sacrificed and for what absolutely nothing the criminal side of the question has so shocked the moral sense of the best portion of the liberal party that mr gladstone has deemed it necessary upon the eve of an appeal to the nation to confess that the soudan campaign was a mistake it was worse than that mr gladstone it was a crime which would sully your fame for ever were it not known that you had no part in it but were overruled by the aristocratic element which you thought essential to keep in your cabinet it may be argued that britain was bound to interfere and support upon the throne a sovereign against the wishes of the egyptian people though this seems a strange position for so advanced a nation to occupy or it may be said that britain had neither right nor wish to interfere with the internal affairs of egypt but only wished to guard the canal it matters not which position is assumed the fact remains that the policy pursued has not produced the desired result upon either hypothesis and the end arrived at is in lamentable contrast with the different policy pursued by the republic the strong republic sees clearly from the start what end it has in view and aims solely for that end the weak monarchy ever subject to the popular breeze the creature of circumstance can have no decided policy the british constitution makes britain the macabre of nations always looking for something to turn up the republic has complied with its treaty obligations and retired from the scene with the thanks of its weak neighbor we are yet to learn what is to be the end of the management of the monarchy so far no contrast could be more striking than that between it and that of the republic let us pause here a moment to contrast the positions of the two admirals upon their respective stations at Cologne and alexandria the republican official had every interest in maintaining peace the responsibility of firing a shot was appalling behind him stood his superior the secretary of the navy every line of whose cautious but explicit instructions seems to regard hostilities with aversion behind the government the admiral knew stood the american people loath to hurt the feelings of a weak neighbor and determined never to interfere with its internal affairs no possible reward no glory would fall to this admiral from entangling his country in war he would have been held to the strictest accountability for every drop of blood shed and the verdict of public opinion at first would have been disposed to go decidedly against him on the other hand the surest mode of earning the thanks of congress and of his country was so to conduct himself so as to secure peace without firing a shot so stood admiral jewett a man of war converted into a messenger of peace this is the attitude of the democracy how was it with admiral seymour the servant of a monarch 
let him refrain from bombarding from behind his iron walls the few miserable defences in alexandria bay and never in his history perhaps would such an opportunity occur again to rescue his name from obscurity if he decided to be patient and remain at peace half pay and oblivion would be his reward he knew that if he began to bombard the egyptian defences the ruling class which alone could reward him would applaud even the queen a woman who should shudder at war and not publicly parade her interest in slaughter would publicly congratulate him and the prince of wales and all the aristocracy which move round the court together with the military and naval classes who flourish only through war would extol him to the skies the government tempted the man to fire all the forces behind him urged him on while as we have seen all the forces behind the republican admiral held him to peace admiral seymour might have thus reasoned negotiate this trouble peacefully i remain poor and obscure there is no danger i am perfectly safe behind these iron walls just open my guns and fame and honor and rank and wealth are mine he yielded mr gladstone himself stood up in parliament and advocated a peerage and a pension to the admiral who was bribed to begin the bombardment of alexandria fortunately not even mr gladstone could force the liberal party to grant the pension admiral seymour received in cash his thirty pieces of silver fellow countrymen what would you think of a judge upon the bench deciding his own cause where a verdict for the defendant meant to the judge obscurity and half pay and the verdict for the plaintiff meant a peerage and twenty five thousand pounds yet this was precisely the position of admiral seymour at alexandria and it is practically the position occupied by every british commander to whom is committed the issue of peace or war in the exercise of his discretion need we marvel that while the monarchy becomes involved in war after war the republic settles similar problems in peace and with the good will and cordial friendship of the power with which she has to deal let us proceed just a step further and show the policy of the democracy upon this subject of intervention or complications in the affairs of other states the president's message from which i have just quoted refers to a treaty offered by nicaragua which proposed to give america the necessary land upon which to construct a canal of its own across the isthmus a tempting bait this to a monarchy with imperial ambitions but listen to the response of the republican president quote, maintaining as i do the tenets of a line of precedence from washington's day which proscribe entangling alliances with foreign states i do not favor a policy of acquisition of new and distant territory or the incorporation of remote interests with our own the laws of progress are vital and organic and we must be conscious of that irresistible tide of commercial expansion which as the concomitant of our active civilization day by day is being urged onward by those increasing facilities of production transportation and communication to which steam and electricity have given birth but our duty in the present instructs us to address ourselves mainly to the development of the vast resources of the great area committed to our charge and to the cultivation of the arts of peace within our own borders though jealously alert in preventing the american hemisphere from being involved in the political problems and the complications of distant governments therefore i am unable to recommend propositions involving paramount privileges of ownership or right outside of our own territory when coupled with absolute and unlimited engagements to defend the territorial integrity of the state where such interests lie while the general project of connecting the two oceans by means of a canal is to be encouraged i am of opinion that any scheme to that end to be considered with favor should be free from the features alluded to End quote. 
statesmanship in britain would have required some lifelong diplomat to negotiate for the privileges offered and the seed of many serious questions of the future would have been laid the abused people of britain being led to applaud the strong statesmen who had promoted british interests and enlarged the bounds of the empire a little common sense in the democracy ensures the republic a continuance of peace but now and then the seeds of future trouble present themselves in more specious garbs the congo basin attracts attention at present and here is a paragraph bearing upon that subject also in the same president's message which i have quoted quote, a conference of delegates of the principal commercial nations was held at berlin last winter to discuss methods whereby the congo basin might be kept open to the world's trade delegates attended on behalf of the united states on the understanding that their part should be merely deliberative without imparting to the results any binding character so far as the united states were concerned this reserve was due to the indisposition of this government to share in any disposal by an international congress of jurisdictional questions in remote foreign territories the results of the conference were embodied in a formal act of the nature of an international convention which laid down certain obligations purporting to be binding on the signatories subject to ratification within one year notwithstanding the reservation under which the delegates of the united states attended their signatures were attached to the general act in the same manner as those of the plenipotentiaries of other governments thus making the united states appear without reserve or qualification as signatories to a joint international engagement imposing on the signers the conservation of the territorial integrity of distant regions where we have no established interests or control this government does not however regard its reservation of liberty of action in the premises as at all impaired and holding that an engagement to share in the obligation of enforcing neutrality in the remote valley of the congo would be an alliance whose responsibilities we are not in a position to assume i abstain from asking the sanction of the senate to that general act End quote the president does not even consider it worth while to submit the question to the senate it is so manifestly opposed to the traditions of the democracy whose business is to mind its own business and teach by example not by interference the sanction of the senate not having been obtained of course the action of the mistaken delegates is of no effect and the republic lets the imperial nations involve themselves in dangerous alliances upon the congo we are soon to hear no doubt of disputes between these nations upon this very subject when these arise the republican method can be once more referred to with satisfaction i have mentioned three questions all occurring in one year through any one of which future wars might have arisen had the republic not known better than the monarchy how to manage its foreign affairs no my readers it is not because america is so happily placed as to be excluded from the necessity of interference or that she is not bound by guarantees and alliances with other powers or freed from the necessity to engage in wars as other nations do but as the instances just cited abundantly show her envied position is the natural result of a resolute refusal to adopt the measures which must and always do lead inevitably to wars the democracy does not escape these terrible catastrophes by luck but by careful adherence from year to year and in every emergency to a sound policy the american people are satisfied that the worst native government in the world is better for its people than the best government which any foreign power can supply that governmental interference upon the part of a so-called civilized power in the affairs of the most barbarous tribe on earth is injurious to that tribe and never under any circumstances whatever can it prove beneficial either for the undeveloped race or for the intruder they are further satisfied that in the end more speed is made in developing and improving backward races by proving to them through example the advantages of democratic institutions than is possible through violent interference 
the man in america who should preach that the nation should interfere with distant races for their civilization and for their good would be voted either a fool or a hypocrite such a classification need not be confined to this side of the atlantic there was nothing unkind in mr leonard courtney's policy of allowing the egyptians to stew in their own juice this policy would have been permanently best for them mr courtney was the true statesman we ask careful readers to reflect upon what has been here shown and consider whether the success achieved in the management of domestic questions is not admirably supplemented by the wonderful results attending the foreign relations of the democracy to the people of my native land i say do not believe your statesmen when they attempt to excuse their failures and their follies by stating that the republic escapes similar results because isolated from other nations while britain is not this is not true the silver streak should act as an isolator more complete than any republic has for the republic has no such barrier either north or south it is not further isolation which is required but a government isolated from monarchical and aristocratical influences when this is obtained there no difficulty will be found in the way of adopting the policy of the triumphant democracy which avoids all entangling alliances since the ally of one nation necessarily proclaims himself the enemy of others britain will then stand as the republic stands the friend of all nations the ally of none the lesson which the democracy teaches the monarchy is that proper attention to its own affairs and freedom allowed to other nations to manage theirs in their own way is the best and surest means to secure progress in political development throughout the world thus saith the democracy no nation can give to another any good which will compensate for the injury caused by interference with the sacred germ of self-government End of chapter 17, Foreign Affairs. Chapter 18, Part 1 of Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanne Turner. Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. Chapter 18, Part 1. The Government's Non-Political Work. Quote, Politically and socially, the United States are a community living in a natural condition and conscious of doing so. And being in this healthy case and having this healthy consciousness, the community there uses its understanding with the soundness of health. It, in general, sees its political and social concerns straight and sees them clear, unquote. Matthew Arnold. The man of ability in Britain is too often tempted into the political field. The rare talent for organization and administration of the American, on the other hand, usually finds a far more useful field in the management of affairs, much more important than politics, in a land which has finally settled all fundamental political problems and now rests at peace upon the rock of the political equality of the citizen, while the parent land is tossing about upon unruly seas, knowing no rest. I have often admired the various non-political bureaus at Washington as being strictly American, something which the democracy has evolved far superior to any similar bureaus ever produced by monarchical forms of government. This is probably the ablest and purest service in the world. I had intended to visit Washington to examine the various branches of this work and write an account of them, but the time could never be spared. The happy idea occurred to me to send my secretary, Mr. Bridge, to perform the task, with a request to write up the subject and see what he could make of it. 
He has done so well that I cannot do better than incorporate his account, which is as follows. One of Matthew Arnold's clear-thinking Yankees has said with epigrammatic brevity that whenever three Americans get together, they organize. One becomes secretary, a second treasurer, and the other a standing committee of one to watch the executive. And surely this is more than a saying. A people trained to govern itself, even in the most minute affairs of local life, must, of necessity, develop a great capacity for organization and administration. Thus we find in America that groups of men with allied interests invariably have an organization to watch over the common wheel. But for organization of the completest and most comprehensive character, it is needful to see what the federal government is doing at Washington. A visit to the numerous departments and bureaus there is like a journey with Alice in Wonderland. There in offices, some dingy, some magnificent, one may see, lying on tables or on shelves, the charts which indicate in every particular the nation's life and health, its pulse beats and respiration, its changing appetite and desires. Nay, the whole world, the universe itself, is told to put out its wrist that the experts may know how it is doing. The present condition of crops in California or in Egypt, the degree of cloudiness in Dakota or Maine, the number and condition of hogs in market at Kansas City or in transport to Chicago, the appearance of grasshoppers in Georgia, the wheat in store at Duluth or New York, the number of bales of cotton at Bombay or Mobile, the present position in mid-Atlantic of a waterlogged wreck or a buoy adrift, a drought in Arkansas, the southward flight of cranes in Dakota, the change made yesterday in the revolving light in the Bay of Nagasaki, Japan, the coal at present available for ships at St. Helena, the relative cloudiness of the planet Mars, these and a thousand and one other matters, as diverse as can be imagined, are noted, docketed, and labeled, every change being recorded almost as soon as it takes place. Let me give an example. The Agricultural Department has in its service about 10,000 persons, dispersed all over the continent and a few throughout the world. Their service is mainly voluntary. From their reports is compiled a monthly record, which is exhibited in chambers of commerce and published in newspapers, giving the area and condition of crops throughout the world, cost of transportation to home and foreign markets, prices prevailing on farms and in principal cities, stocks on hand, requirements of consumption, sources of supply, etc. Thus, the American farmer or merchant can always ascertain the amount of acreage in particular crops, the condition of the crops as regards growth, maturity, and probable yield, the number and local value of horses, cows, sheep, oxen, or other cattle, the prices of labor in different localities, or any other data bearing on his work. Further, seeds are distributed and planted all over the vast continent, and the results of differing soils and conditions carefully noted, and deductions drawn as to the appropriate environment. Then, the habits and life history of insects and birds injurious to vegetation, and the best means of destroying them, are subjects occupying the attention of a separate division of the department. In this work, specialists are at work in the field and laboratory, and the results of their labors, printed in special reports, 
are dispersed by the numerous local agricultural societies and institutions with which the department is in intimate communion. In its own garden, the department cultivates new varieties of fruits and plants for dissemination throughout the country. In this garden, Chinese sorghum, or sugarcane, was first grown in America, and the Chinese yam was introduced by the same means. The tea plant is another example, and the domestic product is largely consumed by the families who raise it. A western orange planter writes to the department, The Bahia orange sent to California ten years ago is conceded to be the best variety produced in this state. It is the largest size and finest flavor, and sells higher than any other kind. It is worth to California all that the Department of Agriculture has ever cost the country. Amongst other work of the department may be named the analyses of grains and fruits to determine their nutritive value and analyses of soils and fertilizers, the microscopical study of plant diseases, especially fungi, the diffusion of knowledge concerning the uses of forest trees in relation to agriculture, the investigation of specific diseases amongst cattle, and efforts to prevent or cure. In brief, everything that relates directly or even remotely to farming, comes within the scope of the agricultural department. So complete is its supervision that one examining its work is impelled to the belief that the American farmer has only to follow his instructions, and the government department will run his farm and see that it pays. The United States Signal Service is another great organization which, by its electric veins spread over a continent, receives crude material, assimilates it, and sends it back pulsating in a rich, life-giving stream. From Cape Breton Island to Southern Oregon, and from San Diego, California to Havana, an area 3,000 miles long by 2,000 miles wide, embracing 150 intermediate stations. Messages are simultaneously flashed over the wires to Washington twice a day, reporting all atmospheric phenomena. An hour afterward, the little room of the assistant signal officer in G Street, Washington, holds in its dingy precincts a chart which indicates barometric pressure, direction and velocity of wind, temperature, dew point, rainfall, and cloud areas of every part of the six million square miles covered by its network of telegraphs. A stranger dropping in at midnight of January 9, 1886, would have been told that local snows were falling in the lake regions, that the temperature had risen in the Gulf states, and that the rivers had risen a foot at Cincinnati, Cairo, and Memphis, and fallen five feet at Chattanooga, that cautionary offshore signals were exhibited from Wilmington to New York, and cautionary signals from New Haven to Eastport, he would probably have been shown the track of the storm which brought to Washington the lowest barometric reading ever seen there, and the chart, being prepared under his eyes, would show him the same storm disappearing into Labrador. A few hours later, the finished chart, reproduced by telegraph, would be in the office of every important newspaper, every post office, thousands of railway stations and chambers of commerce throughout the land, from San Francisco to Boston, and from Minneapolis to Key West in the Gulf Stream. The people of New England would know on receiving the morning paper that for the next 32 hours they were to have cold, fair weather with a rising barometer, while those of Los Angeles in Lower California and Jacksonville, Florida, 
would be gladdened to know that the cold wave was passing away. In Minnesota, railway officials would learn by the same report published in their newspapers or hanging in the ticket office that there would be no immediate need of snowplows, although traffic would be slightly impeded by local snows. The skipper who contemplated leaving New York and sailing coastwise would hesitate on reading at the breakfast table that cautionary signals were displayed, and, influenced by the report of some army surgeon or amateur meteorologist away in Dakota, he might possibly decide to spend another day at home. All sorts and conditions of men are affected by this chart. One postpones a journey. Another, calculating on the arrival of grain in eastern cities, sells before the market falls. Emigrants decide to go west by the Southern Pacific route. Physicians relax their restraints as the improving weather admits the invalid to the fresh air. An amusing illustration of the extent to which the warnings of the Weather Bureau are read and heeded was lately afforded by a mistake made by a Western observer in his report of local temperature. He reported about 40 degrees instead of 4. The result was that the officer who makes the predictions concluded from his data that a warm wave was on its way east. 30 million of people living east of the Mississippi forthwith left overcoats at home and put on galoshes in preparation for a thaw which never came. The unlucky weather prophet at first excused the tardy arrival of the warm wave by saying that western railways were blocked with snow and arrivals of all kinds were delayed. But as the days passed and no warm wave appeared, the newspapers launched forth an avalanche of ridicule, the American's mode of complaint, at the untruthful prophet, and presently everybody in America was talking about the young lieutenant in Washington, who, oblivious to complainings and ridicule, went on drawing his isobars and isotherms and making his calculations and predictions. It implies great faith in this weather prophet when people complain that he ought to have corrected the error made by the local observer in Colorado or Nevada. It has come to this, that the weather prophet must not only predict correctly from his data, but even correct the data if these are wrong. Considering the haste with which the weather charts and predictions are prepared, it is surprising how few errors are made. 83% of all the indications made last year for the Atlantic coast were justified, while on the Pacific, the verifications averaged 87%. Of 2,864 cautionary signals displayed at ports, 2,301, or 80 percent, were justified. Cold wave signals were justified in about the same proportion, 815 out of 946 having been verified. The Signal Service engages in much special work. It furnishes the Farmer's Bulletin with meteorological information that is of special interest to the agriculturist. This is an official publication, and the government has taken every available means to put it into the hands of the class for which it is intended. The rise and fall of rivers are watched, and timely warning given by telegraph of coming floods. The people of the Western Plains receive similar warning of the approach of local storms, and the agriculturalist, ranchmen, and others generally have 12 hours to prepare for the coming norther. The Bureau has also undertaken the task of announcing the coming of locusts, grasshoppers, 
and other insect scourges. Frost warnings for the benefit of the sugar industries of Louisiana and the orange growers of Florida have, of late years, made the service popular in the South. The Bureau has a very complete local service in the Cotton Belt, which supplies information daily as to temperature and rainfall in every part of the district. Then, once a month, the service publishes a review of meteorological observations made in every part of the world, including Siberia, Greenland, Iceland, Borneo, Turkestan, Japan, China, and some places whose names are suggestive only of desolation and savagery. An important extension of the signal service has been made to the seacoast. Stations are placed at intervals along the coast and connected by wire with each other and with Washington. Here, Storm flags and danger warnings are made visible to vessels moving off the coast. A ship sailing from the equator to New York, as she passes Cape Henlopen, may inquire by signals whether any hurricane is impending, and, if so, whether she has time to reach Sandy Hook or must take shelter behind the Delaware breakwater or a vessel bound south from New York may inquire at the Capes of the Delaware whether any storm is likely to strike her before she can make Cape Hatteras and receive full answer by telegraph from the chief signal officer at Washington without interrupting his voyage. General Hazen, the chief signal officer, very properly thinks this division of his work of superlative importance. He says, The time is not far distant when the possession of a coast not covered by seacoast, storm signal, and signal service stations, watching as sentinels each its own beat of sea and shore, and ready to summon aid by electric wires, will be held as much an evidence of semi-barbarism as is now, among civilized nations, the holding of any national coast without a system of lighthouse lights. The achievements of the Signal Service are surprising even to those who know of its numerous observing stations spread over a land area nearly twice as great as that of Europe. But what shall we think of similar achievements on the ocean? If we are amazed at the extent of meteorological observations conducted on land, what will be our feelings on learning that similar work is being done on the sea and predictions given for use of mariners? I have before me a remarkable chart prepared by Commander Bartlett of the Navy. And here, mark the difference between a government by the people and a government by a class. Naval officers in America do not receive their highest rewards for bombarding a defenseless Alexandria or sacking a Tamatave. Their honors flow from life-saving services. And shall it not be said that the Schleys and Bartlets of America are greater than the Seymours and de Courcy's of semi-civilized Europe whose glory is to slay. The European method is to make a solitude and call it peace. The American reverses the process and, by the gentle arts of peace, makes a teeming city of the solitude and a garden of the wilderness. To return to the chart, however, here, at a glance, we have the safe transatlantic route, carefully drawn to avoid the ice, which in January hardly came further south than latitude 53 degrees. The sailing route to the equator, calculated to give ships the benefit of the trade winds, is also as clear as careful drawing and good printing can make it. The prevailing winds for the month are indicated. 
as well as the direction of ocean currents, while special symbols mark the position of wrecks, buoys adrift, water spouts, and localities haunted by whales. Directions for the use of oil in heavy seas are printed in the corner of the chart. Derelicts drifting about in the tracks of vessels are observed, and their changing position marked from month to month. Here, for example, is a waterlogged schooner, the 21 Friends, which, despite its name, has been more threatening than 21 enemies. The vessel was abandoned off the coast of Virginia on March 24th. Being lumber-laden, she continued to float, and by April 28th had drifted 1,200 miles. During the summer months, she pursued her solitary course across the Atlantic, ever followed by watchful eyes in Washington. On September 20th, she was apparently making for Queenstown, but suddenly headed off for Cape Finisterre, where she was seen early in December. She has probably ere this been towed into a Spanish port. Several other floating wrecks have been watched by anxious eyes in the hydrographic office, which, unable to send out and destroy such dangers in the track of commerce, could only give warning by indicating as nearly as possible their position. This wonderful chart is soon to give the position of fogs in the North Atlantic. Thus, the ferry between the old and new lands is ever being made safer. The weather predictions are, of course, only proximate, being largely based on the periodicity of meteorological changes in the North Atlantic. Here are examples of the weather indications given copied from the chart for January 1886. The storm area on the North Atlantic is at its maximum, between the coast of the United States north of Cape Hatteras and that of Europe north of 47 degrees, a gale of wind may be expected once in six days. These gales are most violent when the wind is between southwest and northwest but a large percentage do not develop a force of more than 10. Heavy northers may be expected along the Gulf Coast of Mexico and Texas as often as once in 10 days. Some may extend as far east as Key West and south over the Caribbean Sea to Aspinwall. There is little danger of ice in the routes of transatlantic steamers. And then come recommendations in regard to passage off Cape Horn, which admirably show the deductive methods of modern weather prophets. In the summer season, that is, during the long days, there exists a barometric minimum over the vast plains of Patagonia. In consequence of the constant indrift due to this atmospheric condition, the centers of depressions which travel from the Pacific to the Atlantic are deflected toward the north, causing violent storms in the region of Cape Horn and Tierra del Fuego. It is therefore desirable, after passing Staten Land, to stand to the southward as rapidly as possible to the 59th or 60th parallel, if the ice permits, where the influence of the navigable semicircle of the atmospheric whirl will be felt, in which relatively light northeast and southeast winds prevail and are favorable for making the passage into the Pacific. Here's fine revolution, and we had the trick to see it. The Fuegians, who live in this inhospitable region, believe, as Fitzroy tells us, that storms are sent by evil spirits to punish the wicked. And here, Captain Bartlett, with unconscious iconoclasm, says their cause is only a barometric minimum in Patagonia. These scientific experts are rapidly taking all romance out of life with their classifications and technical phraseology. If the Fuegians get a sight of Captain Bartlett's chart, they will at once become a religionless race, for it is obviously vain to attempt to propitiate a barometric minimum.
the monthly publication of this encyclopedic chart is but a small part of the work of the hydrographic office. Branch offices are maintained at the principal ports to give information to mariners concerning routes, to adjust barometers and chronometers, to examine old charts and point out their errors. Nearly 11,000 persons received nautical information last year from the officers under the hydrographer, and nearly 12,000 vessels were boarded and information collected from their logbooks. Then, every week, notices to mariners are published and circulated all over the world, announcing changes in lights, buoys, and everything affecting navigation, whether at Kodono Saima, in the Japanese Inland Sea, or in the Swash Channel at New York. The enormous work entailed by this may be gauged from the fact that there are about 20,000 buoys in the world, and every change in color or position is immediately reported to the hydrographer, who at once announces the change to every American consul and to hundreds of mariners throughout the world. So, too, with the lighthouses of the world, which are so numerous that a list of them fills six volumes of nearly 300 pages each. This list, by the way, was compiled in the hydrographic office, and 20 days after receipt of the copy, a 300 edition of this six-volume work returned from the government printers ready for distribution in the Navy. In this office, the Navy's store of charts is kept, and every change referred to above is made on these charts by hand. The office likewise prints a great many charts itself, and of these, the plates are regularly corrected to date. Altogether, this hydrographic office is one of the wonders of Washington. If it were better known, it would probably be more subject to the invasion of sightseers at the Capitol than the Washington Monument. But it goes quietly along, working out its own salvation and that of thousands of poor sailors who never heard of Captain Bartlett, the cherub that sits up aloft to take care of the life of poor Jack. In the same building is the Office of Naval Intelligence, where a chart is published indicating from month to month the supply of coal at all the coaling stations of the world, and also the means of telegraphic communication accessible to mariners wherever they may find themselves. In natural sequence should here come an account of the life saving service, which in America is not an institution supported by voluntary contributions, as in England, but is a department under the government. As a result of this difference, it is claimed that the American service is more efficient than that of Britain, that a discipline almost military in its severity is necessary to obtain the best results where groups of men are working under the conditions usual at wrecks. This is a healthful and worthy rivalry. Let this be the only form of contention between the mother and her child land. Details of this excellent organization are not called for here. Lord Salisbury's Ecumenium is as applicable to the life-saving service as to the Senate. Marvelous in its efficiency and strength. End of chapter 18, part 1. Chapter 18, part 2 of Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie, Chapter 18, 
Part 2, The Government's Nonpolitical Work. An important work done by the United States Army is the improvement of rivers and harbors. Here again, under Republican institutions, the profession of arms has been turned to noble account. To do battle with shoals and snags would be considered poor work for the Burnabys and Hobarts of Britain. But in the Republic, it has ever been held that to save life is a higher function than to destroy it. Great America's army, no larger than that of insignificant Romania, is set to battle with nature, not with patriotic barbarians defending their own land. In the signal service, in the improvement of rivers and harbors, in the surveys of western territories, the Republic finds for her soldiers work which, while injuring no nation, brings them honor and the country security and comfort. So extensive is the work done by the little army of the Republic that in this division of rivers and harbors, improvements alone the year's report covers over 300 pages. Upward of a hundred million dollars have been spent by the Engineer Corps on rivers and harbors since the beginning of the government, and the present annual appropriation for this purpose is still very large. The Lighthouse Board, a division of the Treasury Department, has also done much important work in a like direction. It has control of 900 lighthouses and lightships, a thousand beacon lights on western rivers, and more than 4,000 buoys, fog signals, and other minor aids to navigation. It employs 2,500 lightkeepers, crews of lightships, etc. Here again, American ingenuity is conspicuous. Many dangerous reefs are marked by a whistling buoy which can be heard more than 15 miles. The rougher the sea, the louder this automatic siren sends out its warning voice. This Yankee notion has been adopted by Europe. Still tending to the facilitation of commerce is the Coast Survey a division which has supplemented its regular function by much special scientific work. It has originated methods of determining longitude, explored the Gulf Stream, solved the problem of tides in the Gulf of Mexico, where only one tide occurs in 24 hours, studied the laws governing tidal currents and the best methods of controlling them so as to aid navigation by deepening channels, and achieved many other valuable results. The international fisheries exhibitions in London and Berlin have given a European renown to the work of the United States Fish Commission. At the closing of the London exhibition, the Prince of Wales stated that, in many things pertaining to the fisheries, England is far behind the United States. And Professor Huxley has expressed his belief that no nation has comprehended the question of dealing with fish in so thorough, excellent, and scientific a spirit as that of the United States. The Reverend W. S. Locke Sherma of Newland, England, has made a trite comparison. At the Paris Exhibition, he considered Europe as a man in full vigor, Asia as a decrepit old man, America as a boy, Australia as a baby. In the present fishery exhibition, the case was different. America was the gem of the exhibition. That these economums were justified is proved by the fact that at London, the United States exhibit secured 50 gold medals, 47 of silver, 30 of bronze, and 24 diplomas. At the Berlin exhibition, America again headed the list, securing six gold medals out of ten. No wonder Europeans are astonished. 
If there be, wrote in 1879 Sir Rose Price, author of The Two Americas, any race of people who exhibit more shrewdness than others in their ability to grasp and manipulate the apparently indistinct elements of what may lead to a commercial success or be of ultimate benefit to their nation, those people are the Americans. No government throws away less money in useless expenditures and no representative assembly more narrowly criticizes waste, yet the Americans subsidize considerable sums of their national revenue for the purpose of restocking the rivers of the eastern states by artificial culture, and with praiseworthy consideration, their government supports several ably conducted establishments from which fish ova are distributed gratis to all those who choose to apply. The very railroads assist this enterprise, and some by moderating their tariff, and others by generously conveying the ova free of charge, give every possible encouragement to what their common sense tells them must lead to so much national good. To expect an English government to exhibit the same amount of foresight or to practice a similar generosity would be to credit them with virtues which have yet to be developed. The American example, however, should not be lost sight of. The extent of the operations of the Fish Commission can only be barely indicated here. One fact alone shows the gigantic nature of its operations. It has planted German carp in 30,000 separate bodies of water, distributed through all the states and territories in the Union. The American Navy adds to its numerous non-combatant functions the principal astronomical work done in the United States. It daily gives to every important city the correct time and furnishes some data for the government publication The Nautical Almanac. The Naval Observatory has acquired a just celebrity by its discovery of the satellites of Mars. The Patent Office and Museum is another important division of the government at Washington. Here are many thousand models of inventions of every possible kind. The list contains over 400 different patents of a nutlock. The policy of the Republic is to make the patent law the encouragement of inventors and not the means of revenue with such good results that more than 300,000 patents have been issued since 1836. Last year, the total patents issued exceeded 24,000, nearly 80% more than in 1880. Forty years ago, the average number of patents issued annually did not exceed five or 600. If one wishes to realize the extent and versatility of the American inventor, it is needful to visit the enormous museum at the patent office. Miles of shelves and cases are filled with models, while acres of drawings and designs adorn the walls or lie hidden away in drawers. English visitors are usually greatly impressed with what they see there. Herbert Spencer could not withhold his admiration. He says, The enormous museum of patents which I saw in Washington is significant of the attention paid to inventors' claims, and the nation profits immensely from having, in this direction, though not in others, recognized property in mental products, beyond question, in respect of mechanical appliances, the Americans are ahead of all nations. One of the most important factors in the diffusion of knowledge among men is found in the system of international exchange carried on by the Smithsonian Institution. 
originally intended for the distribution of its own publications, the institution, by degrees, extended its privileges to learned societies of both hemispheres, and, at present, it forms a medium of scientific intercourse between about 700 home institutions and 4,000 establishments distributed over all parts of the inhabited globe. The publications of any learned society in the world, whether in Japan, Norway, or California, if sent to Washington, will be distributed throughout the world without cost to the sender. In 1885, about 80,000 packages of books were thus sent from the Smithsonian Institution containing in some cases its own publications, in others United States Blue Books, or the transactions of various learned societies in America and elsewhere. Many railway and steamship lines carry these packages gratuitously. In this work, the Smithsonian Institution stands alone. It is probably the most effective means of diffusing knowledge ever attempted, for it circulates to the ends of the world the knowledge which, put into volumes of transactions and blue books, has hitherto been relegated to the shelves of public libraries. The official publications of the results of these bureaus are so numerous that the United States government is the largest printer and publisher in the world. In the Book of Estimates for the next fiscal year just sent to Congress, $1,380,000, £276,000, is asked for wages alone. There are on the payroll 400 compositors. Fifty proofreaders are constantly employed, besides 115 press feeders and 34 ruling machine feeders. The estimates call for 100,000 reams of printing paper, or 48 million sheets, equal to 768 million pages. Of the annual report of the Commissioner of Agriculture, 300,000 copies are distributed. The reports of the Geological Survey, the Bureau of Ethnology, the reports of the Commission of Fish and Fisheries, the bulletins of the National Museum, and hundreds of other documents and reports are sent free and postage paid almost to everybody or anybody. For the preparation of this chapter, more than 70 separate government publications were obtained, the whole forming a perfect encyclopedia of governmental methods and results, of progress in art, science, and material resources. And this little library did not cost its collector a cent. Indeed, in some instances, the books were sent free from Washington to New York. Such liberality is unparalleled. The Republic is certainly no niggard. Much other extra-governmental work is done either by the government or, as in the case of the Smithsonian Institution, under its direction. But further details are not called for here. However opinions may differ as to the propriety of a government engaging in every kind of non-governmental work, there can be no difference of opinion as to the excellent methods and important results of these bureaus in Washington. Most of them are models of equipment and method. Of the hundreds of thousands of packages sent out by Mr. Bamer of the Smithsonian Institution, not one has been lost. These offices are outside the influence of politics and run on from year to year as freely and frictionless as if political parties were as distant as the satellites of Mars. 
or as deep down in the sea as the protoplasmal jellyfish, about which these men of scientific light and leading write and print monologues at the public expense. Another fact elicited is that American progress is not limited to increasing crops or growing herds. In the higher domain of mind, in the alleviation of suffering, in the saving of life, in the facilitation of commerce, in the exploration of the world and the universe, in everything which tends to give life breadth as well as length, to make it more complete and more worth living, the Republic has contributed a very large quota. This high estimate of the value of the government bureaus has often been concurred in by foreigners. More than one celebrated Englishman has lamented to me that his country should be so far behind in similar work. It is the cue of the ruling classes of Europe to misrepresent the government of the democracy. They would have the people believe that it is weak, corrupt, and inefficient. But those who examine the subject carefully know it to be surprisingly strong, pure, efficient, and marvelously able. In none of the departments named in this chapter have politics the slightest influence. No politician could be found willing to apply any test but the suitability of the man for the work to be performed. These departments are generally under the control of permanent army and navy officers, who, I think my readers will not fail to note, are put by the Republic to much higher uses than the performance of their professional duties. If we leave the general work performed under governmental control and consider what the people do for themselves, we are even more strongly impressed than ever by their extraordinary power of administration. Take the city electrical service as an illustration. Police officers, fire engine houses, hotels, cab stands, railway stations, banks, offices, and private houses are in direct electrical communication, and telephonic communication is rapidly becoming no less general. The American Fire Department, again, is admittedly the best known. The horses are trained to rush out of their stalls into the shafts at the sound of the alarm. A single motion causes the harness to fall upon their backs. The men slide down posts from their bedrooms to the stable floor to economize time. The ambulance corps is unknown beyond the Republic. Its headquarters are at the principal hospitals. Electric communication apprises the attendant of an accident, as in the case of the fire engine. The ambulance, with its soft bed in charge of two surgeons, is instantly dashing through the streets, sounding its bell, which notifies every vehicle to turn out of its path. In a short time, the injured is lying upon a bed under charge of competent surgeons and is conveyed as rapidly as possible to the hospital. London physicians who see this American plan never fail to lament that even London has not yet attempted to produce any organization of like humane character. This remarkable talent for organization which the American people possess probably was never more clearly displayed than in the sanitary and Christian commissions instituted by private citizens during the Civil War. The military rations of the government, compared to those of any other government, are, to say the least, exceedingly liberal, all well enough for professional soldiers, but for the patriotic volunteer who went forth from his home to defend the Union as a duty, that was quite another matter. Nothing was too good for him. The people demanded that as far as possible every luxury should be his. 
and to provide this, committees were appointed in the cities and contributions solicited. The movement resulted in the two general organizations named above, which distributed more than $25 million, 5 million pounds, worth of extra supplies among the soldiers during the struggle. The collection, transportation, and distribution of these supplies, which embraced everything from easy chairs for the wounded to delicacies for the sick, were admirably performed. Bret Hart gives a poetic description of the enthusiastic reception accorded by the troops to the wagons of the commission as they pushed to the front filled with the tender offerings of a grateful people. How are you, sanitary? Down the picket-guarded lane rolled the comfort-laden wain, cheered by shouts that shook the plain, soldier-like and merry. Phrases such as camps may teach, saber cuts of Saxon speech, such as bully, them's the peach, wade in, sanitary. Right and left the caissons drew as the car went lumbering through, quick succeeding in review, squadrons military. Sunburnt men with beards like frieze, smooth-faced boys, and cries like these, U.S. Sancom, that's the cheese, pass in, sanitary. In such cheer it struggled on till the battle front was won. Then the car, its journey done, low was stationary. And where bullets whistling fly came the sadder, fainter cry. Help us, brothers, ere we die. Save us, sanitary. Such the work, the phantom flies, wrapped in battle clouds that rise. But the brave, whose dying eyes, veiled and visionary, See the jasper gates swung wide, see the parted throng outside. Here's the voice to those who ride. Pass in, sanitary. But while these supplies were pushed forward to the front, the attentions bestowed upon regiments passing to and from different fields of action were not less characteristic. I was then superintendent of the Pennsylvania Railway at Pittsburgh, through which perhaps more troops passed than through any other city. Society there determined that every regiment should be fed. Banqueted would be nearer the correct word. No hungry volunteer should ever pass through that city without being made to feel that a grateful people wished to do him honor. This being resolved upon, the young ladies, the daughters of the rich men, the millionaires, resolved that by no menial's hands should the defenders of their country be fed, they would organize and divide the duty among themselves, and with their own hands serve the men. The city hall was placed at their disposal, tables and cooking arrangements provided, and the work began. Every night, the list of ladies and gentlemen subject to call during that night was posted in the hall. It mattered not at what hour a regiment or detachment of troops was to arrive. A telegram from my office apprised the city hall. The men on duty went the rounds, one, two, three, or four o'clock in the morning, as the case might be, and one after another of the ladies were called and escorted through the darkness to the hall. One of the sights of my life. I can scarcely recall the scene without my eyes filling with tears even today was to see a regiment of bronzed men, such splendid fellows as unlike professional cutthroats as black is unlike white, to see them marched into the hall, seated at tables loaded with the finest food, and then to witness their amazement as it dawned upon them, which of course it soon did, that the young women serving were not paid servants, 
but the darlings of society who had risen in the night and come forth to do them this honor. The meal ended, the colonel rose and asked for three cheers for the Pittsburgh committee. Imagine how the boys in blue responded. But when, as was usually the case, there seemed something still lacking, some irrepressible longing which must find vent, and someone from the ranks called out, three cheers and a tiger for the young ladies of Pittsburgh. I hear their yell yet. I have seen enthusiastic crowds and heard ringing cheers, but of all the outbursts I ever heard, that of the bronzed veterans in honor of the young ladies of Pittsburgh takes the palm. And mark you, men so treated went to the front determined to fight as they cheered. How could they fail when the women of the land of their love came forth and said, Night or day, we are proud to be your servants. 664,000 troops were fed in Pittsburgh in the manner I have described. The funds were always forthcoming, and at one fair held in the city for the sanitary committee, $300,000 were netted, 60,000 pounds. The age of miracles may have passed. Matthew Arnold is authority for the statement that the case is closed against them. But to all those who extol the past and dwell upon its heroes and heroines, intimating that our own age is less heroic than some age which has preceded it, let us make answer that for one true hero who existed in any age, a hundred surround us today. And as for heroines, the world has scarcely ever known what one was until the present age. Women didn't know enough, as a rule, to be heroic until America educated her properly. There are a thousand heroines in the world today for every one any preceding age has produced. I thought twenty-odd years ago, and I am still of opinion, that there were more heroic young ladies in Pittsburgh alone than the whole world could have produced not so very long ago, and Pittsburgh was but one of many cities equally stirred to its depths. I have seen the American people, young, middle-aged, and old, men and women, Democrat and Republican, touched upon the vital cord, and have heard and felt the response. Let no monarchical enemy of Americans, and all monarchists are her enemies, ever again flatter himself that the unity of the Republic does not command at all times the lives, the fortunes, and the sacred honor of the American people. When the Americans determined to hold a centennial exhibition, they went to work at it in the same business fashion. Not a governmental official was called upon. They organized in Philadelphia, and the result was that not only was the display the best ever made in any country, according to the judgment of the foreign visitors, but the exhibition was visited by more people than ever before visited an exhibition. The facilities for transportation were such that the millions were moved on time and without accident, and, more marvelous than all else, the centennial was so managed that it paid all expenses. An advance made by the government was repaid in full. The government had nothing to do with the management. It was exclusively an affair of the people and conducted throughout by them. This universal self-dependence is manifest everywhere and in everything. I stood with Archibald Forbes on the State Department steamer at Yorktown, Virginia, when the centennial anniversary of the surrender of Cornwallis was celebrated. We saw the disembarkation of some 30,000 militia troops and a grand review. 
Mr. Forbes remarked, What surprises me more than anything I have seen today is the absence of a body of officials to take charge of the masses and assign them to places, etc. Every American seems to understand just where he is to go, what he is to do, and how best to do it. And then he quietly goes and does it, and all comes out successfully. There is nothing like this in Europe. Such is the universal testimony of competent foreign observers. The cause of this self-governing capacity lies in the fact that from his earliest youth, the Republican feels himself a man. He is called upon to participate in the management of the local affairs of his township, county, or city, or in his relations with his fellows in his church, trades union, cooperative store, or reading room, or even in his musical or dramatic society baseball, cricket, or boating club. Everywhere, he is ushered into a democratic system of government in which he stands upon an equal footing with his fellows and in which he feels himself bound to exercise the rights of a citizen. Those with talent for management naturally rise to command in their small circles, and upon great public occasions, when thousands of such circles are massed, the orderly habits prevailing in each circle render possible the easy and proper management of the vast crowd. We can confidently claim for the democracy that it produces a people self-reliant beyond all others, a people who depend less upon governmental aid and more upon themselves in all the complex relations of society than any people hitherto known. At the same time, their individual talent for organization and administration has been so concentrated as to produce through official channels various departments of universal benefit to the Commonwealth, none of which have ever been equaled and some of which have never even been attempted under monarchical government. We look in vain throughout the world for such beneficent organizations connected with the government of any country as those described in this chapter. So far, therefore, from the government of the people falling behind the government of a class in the art of government, we are amazed at the contrast presented between the old form and the new in favor of the new. The truth is that the monarchical form lacks the vigor and elasticity necessary to cope with the Republican in any department of government whatever. End of chapter 18, The Government's Non-Political Work. Chapter 19, Part 1 of Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria James. Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. Chapter 19, Part 1. The National Balance Sheet. The chapter begins with a quote. A national debt is vicious in principle, deceitful in its effects upon the state which borrows, hurtful to posterity which must pay, and tending to lead rulers into useless wars and extravagant expenditure of public money. Close quote. Thomas Spencer. National debts grow troublesome. Year after year, the burden they lay upon the productive energies of nations becomes harder and harder to bear. The twelve years between 1870 and 1882 have eclipsed all others in the amounts added to the already sorely burdened masses of Europe. Russia has saddled herself with one billion three hundred sixty five million dollars two hundred seventy three million pounds more debt in these short twelve years, an average increase of nearly one hundred fifteen million dollars twenty three million pounds per annum, a load fit to weigh an empire down. 
France's obligations have swollen to two billion two hundred fifteen million dollars four hundred forty three million pounds, and even Spain must be in the fashion and add five hundred twenty five million dollars one hundred five million pounds, and Italy not to be behind in this mad race, has contracted $740 million, $148 million pounds more. And even poor, decaying Turkey has found credulous capitalists to lend her $90 million, $18 million pounds, during this period. The aggregate of these obligations in Europe has increased, since 1848, from $14,940,000,000 two billion nine hundred eighty eight million pounds to twenty billion nine hundred thirty five million dollars four billion one hundred eighty seven million pounds and most of this increase has been consumed in wars which have left matters much as they were or would have been if never waged such is the inevitable result of anti-democratic rule britain alone let us record it to her credit is the only power which has resolutely reduced her debt. It is less, by $465 million, 93 million pounds, in 1884 than it was in 1857, while her wealth has enormously increased. It is easy to meet deficits by the proceeds of new loans, but it were well that nations should be of opinion with the Chinese laundrymen of New York, who refused to give a note bearing interest. Quote, no noty, said our heathen chiny, noty, walky, walky, ollie, tiny, walky, no sleepy. Close quote. Nations forget this peculiarity of new issues. Sleeping or waking, the load of interest swells noiselessly on Saturdays and Sundays alike. The Republic emulates her mother's example and cuts down her debt with unexampled rapidity. It is a curious fact that these, the two English-speaking nations, should be the only ones who resolutely set their faces strongly in the debt-discharging direction. The other races appear content to borrow as long as they can, and let the future take care of itself. We are not without ominous signs that in some instances the strain upon their resources cannot be increased further without danger. Perhaps the democracy is soon to awaken to the truth that these vast accumulations of debt have their real source in the rule of monarchs and courts, whose jealousies and dynastic ambitions, stimulated by the great military classes always created by them, produce the wars or continual preparation for wars, which eat up the people's substance and add to their burdens year after year. A nation with a large standing army and navy is bound to make wars." One great advantage which the democracy has secured for itself in America is its comparative freedom from debt. The ratio of indebtedness to wealth is strikingly small. Including all debt, municipal, state, and national, it is but four and one twentieth percent, the national debt alone being less than three and a half percent as compared with eight and three quarters percent in Britain, eleven and a third percent in France, Twenty-two and a quarter percent in Italy, twenty-four and a half percent in Spain, and twenty-five and a half percent in Portugal. This was in 1880. Since then, the reduction of the national debt and the increase of wealth have been so great that it is close upon two percent, not one-fourth of that of Britain, nor one-fifth of that of France. Contrary to the general impression, the debts of the various states which comprise the Union are trifling, being but six-tenths of one percent upon the valuation. Several states have no debt, others have revenues from public lands sufficient to pay the entire expenses of the state government. The municipal debts of the cities of America are likewise very small compared to those of Britain, being only one and two-tenths percent upon the valuation of city property. Taking all the state and city debts of the Union, and rating them according to valuation of property, both combined do not amount to one-fifth of the city debt of Manchester, nor to one-tenth of the debt of Birmingham, while Liverpool owes in proportion to its wealth fifty pounds, two hundred fifty dollars, for every pound, five dollars, owed by the cities of America taken as a whole. If we add to the municipal debts of America 
the state, and also the national debt, Liverpool's municipal debt alone is still seven times greater than all of these combined. Even the city of Manchester, which does not rate high as a debtor, owes in its corporate capacity alone in proportion to its wealth two and a half times as much as the ratio of indebtedness of all American cities, all state debts, and all debts of the national government. The cities of Great Britain owe $765 million, £153 million, pounds. those of America, notwithstanding their greater number of population and wealth, only $575 million, £115 million. Pounds. If to the American municipal debt we add the debt of all of the states, we have only $865 million, £173 million, pounds, for city and state debt as against $765 million, £153 million, pounds, in Britain for city debt alone. The following are given by Mulhall. Debt to valuation. Liverpool, 32.5. Manchester, 10. Birmingham, 21.8. Leeds, 15.8. London, which is in debt only 3%, finds a worthy compere in Philadelphia whose debt is even a fraction less. New York stands with Manchester at 10 and 4 tenths. America has no city so deeply involved as Liverpool, Birmingham, or Leeds. But in the case of Liverpool, I am reminded of Artemis Ward, who met in London a gentleman from that city, who told them, there were some docks or something which he should have seen. And in regard to Birmingham, no one who has been privileged to examine the work which that model of municipal life is doing will think the debt unwisely incurred. It is evident, however, that with all the push of the American, he is distanced by his illustrious ancestor in the race for debt in his corporate capacity. The Republican has so managed that the annual charge for all debt against him per head is not one-fourth of that which his brother in Britain has incurred. Every Briton owes of national debt $110, £22, every Frenchman $120, £24, every Italian $90, £18, while the American owes but $30, £6. Every Canadian owes of public debt alone in proportion to wealth $6.15, pound 4 shillings, 6 pence. Every Australian, $16.15, £3.4, 4 shillings, 6 pence. While, as we have before seen, the American, with all his resources and rosy expectation, has burdened himself with only $3.49, 14 shillings and is rapidly paying that off. This is but one more added to the proofs that lie open at all points to anyone who will take the trouble to examine and compare the facts that the masses made equal politically under the sway of democracy are not prone to wild excesses. They have developed in the United States into one of the most conservative communities in the world, conservative of their powerful government, of their Supreme Court, and of their Senate and of all that makes for the security of civil and religious liberty, of the rights of property, and the constitutional right of each individual to the pursuit of happiness in his own way, subject only to the limitations that he interfere not with the enjoyment of the same right by others. Let the student of American institutions direct his attention to this fact, and see whether the Republic be not a very conservative Republic indeed. Nowhere is so well understood the difference between liberty and license. In 1835, just half a century ago, the Republic was not only free from debt, but had a surplus in the Treasury. How to dispose of this surplus was a matter of grave concern. No wonder, for assuredly there existed no precedent in the history of the world, and statesmen are the slaves of precedent to throw light upon the novel question, not how a nation can wipe out its debt, that would be hard enough, but how a nation is to get rid of its surplus. 
Even as late as 1857, only 28 years ago, the debt was but $29 million, not £6 million. Today, the interest-bearing debt is about $1.5 billion, £300 million. My readers may be ready to suggest that in no department has the Republic made greater progress than in running into debt. Only 28 years ago, in debt, 30 millions of dollars, and today 50 times that sum. It is quite as extraordinary as an increase as is seen in her growth of wheat. Even the growth of the Bessemer steel industry does not much exceed it. And as we have had to award her the prize for rapid development in numerous branches over the motherland, let us hasten to credit the latter with setting an example to her precocious child. For the debt of Britain during the past thirty years has not only not increased, but has been reduced $310 million, £62 million. Pounds. The explanation of the increased debt of the Republic is, of course, found in the civil conflict between slavery and freedom. The two systems were antagonistic, and the irrepressible issue had to be met sooner or later. Either the equality of the citizen was or was not the foundation of the state, there was no middle ground. It has been decided, but the cost was frightful. That part of it, unpaid at the close of the struggle, which could be represented by dollars, and that much the smaller part, amounted to two billion seven hundred seventy million dollars, five hundred fifty four million pounds. Unadjusted claims subsequently paid made the total debt more than three billion dollars, six hundred million pounds. Thus stood the account in 1866, twenty years ago. The annual interest charge was no less than $146 million, nearly £30 million, being two millions sterling more than that of Britain. Many were the predictions throughout Europe that the masses who held full and unlimited sway would never take such a load upon their shoulders and patiently endure the taxation necessary to carry it, much less pay it off. Much of the debt had been contracted at excessive rates of interest, 6%, and at periods when less than 50% in gold was obtained for the bonds issued. Universal suffrage could never be brought to pay back in gold the par value of such issues. It would require a government of the educated and enlightened few, a monarchy, for instance, to keep its financial honor untarnished. In Britain, such ideas prevailed, especially among financiers. Mr. Gladstone gives them expression in Kin Beyond the Sea. Quote, in twelve years, she, America, has reduced her debt by 158 million pounds, or at the rate of 13 million pounds for each year. In each twelve months, she has done what we did in eight years, her self-command, self-denial, and wise forethought for the future have been, to say the least, eightfold ours. These are facts which redounded greatly to her honor, and the historian will record with surprise that an enfranchised nation tolerated burdens which in this country a selected class, possessed of the representation, did not dare to face, and that the most unmitigated democracy known to the annals of the world resolutely reduced, at its own cost, prospective liabilities of the state which the aristocratic and plutocratic and monarchical government of the United Kingdom had been contented ignobly to hand over to posterity. The financiers of the continent, and especially of Germany, knew the character of democracy better, and profited accordingly. Many fortunes were made by investments in American bonds, which rapidly doubled in value. The most notable case, in my own experience, was that of an uncle in Scotland who had always, like John Bright, believed in the Republic, and had implicit faith in the American people in general, and perhaps his nephew in particular. At the darkest hour of the conflict, when gold was worth nearly three times the value of currency, this staunch friend of the Republic remitted me a considerable sum of money, saying, Invest this for me as you think best, but if you put it in United States bonds it will add to my pleasure, for then I can feel that in her hour of danger 
I have never lost faith in the Republic. Close quote. Three times the value of his gold when remitted, and double the value of his patriotic investment since, has rewarded his faith in the triumph of democracy. Starting then, twenty years ago, 1866, with three billion dollars, six hundred million pounds, as the national burden, with an annual interest charge of nearly one hundred forty-six million dollars, twenty-nine point two million pounds, what has the democracy done up to the 1st of January, 1885? It has paid more than half of the huge sum and reduced it to less than $1.5 billion, or £300 million. Here is the last monthly statement. Debt, less cash in Treasury, January 1st, 1886, one billion four hundred forty-three million. $454,826. Debt, less cash and treasury, December 1st, 1885, $1,452,544,766. Decrease of debt during the month, $9,089,940. The interest charge has fallen from $146 million, 29.2 million pounds, to $51 million, 10.2 million pounds. In two successive years of this period, the reduction amounted to $270 million, 54 million pounds, but this rate being considered too rapid, taxes were repealed and large sums voted for increased pensions to the sailors and soldiers who crushed the rebellion. The American has to continue for only 12 years more to reduce the national debt as he has for the past 20 years in order to wipe it out entirely. It may confidently be predicted that ere the close of this century, extraordinary events accepted, the last bond of the Republic will be publicly burned at Washington with imposing ceremonies, amidst the universal rejoicings of the people. The democracy seems destined to set an example in many ways to the monarchies of the world, not the least important being that of a people resolutely pursuing the policy of reducing its debt until the last dollar is paid, that its resources may remain unimpaired to meet the emergencies which may arise to affect its position among the nations. Where is the monarchy which can vie with this democracy in conservative finance or thoughtful care for its country's future? Mr. Gladstone says the parent land ignobly hands her debt over to posterity. From a position so discredited that 6% bonds did not net more than half their par value in gold, the government of the people has risen in the estimation of the capitalists of the world to so high a point that its bonds bearing only 3% command a premium. What the world thinks of democracy is this, that beyond the credit of any nation, even higher than that of Great Britain, stands the obligations of a government founded upon the equality of the citizen. A leading liberal cabinet minister, not Mr. Gladstone, not Mr. Chamberlain, for they know America not much but a little better, once asked me whether, in a contingency which then threatened to arise in the Republic, namely a contested presidential election, and which did indeed arise and passed away harmlessly, there would not be a revolution which would involve the stability of our institutions. My reply was, have you noticed today's quotations of American three percents? No, he said. What are they? Higher than yours, I said, and looked straight at him. That was all, but it was sufficient. Whenever a man, even a liberal cabinet minister, begins to doubt the stability of a government of the people, for the people, and by the people, and there are liberal cabinet ministers whose faith in the democracy is as a grain of mustard seed, ask him why the credit of this new democracy stands before that of the old monarchy. 
why would the world lend this democracy more money and upon better terms than it would lend the best government of the few? Why does the world pay for American 3% more than it will pay for the British 3%? The answer is obvious. Because the reign of the whole of the people of a state is more secure than the reign of any class in a state can possibly be. A class may be upset, nay, is sure to be sooner or later. The people are forever and ever in power. The Revenues of the Government It was often said, up to the breaking out of the slaveholders' rebellion in 1861, that the American did not know that he had a national government. Certainly, as far as taxation was concerned, he had little to remind him of the fact. In 1830, the total revenues collected were not quite two dollars per head, eight shillings. In 1840, they had fallen below one dollar twenty-five cents, five shillings. And even as late as 1860, twenty-five years ago, the American enjoyed all the blessings of government at a cost of one dollar seventy-five cents, seven shillings, per annum. This was collected principally from customs and sales of public lands. There was no such thing known as an excise or internal tax, so that the citizen never was visited by a revenue officer of any kind. The American was born, lived, and died, and was never asked to contribute assent to his government. Unless he lived at a seaport and visited the custom house, he probably never saw a man whose duty it was to collect a national tax. In this blessed year of 1860, the total national revenue was only $56 million, 11.2 pounds. In 1866, it reached its maximum, or $558 million, 111.6 million pounds. After 1860, war taxes were necessary, and the Republican became aware of the fact, well known everywhere else, that it costs money to wage war. Internal and excise taxes were resorted to, and the citizen made the acquaintance of the revenue officer in full force. For the first time, his revenues were made subject to an income tax, fairest of all taxes in theory, most odious of all in practice. It was, however, a graduated income tax which exempted the masses, but exacted 5% upon the largest incomes. During the six years from 1861 to 1867, enormous sums, from 400 to 500 million dollars, 80 million pounds to 100 million pounds, were raised by taxes by the general government. The Republican might have fancied himself enjoying for a time the blessings of the British monarchy, for the taxation was about equal, each nation drawing about $400 million, 80 million pounds per annum from its people. With the collapse of the rebellion, the republic began to set its finances in order. Taxes were rapidly reduced, and among the first to go was the income tax. Then followed the reduction or repeal of one internal tax after another, till finally today, with the exception of the taxes on whiskey and tobacco, producing in the aggregate $145 million, 29 million pounds. But few, of a trifling character, remain. With these exceptions, the Republican knows nothing of internal taxation. His acquaintance with the revenue officer has almost ceased. Once more, he is free. He has neither income tax nor legacy duty. End of chapter 19, part 1. Chapter 19, part 2 of Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria James. Triumphant Democracy by Andrew Carnegie. Chapter 19, part 2. We beg the careful attention of thoughtful, moderate men to the fact that although the income tax was paid wholly by the few, 
yet the masses upon whom it had no direct bearing urged its repeal because it was proved in practice that the honest were assessed while the dishonest escaped thus we get one more proof that the masses can always be trusted to act fairly and to correct injustice since eighteen sixty six twenty years ago when the national revenues from taxation amounted to a sum equal to seventeen dollars three pounds eight shillings drawn from each man woman and child in the country they had fallen in eighteen eighty to less than seven dollars twenty eight shillings and of this more than a dollar four shillings per head went to reduce the debt the taxes are collected in america much as in britain about equally from foreign imports and from home products although the recent rapid repeals and reduction of internal taxes in america have somewhat disturbed this division in eighteen eighty for instance the foreign products contributed more than the domestic foreign giving one hundred ninety million dollars thirty eight million pounds and the domestic one hundred twenty five million dollars twenty five million pounds if it were not for the seemingly immovable determination of the people not to permit the manufacture of whiskey and tobacco to escape special taxation as articles the free use of which should be discouraged this difference between the production of taxation upon home and foreign products would soon be much greater for to sweep away the entire department of internal revenue and thus reduce the number of government officials and free the citizen entirely from their supervision is a temptation hard to resist by the american people the cost of government we have seen that in eighteen eighty the general government was in receipt of about three hundred thirty five million dollars say sixty seven million pounds but notwithstanding great reductions made in taxes both tariff and internal the receipts of eighteen eighty two and eighteen eighty three reached four hundred million dollars eighty million pounds as the official figures for these years are obtainable we shall use them instead of those for eighteen eighty how then does the republic get rid of her eighty millions sterling per annum a revenue about equal to that collected by the british government here is the record for 1883. First, of course, for interest upon the national debt, this required $50 million, £10 million. And what, think you, is the greatest charge upon the state? For what does the republic spend most money? Republics are proverbially ungrateful, you know, so says the monarchist. Well, this republic certainly does not spend five millions of dollars per annum upon a single family and its appurtenances, nor lavish fortunes at one vote upon its high officials or members of an aristocracy. Still, it spends more money in pensions to the soldiers and sailors who served it in its hour of need than upon any branch of the service, more than upon army and navy combined, more than the interest upon its debt more than upon anything else to reward these men not one man or a few high officers alone as is the case in britain and elsewhere in europe but every man private as well as commander in settled proportions as to rank the republic spent in eighteen eighty three no less than sixty six million dollars thirteen point two million pounds the democracy may be trusted to insist when they have the power that the poor private who fought shall not be neglected when the state dispenses its rewards. I heard Mr. Cohen, the radical, nay, the Republican member for Newcastle, in a speech in the House of Commons favoring the grant to Wolseley and Seymour, hold up to scorn the American Republic for the shabby manner in which it treated its servants. The difference here is just the difference between a monarchy and a republic, between the rule of the people and the rule of a class. In the monarchy, the officers are unduly rewarded by their class, who are in power, whether called liberal or conservative, still their class, while the private, who has few or none of his class as legislators, is neglected. In a republic, the first care is for the masses in army or navy, the privates and their widows and orphans. The officers come after, though both share liberally so in all legislation the good of the millions first the luxuries of the few afterward this statement is worth emphasizing 
the Republic gives more each year as rewards to the brave men and their widows and orphans who defended the integrity of the nation when assailed, than she thinks it worth while to expend in maintaining all her military or naval forces. If republics are, as a rule, ungrateful, at least we find a notable exception to the rule in the case of the greatest republic of all. The truth is that republics are only prudent in giving to the rich few and prodigal to a fault in lavishing upon the poorer masses. This is a failing which leans to virtue's side. Time after time, since the close of the war, the pension roll has been enlarged and the payments increased. It seems as if the people could not lavish enough upon, or sufficiently testify their gratitude to, their soldiers and sailors who have been injured or have become disabled in their service. Even as I am correcting the proofs of this chapter, the House of Representatives has passed by a vote of four to one an act to increase the pensions to soldiers and sailors' widows 25%, from $8, pound twelve shillings, to $10, two pounds. To the charge that republics are ungrateful, the reply is that the one republic gives more beyond their regular pay to its citizens who have served in army or navy than all the other governments of the world combined. Next in cost comes the War Department, which, although of ridiculously small dimensions compared with that of other civilized nations, I regret to chronicle cost in 1883 no less than $49 million, 9.8 million pounds, which was exceptionally great. The cost averages about $40 million, 8 million pounds. The Navy Department absorbed $15 million, 3 million pounds. As the army consists of but 25,000 men, we cannot look for any reduction there till the vast unoccupied territories are peopled. A strong armed police force is required to keep the Indians in order, and the almost equally troublesome aggregate of restless spirits from all lands who naturally gravitate to the semi-civilized life which precedes the reign of law and order. In the States, as distinguished from the territories, the American rarely sees a man in uniform whose profession is the scientific killing of other men. The war expenditure, one is delighted to record, embraces the improvements of harbor and rivers, and upon this highly useful work many of the officers are constantly engaged. The Engineer Corps has rendered exceptionally valuable services in this department. An annual appropriation is made for improving rivers and harbors, six million dollars to ten million dollars, one point two to two million pounds, and charged to the War Department, which sum should fairly be deducted from war expenditures, for this is not for destructive purposes, but emphatically in the interests of peace. The American people annually spend upon the 300,000 Indians scattered over the land about six million dollars, equal to twenty dollars, four pounds, per Indian. They are as kindly treated as practicable. A commission of well-known philanthropic men of national reputation is appointed by the president to supervise all matter relating to these poor unfortunate tribes. The success of the Indian policy may best be judged by the fact that out of the total number of 310,000, no less than 66,000 are reported civilized. The proof of civilization being that they pay taxes, and of all the proofs possible to adduce, we submit this is the most conclusive as to their civilization. The political economist, at least, will seek no further but rest satisfied. It is indeed surprising that one-fifth of all the Indians have abandoned their nomadic habits and embraced civilization. It is clear that the real, live, war-whooping Indian is being rapidly civilized off the face of the earth. We shall soon search as hopelessly over the prairies for the noble redmen as we should do over Scotch moors and glens for the Rob Roy of Scott. Under the head of miscellaneous come a thousand and one items of expenditure which embrace everything not under heads before given. The total is about sixty-eight million dollars about 13.6 million pounds in 1883. The principal items are for the agricultural, meteorological, and educational departments and the various bureaus which, by their varied and useful functions, cause such astonishment and admiration in foreign visitors to Washington. 
As the Republic pays every official who renders service, it may be interesting to compare the cost of this plan with that of the monarchy, which depends upon the gratuitous services of its legislators. Here is the account. The Republic. The President. $50,000, £10,000. The Vice President. $9,000, £1,800. 74 Senators. $5,000 or £1,000 each. Total, $370,000, £74,000. 325 representatives, $5,000 or £1,000 each. Total, $1,625,000, £325,000. Total, $2,054,000, £410,800. The Monarchy, The Queen, $3.1 million, £619,379, Prince and Princess of Wales, $600,000, £120,000, Other Members of the Royal Family, $600,000, £121,000, Total, $4,300,000, 860,379 pounds. Members of the cabinet are paid about the same in both countries. I have known well-informed Britons who believed that the cost of government in America was greater than their own. The figures given prove that the amount paid by the Republic for the 400 officers and legislators who form her governing body does not amount to half as much as the monarchy squanders upon one family which has neither public duties nor official responsibility, and which sets an example of wasteful and showy living to the injury of the nation. One scarcely knows at which to wonder most, the fatuous folly of the people in permitting this great sum to go to one family, which is really one of the scandals of our age, or that any well-educated family possessed of even ordinary sensibility can be found to take from a people, many of whom are sorely pressed for the necessaries of life, this enormous amount of their earnings and waste it upon their own mean and coarse extravagance. No fact more clearly proves the corrupting tendency of privilege or caste upon those unfortunately born under it. They must grow callous and unmindful of all but themselves. It will puzzle my American readers to imagine how such enormous sums can possibly be spent upon one family. Perhaps one item will shed light upon it. Sir Charles Dilk has charged that public funds are squandered to the amount of £100,000, $500,000, per annum upon yachts for Her Majesty's use, while, mark you, she has not been half a dozen times a year in a yacht during her entire reign. The sum spent by this model queen for useless pleasure boats alone is greater than the American pays his president and vice president, the cabinet officers, and all the judges of the Supreme Court combined. One marvels, when such abuses are revealed, that any member of the royal family is safe in open day. We should expect that public indignation would at least concentrate in one universal hiss. How long would Americans tolerate an abuse like this, think you? Turn the rascals out, would again be the cry, and the delinquents would know better than to stay to be driven. The next Cunarder would have them booked, under assumed names, bound for happier climes. But the story does not stop here. This family finds in every marriage of their children a fresh plea for demanding money, and at every death they saddle the nation with the funeral expenses. The royal mother of her people cannot be induced to support her own children during life, or even to bury them decently at death, as long as the public can be further bled. All this is no reflection upon the royal family of England, for all other royal families do the same. They are as good a royal family as anywhere to be found. Certainly the queen is personally one of the best women who ever occupied a throne. It is the fault of the system that such callousness is bred in those who would otherwise be good people. 
The system, not its victims, is to blame. The royal family is only one of many evils with which monarchical institutions infest a state. The Financial Reform Almanac states that within the last 33 years, the dukes, earls, and marquises, with their relatives, the inevitable brood of royalty, have taken from the exchequer more than £66 million, pounds, $330 million, an average levy of two millions sterling, being as great as the entire sum spent by the government for the education of the people. John Bright told the people that the government was only a system of outdoor relief for the aristocracy, and he was right as usual. It is well for the American people to get a glimpse now and then of the blots of other lands that they may duly appreciate their own comparative purity. Whenever an American is met abroad with the assertion that the government in the Republic is corrupt, he can safely say that for one ounce of corruption here, there is a full pound of world du poids in Britain, for every job here, twenty yonder. Just look at some of the jobs. The Prince of Wales is colonel of this or that regiment, and draws salaries for duties he does not pretend to perform. He has many mean modes of drawing money from the public. He is made a field marshal, one brother gets a high command in India, the Duke of Edinburgh gets command of the Channel Fleet, the Duke of Cambridge, although commander-in-chief, does not scorn to draw a salary as Ranger of Richmond Park, and royal favorites by the score monopolize sinecure positions. One nobleman gets £4,000 per year for walking backward before Her Majesty upon certain occasions, and so on through a chapter of jobs, so long and irritating that no American could patiently read through it. When the democracy gets firmly in the saddle, we shall see a change in all this a purifying of the Aegean stables of monarchy. The corruption then exposed will surprise the Republican. I do not believe that there could be found today a family whose head is in public life and honored by the Republic which would accept and use, as the royal family accepts and uses, the inordinate sums granted to them. The tendency of Republicanism is to promote simplicity and a higher standard than that of showy living. President Cleveland, in his inaugural message, expresses the feelings of the people when he says, quote, We should never be ashamed of the simplicity and prudential economies which are best suited to the operation of a republican form of government and most compatible with the mission of the American people. Those who are selected for a limited time to manage public affairs are still of the people, and may do much by their example to encourage consistently with the dignity of their official functions, that plain way of life which among their fellow citizens aids integrity and promotes thrift and prosperity. Close quote. The monarchy thinks show grand, the republic votes it vulgar. To sum up all, the government of the people in 18 years has reduced its debt at the average rate of $55 million, 11 million pounds, per annum, and the interest charge of its debt in that period to one-third its cost. It has abolished and reduced taxes from time to time until there remains of internal taxation only the taxes upon whiskey and tobacco, stamps, etc. The income tax has gone with the others. Such a record the world has not seen before. The answer to doubters of the stability of the democracy, like Sir Henry Maine, is here. December 1885. Republican 3 percents, 103 and a half, monarchical 3 percents, 99 and a half. Were the consuls of America perpetual like those of Britain, and not redeemable at a fixed date, their value would be still higher. The triumph of democracy is palpable in many departments, in education, in population, in wealth, in agriculture, and in manufactures, in annual savings, as we have seen, it stands first, but to the conservative mind, surely the last domain in which the democracy could be expected to excel even Great Britain is that of credit. It has been the boast, one of the many proud boasts of the dear parent land, that her institutions were stable as the rock, as proved by her consuls, which stood preeminent throughout the world. Now comes her republican child, 
and plucks from her queenly head the golden round of public credit as hers of right, and places it upon her own fair brow. It has been my privilege to claim many victories for triumphant democracy, but surely the world will join me in saying none is more surprising than this, that its public credit stands before that of Great Britain, and first in all the world. End of chapter 19